What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, 20 and 24. And the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours on today's show. We'll talk about the crock of crap that was the total eclipse plus UConn is inevitable the huskies go back to back the astros even the score in arlington paul feinbaum with more ridiculous comments about the texas longhorns and, and why the longhorns are making the jump to the sec we'll start to talk about the masters which of course get going in a couple of days some interesting stats in regards to the women's final four and uh oh yeah plenty of fun along the way We'll be with you all day long right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. But, of course, Bucky and I are with you until 10 o'clock this morning. And it's a stormy morning here in South Austin, Texas, USA, America. How are you today, Buck? I'm doing fantastic, BK, after a wonderful day yesterday. And uh, rain held off uh, yesterday. And, of course, as I said, you were going to get some of this rain on Tuesday. Uh, you're going to get it. I, I think you're getting it in your area. I haven't got it out here. In this beautiful hamlet of Dripping Springs, yet so I'm still kind of waiting. I need it. I put it. A I put a couple things into the ground yesterday to need some rain. So yeah, I kind of overdid it yesterday. Dope that I am. Yeah. I thought that I thought I was getting going to get some energy from the eclipse. It would pull in my energy, and so then I went out and overdid it. I am so hurting today from doing that. I guess it was only a week ago. So. You had surgery a week ago. You're supposed to relax and take it easy after going under the knife. And I'll catch here a, you are. Catch a nappy poo today. How's that? You're gonna take a nap today? Yes, I'm gonna take a like well, people won't call it. I'm gonna take a sleep. I'm gonna take at least a I'm gonna go an hour and a half to two hour just sleep. Forget the nap part. I need to sleep. That's a nap. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. For you, that's probably just a nap. Well, to anything, like, I can't figure out how people can take power naps, right? Some no, folks no. swear by those 20 to 30-minute power no, naps, no. and they say, oh, my God, I wake up feeling fully refreshed and recharged. And Yeah, dude, that, exactly. That's BS. Like, I need at least 90 minutes for yes. something to constitute as a nap. So you're doing it right if you're making sure you're going to be gonna do eyes it. closed for at least an hour and a half. I'm going to do that. I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm not in, no golf listening, no nothing. Just go to sleep. Mm. Oh, how about this comment from Jason this morning? The rain did not hold off in Georgetown yesterday. My five-year-old son was counting on Bucky's no rain prediction and was crushed that his baseball practice was rained out out yesterday wow Nobody got rain yesterday his troubles were not so far away wow Man. sorry about that what happened buck i was about to give you credit this morning and say you are on one but apparently you're not you were wrong again what's going on i don't understand why these dads start throwing buckets of water out the window so their sons can't practice i don't <laughs> why would you do that to the kid there was I didn't I didn't hear any, any rainfall of yesterday anywhere. I thought yesterday was just cloudy, a little overcast, and bits of sun kept popping in and out during the course during the eclipse. It was uh, I thought it was a fine day yesterday, but as a matter of fact, I thought it was a little humid yesterday. Hmm. Well, I guess some areas in Central Texas got some rain. I didn't get anything no. in the Sunset Valley, Oak Hill area where I am. But man, I I uh, went and took a shower. You know, seven forty five. I popped out about 750 and then just a loud crash of thunder I man out of nowhere and I, I could just hear the rain and the wind so it just started about where i am maybe it's coming your way maybe it's going north i don't know yeah, but it you're gonna get like, some of that it's happening today brother yeah today seems to be the day where we'll get uh some showers all over central texas and uh yeah stay safe stay dry out there if yes, please you be careful can all right, Buck, before we get into the eclipse, I want to get your thoughts on the events from yesterday. Please say hello to our soldiers. Yes, good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cabasas, Texas, the soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you for what you do. Thank you to you and your families. We do appreciate it. And do be safe out there, please. Amen. All right, I want to get your take on yesterday's eclipse, but I'm going to show you what I saw 
through my <laughs> eclipse glasses yesterday. You ready for BK's vantage point during, yes, during the shot. zone of total itty yesterday? Yeah. That is what I saw using these medical king eclipse glasses. I saw what? nothing but darkness trying what to look a through the lip off. All these glasses are is two holes with black paper, black plastic paper. I just I got ripped off by my convenience store. When I go there to buy my little doggy treats, I'm gonna let them know, dude, that was a ripoff. You you shouldn't do that to people. It's just total darkness. I might as well have been in the room with the lights out running around. That's all I that's all I, my wife put the ones I gave to her on, you know, just at you know, just when the, the diamond part of the eclipse was going on and dude, she, she says, it's just dark. I can't see anything. I don't couldn't see, see anything. You couldn't see anything. What a rip off from some of these people. I mean, I didn't, I know the ones who probably got the really nice shades, but if I go to the corner store and that's the place where I buy my Doritos or my Olipop or whatever, cut me a break. Give me a break that I'm going to at least, you're going to show me something, a sign of some kind of light through the glasses, not total darkness. Yeah. It's awful. I think the the bit of the eclipse was you needed to wear the glasses before the zone of totality. Yes, as most of you people call it. But then once the moon and the sun were right in front of each other, you could take the glasses off because it was dark enough to where you weren't going to need that eye protection. But it didn't matter when I was wearing my glasses. I mean, maybe maybe I just got a, a crap pair of glasses. I, don't I will say so. this. My buddy, so I, I got these from a friend in Dallas this weekend. He had the exact same pair, and he was texting me yesterday like, oh, the glasses are great. These are awesome. And no I'm like, are way. you effing with me right now, dude? Like, I can't see shit out of these things. <laughs> he's like, are you effing with me? Yeah, so, what the junk. Oh, it my is, God. It was a fantastic day. My wife and I, we, at about noon, we decided that it was, you know, we're going to have about an hour and a half before all the stuff really kind of started and we could get some yard work done. So we were out. That's when I was at a wicked pace, like a fool out there lifting things and doing stuff that I wasn't supposed to do. But then when it came, it was just myself and her. And boy, we had a great vantage point in, uh, in where I live out here and dripping up on the hill and stuff. And it was, it was, it was more amazing than I expected it to be. I thought it was, I, I was, I was totally thrilled by what I saw. You know, I, I've been through a couple of these little things where you go and you just kind of blow them off and they, they end real quickly and there's no suspense to it. I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I the, the, the full eclipse of it, you know, totality and the, the diamond part of it. I mean, that there were stars out around it, which I didn't see. My wife saw the stars that were around it when it was a total eclipse. I did not. I, you know, I, but I, but what I saw was it just that, I mean, just the magnitude of this universe is, I mean, that just brought it all to me. I mean, I, there are a lot of things that I've seen that I, that what I would call spectacular, nothing more spectacular than the birth of a child. But this right here yesterday was something really special to me. I, I, I enjoyed every bit of it, you know, from the, the corniness of it, you know, I mean, it got dark out here where I was and, and, and dripping. It was dark, dude. It, it was eerie and spooky. And, you know, some of the things that my wife were telling me that I should have known that, the sun is four times the, di you know, a 400 times the diameter of the moon. And they all look, they look kind of the same, but it, they're not the same. They're like 400 times the the the, the distance away. It, it was just incredible. Some of the stuff she was telling me about, you know, of course, she's going to investigate anything that comes up. She's going to investigate it till it's fullest. But just some of the things that she was telling me was just in, incredible about what we what we all kind of witnessed yesterday. And that was the best of that was the best of all of these. If you've ever been there, oh no, it wasn't all that. It was all of that to me yesterday. I, I totally enjoyed it. Are you messing with me right now? Are you messing with me? No, you didn't. You just thought it was just nothing to you. You thought it was cool because it got dark for three minutes. You know, you could have waited like five hours and it got dark again outside. No, you realize I, that, right? I mean, I was. I mean, I was looking at the the different little things in it. The little red dots and stuff, the, the sun flares and everything. I then I was trying to check all that stuff out. And it's hard because with my bad back, I had to lean up against the truck and look up. And uh, I didn't and screw those glasses, by the way. I wasn't wearing those looking up at anything. 
But yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I saw darkness when I went to bed last night. I mean, I could have looked. I mean, that's all that was. That, those glasses were useless. But I did see that there was a bright spot. It looked like the North Star. I mean, that thing was bright and shining, just like a diamond, you know, when that little piece was hanging out. It was it was awesome. Dude, I, I don't know. Maybe I got screwed where I was. There was a lot of cloud coverage down in my oh, apartment really? complex. Yep. So there, there were like for a few seconds at a time, you could see, I think, what I was supposed to see. But then a few seconds later, a cloud would just, go right over the sun slash moon and it was impossible to really see what was going on. So I think that maybe hindered my eclipse viewing experience. And I'm supposed to feel bad for the folks who traveled from all over the world to the Austin area to see this because it feels like we didn't get the full experience because of that cloud coverage. I just laugh at the idiots who actually traveled all over the world to watch the freaking sun that we can see every day and the freaking moon that we can also see every day. I think you uh, you deserve that misfortune if you really spent your hard-earned money traveling halfway across the planet to see that. So maybe that's why my opinion is as skewed as it is. I just, I, like... It got dark for a little bit. It wasn't like pitch black where I no, was. It, it was no, like a dark. It was like a dark blue. It looked like this. The sky looks when it's overcast and about to rain. What did you have? Dark blue gummies or something? Is that what you saw? I was dark over where I was, I, dude. I, I I just wonder. Like, is this a bit that everyone else is in on besides me? Where people just pretend like I, there's no way people actually found that cool yesterday. At least, we're, you know, once again, everybody had different vantage points of it. So maybe it was cooler. Yeah, in other people in Maine thought it was cool. I thought it was cool. I had a nice vantage point because it was just, you know, I wasn't with a crowd. It was just myself and my wife kind of witnessing. I thought it was kind of cool. I just think people are messing with me, man. Or people are just trying to fit in. You know, you don't want to get left out, right? You want to follow what everyone else is doing so you don't get bullied. So everyone's just like, oh, the eclipse was sick, man. It was awesome. It was, it was the most average thing I think I've ever seen in my entire life. It was so hyped up. It was a sky. It was, it was a it was a rainy sky that we saw yesterday. And yeah, I think I, I think I was more like that about the other other parts. You know, as I said, when I saw the space shuttle go by, when I waited and said it was going to happen that night, but I was going to sit out there on the porch and see if it really happened, and it did happen. It was very similar to that. I mean, I I had a good feeling yesterday afternoon because, as I said, at the time I was I was working outside. And just kind of anticipating, is, is this kind of stuff really going to happen? Because of the clouds, like you said, it wasn't a sunny day, but the sun kept going in and out of the clouds and stuff. And yeah. then by the time it really started to happen, I had just shut it down, the working part. My wife and I were just sitting there, you know, in chairs, just kind of looking up. And it was it was, it was, was awesome, you know, as she honed in on some of the things that she was telling me about the moon and the, and the sun and stuff. I, I thought it was kind of cool. That yeah, was all right. right. I mean, it, it was just, it was a, it was a good moment. It really, really was. For me, out of all of these different hundreds of thousands of eclipses now that I've seen, I never, I won't see another one in 20 years. Probably, I don't know if I'll make it that far, but it's okay. I got what I needed out of that one. So this, this really was did. the coolest, coolest eclipse you've ever seen. Yes, I, I did. I got what I needed out of that. I got, I got that feeling of, uh, I don't know. I, like you said, is it belonging? Feeling like you don't want to be bullied by saying, "Oh, it sucked." You don't want to be the the naysayer and say it wasn't that good because people in Maine and other places were talking about how, how I mean, I wasn't excited about people that were doing news broadcasts. They were they were taking it over the top now. You know, in the, the Indianapolis 500, that place was packed for it in Indianapolis. And it just got that hush when it got dark. People were just kind of more quiet than anything, you know, yeah. it's like a certain part of a movie where shut the hell up. Don't say anything. Just watch, you know, well, here, here's a picture. And someone posted this to the website, twitter.com. Not sure if you're familiar with that one, Buck. And this is from Jonesboro. And this is what I was expecting to see, or at least this is what I was hoping to see. Right now, this one's extra cool because you've got a plane flying through right at the time of the zone of total Liddy. So that, I don't know if I was going to get that lucky to see something like that mm -hmm. flying across the sky, but I was expecting like damn near pitch black and this like crazy ring light during the eclipse and, and I didn't get that. So may, like, I, I don't think you can fabricate, you can fabricate any picture, but I think this is a legitimate picture 
Uh-huh. And I mean, some places across the country or across the world got that experience. Yes. But what I got was nothing close to this. And it's like, I'm fine. I, I didn't care about it that much anyway. So if someone's going to get screwed and have a bad view of the eclipse, you. I'm glad it's me. I'm glad it's me. But like, I was expecting something like this with all of the hype surrounding this event. And I got nothing close to that. It just was a darker sky. In yeah, the when you just kept saying the word diamond ring, I kept thinking, oh, yeah, now it, when it wasn't totally total, you just saw a little piece that stuck out. And it was, it was shining like a diamond and it was bright, man. That's when I didn't want to look. When you looked up, it was like, dude, don't look up at this thing because it, it's shining. Like I said, like the, it was like the North Star out of nowhere. But my wife kept saying there were stars when it was dark that there were stars around that. I did not see that because I didn't want to, you know, as I said, in my back, I had to lean back on the truck because of, of my back and my neck. And I said, well, I'm not going to sit here and look up at this thing. First of all, I don't have the proper eyewear. You know what I'm saying? Which I didn't need. It was yeah. cloudy. You, I don't know about you, all this eyewear. I mean, I, I raw dogged it the whole time. Anyone could have raw <laughs> so dogged it. So did I. You, you did not need these pieces of shit. If you purchased them, congratulations on throwing three ninety five down the drain. Oh my! Because- just, I just threw the money away. Wait till I go buy that convenience store. I'm going to tell that guy you owe me six Gatorades. Come on, man. Oh, Cut it out, yeah. will you? You, you should have gone to Seven Eleven. You know, our guy Ashish would have had oh, yeah. some better shades than those. And they weren't even trying. Well, from what I saw, those glasses do. Let me just tell you something. They didn't even try. That was just dark. That was just dark paper. You know what I'm saying? They didn't even try to give anything. You put those on. I gave my wife her pair. She put them on. She goes, it's already dark. It's nighttime. I'm like, look at that. Some guy guy put a trash bag over these frames. Somebody put a, yeah, somebody put a baggie over that thing. Come on now. This, this is what I was worried about. I kept hearing about this ring, and I was worried this girl was going to come out of nowhere and start oh. killing people. <laughs> uh, like the scariest movie I've ever seen because I watched that shit in second grade, and it just messed with my sleep for months. I was a little worried about uh, her making an appearance at some I was, point I was, yesterday. I was, this. I was satisfied. Good. I'm glad you were. And it seems like most people were satisfied, but I was. I was disappointed. Like I didn't think I was going to love it, but uh, it even underwhelmed my low expectations. Like I just, I, I, once again, I, because there's only one of me and I was only in one spot. This is me being yeah. incredibly selfish and naive. Like, I, I think that people are messing with me. I'm sure folks actually got a much better view of what we were supposed to see, but from where I was, it literally like the clouds were doing cloud things. It looked like a dark blue sky. Yes. It's unique that it got darker than normal at, you know, two, 1.30 in the afternoon. But to me, it wasn't like any darker than how dark it gets when a rainstorm is coming. Like it literally was just a dark blue sky with the like the tiny little sun moon ring that we saw sort of for like a couple this, of seconds. Like this morning, sort of like this morning. It's it's yeah. just as dark this morning as it was at 1.30 yesterday. <laughs> you could say, well, it's the morning. It's supposed to be dark. Okay, that's my point. Like you, you could just wait a few hours and see the same effing sky that I saw at 1.30 yesterday in this once in a lifetime moment, which I we'll just, see in five more years because we always get an eclipse. Yeah, I mean, it's just the power of the sun. I mean, I mean, all this, you know, you can't look up, don't look up at it and all that stuff. That just was that was way too much because you know, we always have to buck the system when it says don't look up. Of course I'm gonna look up without yeah. glasses on. I'll tell you, know, you what, people. People listened yesterday, and I'm mad that I was people yesterday because they told us to stay off the roads. And I was thinking they were telling us to stay off the roads because there was just going to be infinite traffic all over the state and all over the zone of total itty. Dude, I could have gotten so much done yesterday instead of staring at the damn clouds. There was nobody on the roads. It was I could have robbed a bank yesterday. It was 2020. Seriously, it, it looked like the heart of quarantine in 2020. Some of the pictures I saw, some of the videos I saw of the major highways and byways here in Austin, it looked like April 2020 when nobody was going to work because we had just started the pandemic. Like I'll, I'll, I guess I'll credit people for actually listening and following the, rule, following the rules because it feels like that doesn't happen that often nowadays. But I'm like, damn, I could have been so productive yesterday. Yeah, I was on. Yeah, I was on 290. And it was a it was around eleven thirty BK, 
And I'm thinking, where's the traffic jam that's supposed to be happening? Because, you know, I wanted to try to get, you know, like I said, I was doing some yard work. So I ran over to, you know, Lowe's and all that stuff. I get out there on the highway. I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to get back home. If I don't get back by noon, I'm going to be screwed. People are going to be pulled over. There was nobody around. Those people had done all their stuff. People had, you know, H-E-B, people had already gone during the weekend to get all their stuff. So I, there was no crowds out anywhere. Yeah. Uh, congrats to you idiots for, I guess, getting your grocery shopping done. On I mean, last Tuesday. Can you, can you believe that? Like people were freaking out, needing paper More towels toilet. and toilet, toilet paper, paper again. and gas for a rainstorm. It was a rainstorm in the sky. You needed all that shit for that? Are you kidding me? It was wonderful. I'll just say this. The best of all the ones I've ever witnessed, because I'm only supposed to have witnessed like three in my entire 68 years. But now are I've you, seen this are, one. This was the the 400th. Okay, hold on. Are you, trying to get a, are you trying to get another stimulus check from the government? Is that what's yeah. going on here? Is the government no. up to this? I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that the next one, that you buy your glasses from me. Because I'm going to have a stand out there because you people will buy those. <laughs> no matter what, you will buy these things. Oh, my God. My glasses are ISIS approved. I mean, really, those things were useless. That's the biggest. I mean, I've been ripped off before. <laughs> I've, I've not seen people. I've seen me ripped off and then others around me be smart enough not to fall for it. But there are so many of you out there that had that junk on. Yep. And will somebody please tell us that they have a pair that actually worked though? Your buddy tried to tell you that he's lying. A lot of people have commented and texted in this morning saying that their glasses were working. So our guy Ashish from Seven Eleven says my cheap ass glasses worked. Come on, man! I just put mine on, and all I could see was pitch dark. I, th I, I, was in some, I thought I was in a horror film, and I'm like, wait a minute! It's not supposed to be totally dark here. That's just insane. Insane. Well, congrats to those of you who yes. enjoyed the eclipse. I did. I did. Thank you very much. It was it was it was a nice hour and a half well spent with my wife. Just that's, us two. That's good. Out here. I mean, seriously, it really, really, really was. It was it was, you know, when she gets into something and she starts talking about how she's looked at the moon and the, the diameter of the sun and how incredible what we saw yesterday you know, for something like that to happen. And every every time you see these things together, they look like they're the same size, but they're not even close to the same size. The sun is incredible, you know, and to have something like that happen right in front of you, because it never happens except for every year or every other year. You know what I mean? Now, now the next one is like 20 years. I'm supposed to be dead. I'm going to say there'll be another one. I'm going to venture that God's going to spare me and let me see at least another one because it'll be before 20 years. I guarantee you. So the, the coolest part for you was seeing how much bigger the sun is than the moon. I mean, just the, just the, the universe, the, 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 the movement of all that stuff and the time, because of the times that they were talking about were almost like dead on the time, you know, that we can have that stuff almost to the direct time. That's how people have studied that when it's going to happen, that, the timing of it within the, the the right minutes and stuff. I'm like, this is not, this is going to be off by 20 minutes, isn't it? It's going to have to be, pe people are late for everything. Things are late happening all over the world. But this, the universe, they had this thing timed BK to the, to the, to the minute, to the second of when it was going to happen. I'm like, there's no chance, but it was almost to the point of what they said. I'm like, cause that's why I started looking. I'm like, okay. My wife said three minutes. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. It's going to be delayed 45 minutes till it really happens. You know, as I said, when the, when the space shuttle came over the top of me that, that evening, when I was out here, they gave me the time and it happened just about at that time, within about two minutes of that time. when that thing went zooming across the sky. I'm like, how can something be on time? We'd never do anything on time. How's it possible? And, and and it so was, how did they time that damn on... thing? Up Science, man. I don't know much about it. Wow. I thought that was cool. I, I know people saying that's just a bunch of bull. I thought it was pretty cool yesterday. I was never good that. in science anyway. I was never good at the stars and Uranus and all that other stuff, you know? Your Venus, you Uranus. Good in my anus. Thank you. Thank you for, for not being away so good. From my anus. <laughs> yeah. I, but it was it was it was cool. I mean, the buildup for some, it was good enough for me because 
The ones I had seen before were way worse than that shit I saw yesterday. That's for sure. Let me uh, let me show you. Oh. So I I um, so I was on with Jeff Barker from twelve to two yesterday, and we paused for about ten minutes during the zone of total itty, and we played a an interview we did with Ricky Williams, an interview you and I did with Ricky Williams a few months ago. So we wanted to keep the content coming, but also we wanted to give ourselves the opportunity to check out this once in a lifetime generational event. Thank you. And I went out just to my apartment complex parking lot. There were a bunch of people out there. I mean, dozens of folks just like right around my building. Sitting in their and stolen pool chairs out there. A couple of people like on FaceTime. One guy was on FaceTime and another guy was telling him to shut up. He kept shing him as if like, you got to hear sounds, man. The sun and moon are about to start talking to each other. Like, oh. You got to <laughs> you gotta shut up here. Let me hear what's going on which I thought that was weird. But yeah, people were talking to each other the whole time. And then you had this jabroni. This guy just like, <laughs> he's just laying on the sidewalk. Like there are a lot of people who used beach chairs or lawn chairs or even like brought out a towel to lay on in the grass. This dude is just like on the walkway in my apartment complex, just laying on his back, staring up into the over that dude. Yeah, that would have been awesome. And I'm just like, God dang, dude. Yeah, this, for, for this... Like, and then look at the sky. You can see this is during the zone of total it. You can barely see it on the very edge of the picture, right? The top of the photo. It's blue. Yeah, that's like how dark it got right there. It was still blue where I was. That's what's happening down in your Oak Hill area. You know that with all the construction going on. It was clear around there. You should have been able to see anything you wanted to see around that place. I couldn't see anything it was so cloudy and it didn't get that dark i'm telling you like it got dark enough to where i guess the censored lights in my apartment complex turned on for a couple of minutes Yeah, my, my neighbor's lights around here came on at their yeah. house and stuff yeah so it, it was clearly darker than normal but those lights will turn on in a storm it's like car headlights like it doesn't yeah. have to be nighttime for those lights <laughs> to turn on if it just gets a little dark because the sky's dreary they'll pop on so that's what happened for a couple of minutes but like it didn't get close to pitch black like seemingly a bunch of other people had even in austin like just i don't know i don't know if it's like did, my did you, the, you didn't see the little red flares from the sun against the moon you couldn't see that those little sun spots i think you got to get your eyes checked something might be wrong with with your eyes if you're nope, seeing I saw, spots two those, I saw two of those little arches that look like red balls of fire right at the corner there i, I, I did see those but I, like i said there was one time when i looked up and the shining part from the sun when it wasn't total, you know, when it wasn't total. I mean, that thing hit me right in the face. I was like, damn, that hurt. I mean, oh, it yeah. was, it was, it was bright. I caught it. I caught a glimpse of where I probably shouldn't have been peeking, but I didn't, uh, but I didn't need glasses for all that stuff. Are you sure these weren't the arches you saw? No, 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 dude. It wasn't your McDonald's down in Oak Hill. Yeah. At least they still have the arches down there, I guess. The golden. Fries suck. Oh, man. All right. Well, I'm glad uh, you had a good experience yesterday. I had a good experience. Yes, I did. And it sounds like a lot of other folks out there did as well. Our guy Phil says, probably the only time I've heard something elicit cheers throughout the hood. As everybody was excited about the eclipse yesterday. Yeah, you know, I mean, when people are talking about shush and be quiet, I'm like, what for? They're not. The sun and the moon aren't going to start speaking to us. I mean, why was everybody... But people got quiet. I mean, the Indianapolis 500 raceway, dude, when that thing hit total, it was so quiet. I'm like, why are they so quiet? What is, what is it, the peacefulness about it? Is, is God going to speak to everybody then? Was that getting everybody together so that you look up, so that you had something to say like, hey, y'all are effing up down there. You better start getting stuff fixed down there or you're going to get more than this eclipse coming at you next time. You know what mm. I'm saying? I was, yeah. It was like they were waiting to hear something. And I'm like, dude. It was a big deal, I guess. Like it was such a massive event that people felt overwhelmed with the motion. And they just felt like they had to fully take it in using all of their senses. I mean, this was the only thing that people were talking about yesterday. Like every new you turned on CNN, you turned on Fox News, you turned on MSNBC, you turned on the local news. It didn't matter. You turned on the ESPN, they were still talking about it. It was Eclipse talk. It was all yeah, it was all over social media too. Like that, it was the biggest story in the world. You know who yesterday. got affected by the eclipse? 
The Purdue Boilermakers got oh. – yeah, yeah, it got them. They got got. They got infiltrated by the inevitable. Yes. That's UConn. Yes, they, yes the, they did. The soul snatchers that is <laughs> UConn snatched, basketball. They, they snatched their program away from them. Nice year, Purdue. Nice year. Yeah, that's what UConn does, right? They give you a little bit of hope, like, oh, maybe oh. we've got a chance to hang with these guys for 40 wow. minutes, and then they just go on one of those runs and – uh, just take your soul and then smash it right in front of you. Gosh. They did that against Alabama. Alabama was a little bit more competitive than Purdue was. Yes. They were in that game on Saturday a little bit longer than Purdue was last night. But you kind of went on a run and then put the Crimson Tide away a couple of days ago. And then last night, we'll get to that in a second. We'll give us uh, some yeah. sponsor shout outs here. But yeah, obviously, UConn was able to uh, run and hide at last night. Yes, they, they win did. their second straight men's basketball national championship but before we dive into that game and get to some of the big sports headlines from the day let's give some love to some of our great sponsors buck okay there's a company right here in austin that's making a big difference clean cost beverage brand gets 50 percent of profits to support individuals in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction half of their profits, half of their um, profits do some special things in the austin area and around this country clean cause the drinks are organic sparkling yerba mate flavors like cherry lime uh, orange ginger, and they'll get you going with 160 milligrams of caffeine. Now, it's not going to make you over jittery, but for those that need that caffeine boost in the morning or in the afternoon, there's folks that need it all during the day. Of course, I drink my coffee all kinds of times a day, but this clean cause drink is absolutely fantastic. And they've got a new one out. They've got the new blueberry out, clean cause blueberry. Ashish has this over at 7 Elevens. You're going to find it at HEB, 7 Elevens, and you're going to find it throughout. Central Texas. It's everywhere, as a matter of fact. Uh, but but I, I've loved this drink for a long time. As you've seen, it's at my house. You've been to my house, so you see my garage filled with this stuff. My wife loves this drink. And it is. And what they do for, for the people around are, are the most important. 50% of their profits go right back into to what they do. They, they put their money where their mouth is, for sure. And it's going to help folks that are, have alcohol addiction or drug addictions. They've been doing that for years, and they continue to do it all over Central Texas. Love Amen. the folks at Clean Cause. Absolutely. They're doing phenomenal work, and those drinks are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Shout out to our friends at Woods Comfort Systems as well. Did the Eclipse mess with your AC unit? I hope not. It was not that big of a deal, so it probably didn't. But if something is wrong with your air conditioner and you want to make sure it's right by the time these red-hot summer months roll around, you got to call our friends at Woods Comfort Systems. Almost 70 years yes, in sir. business. Here in Central Texas, they are dedicated to keeping you and your family comfortable in your home all year round. HVAC services and plumbing services as well. So if something's going on with a toilet or a sink, don't put the gloves on and try to fix it yourself. No. You're going to have a bad time. Reach out to our friends at Woods Comfort Systems and they will get it done woodscomfortsystems.com that of course is the website the phone number to call 512-842-5066 that's 512-842-5066 it's woods comfort systems where comfort is our middle name and of course our good friends over at sue patrick since 1975 jay williams sue patrick incredible selection of texas longhorn apparel men's and women's clothing you name it they've got it collectibles they got the jelly cats that are there, the ones that I saw on the plane that the grown men had, big jelly cats, giving them a hug. I'm going to give me one of those for the next plane ride. I'm doing that jelly cat thing with a little smile. Yes, I'm going to. You're doing that, that little jelly cat thing? I'm going Gross. to. Bring, I'm going to bring one of those on a plane because I could have been leaning forward on my little tray table with my little jelly cat, rubbing it and holding it. Grown men, I mean, they're like motorcycle gang guys had their little jelly cats with them on the planes, holding it, rubbing it on their little faces. That was, that was, I'm getting one. I'm getting one for me. I've been getting jelly cats for everybody else. I'm going to Sue Patrick, get a jelly cat for myself. I'm going to get the, I'm going to get the football jelly cat. That's what I need. I need the one. I with knew the it. I knew it. I've been saying for weeks that yeah. you were actually buying those jelly cats for yourself and you were just pretending that they were for your grandkids and for your wife. Um, you didn't want to be embarrassed that you were into stuffed animals as a, near 70 year old black guy, but really yeah. it's you who've been buying those for yourself the whole time. I'm getting it. I'm going to pile them up and start storming them together and just make one big, 
ugly jelly cat and taking it, you know? Did you say you were rubbing your kitty? No, I'm not going to rub my kitty. No, I don't have that. Stop it. Love Sue Patrick, though, for it. Folks, 5222 Burnett Road. We'll be out there again next week. Love the folks there. Anything that you want, Texas themed, they have got it for sure. Yeah, Love Sue Patrick. Our guy Jay from Sue Patrick was texting me yesterday. He was not happy with uh, my thoughts on the eclipse. No, right, at, right after it happened, I came back on with Jeff and was like, "That's it? Like that? That was what all the pomp and circumstance was about?" And he's like, "Come on, uh, be a kid, have a little energy." I'm like, no, "I can't. It was bad. Sorry, Jay. You can do better than that. I mean, what did you want? Floods? You wanted? Did you want?" Did you want I can do better than that. You know who can do better than that? Who's that? God. Well, that's that's who did that yesterday. That was he just, should have, he should have done better with that. What? It was just a sample. That's all. That was just an ink. That was just a blink of the eye. I'm a big that fan of the G. I'm a big fan of the G. He's done so much right for me over the years. That that was not one of them. He there, didn't bring there, it to you. He didn't bring it to you yesterday. Plenty of miracles on this earth every day. That what I saw yesterday was a rainy sky. That was a miracle. You saw. You witnessed. You witnessed a miracle of our universe. God is our a entire bitch. universe. Yeah. Hey, God. God is like me. He's a bits guy. All right. He just wanted to pull everyone's leg with this. <laughs> make him go shit. buy some. Did he make him go buy some glasses? You <laughs> idiots! Just to let you know that you are all idiots anyway. That's why I'm what. God, and that's why you guys are you guys. Because you would, not, and you would God buy those glasses, BK? God no. sitting up there laughing at us for looking like this, just staring <laughs> at him yesterday. Well, you people are why you're there and why I'm in someplace else. Because you idiots would go buy those glasses. I'll, I'll tell you what here, Buck. Next time I'm on a plane, I'm going to be wearing these. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, people rock the COVID mask still. I'm oh, yeah. I'm going to show up to the airport, just the entire flight process, going through TSA, going through the airport. Getting I'm, gonna ask, I'm going to tell you, they're going to ask you to remove that stuff. If you do that, I got a feeling that somebody's going to say something to you like, hey, can you please remove that? It's not funny. My, They're going to say, my wife and I enjoyed that event. Why are you making fun of us? You're trying to make fun of us. You're a bully. <laughs> You're a bully. That's what they're going to call you. I'm a bully. No, man, I need the, like... The, look, these are eye masks. I can't see shit out of these. It's closer to becoming a raccoon. I mean, <laughs> really? That, is so, yeah. that was so dumb. I can't wait to go and see that guy at the corner store. I'm going to give him so much shit today. I'm going to go, dude, come on. I've bought enough little doggy treats and biscuits from your place. I mean, right. that's it. If you don't give me 16 bottles of Gatorade, I'm never coming back. Well. Never. You, you, should, you should be going to 7-Eleven because they're course the best. I do that, too. I got to go out the way to get to I my 7-Eleven. But, yeah. hell, I'm going to go to this guy and say, hey, give me six cases of Gatorade or I'm done with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's payback for selling me these trash oh, glasses here. Trash. Man. Oh, uh, that's, you know what? I'm going to tell my grandkids. I got seven grandkids. I'm going to get them to make me some of those for the next event. You know what I'm saying? I, have, I don't know. You can just have mine. Anyone can have mine. I mean, no, those are collectors. I you need to keep those forever. Put those in a box now, dude. I, what, do you want me to give them to the homeless? They'll throw them away. Castle. They'll laugh at them. Put those in a time castle and bring those out like the day you get married. Oh my god! You got my, my kids. God forbid I have them. Look at these and be like, "You wore this, you dumbass." <laughs> Be the first time, yeah, like a four year old kid, it'll be the first time I ever hear him cuss, and it'll be yeah. because of these dumbass. What is that? <laughs> oh my god, well, you, you, right. you were driven into the event, though. You, you, you still enjoyed the build up. It's nice when people come together for something like that, though. I mean, the build up was fantastic all over the world, so yeah, you know what? And if you had the money to spend it to come this far, which I think is kind of stupid, but if you got it, people do other stupid things with their money. So if they want oh, to sure. come out to Central Texas, so be it. You're right. That That's the right mindset to have. Like, uh, there are a lot of people out there who view the things that I like as incredibly dumb and a huge waste of time and money. So that's okay. Like, to each their own. Like, don't move here. Yeah. You can come visit here. Don't move here. Yeah, then don't, they won't, do they won't have a problem.
But, uh, you know, people dunk on me for the stuff that I like. I'm going to dunk on other people for the stuff that they like. Like, if you if you traveled across the world for this, yeah. look, hopefully you have FU money to where it's like, ah, this is nothing. I've got the yeah. extendable cash. I can sure. do this. But there are people, Buck, who I'm sure traveled to the zone of totality who don't have the money. Oh, no, like they've they hopped like their car. It's like the first trip they've gone on in like five years. And planned it all out together, yes. Yeah, and like that, if you're doing that and you don't have the expendable slash disposable income, then you're you're an idiot. And I hope you got let down by the skies yesterday because <laughs> you, you deserve it if you're making decisions like that. All right. Oh, PK, it was there too you. much. It was uh, it was enjoyable for myself and my wife. That's all I can say. I I enjoyed the time spending with her just doing that stuff and, and hoping to see something special. Like I said, I, I, a couple parts of that, I did see something special. So I got the good feel from it. Well, speaking of something special, your bracket this year yes. is something special. As we pull up the screen share, I would like to congratulate you on officially winning our Texas Sports Unfiltered Bracket Madness Challenge. First time I've ever won any of these kind of things. First, Your bracket. Ever finished in the 99.9th percentile of all of the brackets that were filled out all across the world. Uh, what you did this year was even rarer than the eclipse. Come on, year. man. Really? Yep. I'm giving you credit. That was more special than what we saw yesterday with that slightly dark sky in Austin, Texas. Congratulations to you, my friend. A, an easy win. I mean, you had 100 points more than second place in our bracket challenge. So now I ask you this, Buck. So do I get to my weather deal back? Am I, now, am I now back to being the number one weather or two? No. That has nothing to do with this. Oh. But you oh. did accurately predict rain today, but uh, it seems like you inaccurately said it wasn't going to rain yesterday. And apparently in parts of central Texas, we did get a little precipitation yesterday. Yeah, Dad so, didn't need to go to baseball practice. <laughs> Yeah, he was dumping buckets of water off the roof right in front of his son's window. Yeah, nice job. Good move. Son's looking out. Oh, no, it's raining. I can't go. You can't go to practice, son. So now I got to ask you this because the grand prize for our bracket challenge this year yes. is a 65 inch <laughs> TV from our great friends at Audio Visual Consultations. And we said before the tournament started that whoever wins our bracket challenge is going to be the winner of that new TV. Yes. Well, you are the winner of the bracket ta challenge. The, the ball was in your court. Do you want that AV consultations TV? Of course, I want it. I have I, I have one here, but I I don't think that I can rightfully take it. So I would say somebody needs to rent a have a ribbon. You know, everybody needs a prize. We we this is how we work out things. But I don't need that. Somebody else who came in second place ought to get that prize. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you to Tom McKay. I always appreciate what Tom does. But I, I have a TV. I'm just fine with the audiovisual. Uh, what do I have? I, I have got a, I think, a, a, you have an uh, 85 inch. I have an 85 inch. I am just fine with that. I appreciate what I have. But to somebody else that can use that, how about a runner up getting that prize? Okay. So you are going, everyone gets a trophy. Yes, I'm going, everybody gets a trophy. Yes. But you were being incredibly generous and saying that uh, whoever finished right behind you is going to be the winner of our grand prize. Okay, so now when the coverts come up with a brand new Cadillac, there's going to be a problem with that if I win. <laughs> that you know one's going to you? Yeah, that one I say is somebody's getting the switch. Somebody's getting the Subaru. I'll take the cat. Oh, you're giving them your carpet munching car and you're taking <laughs> yes. the caddy? yes. That's oh, for man. you, Officer Peacock. You can use that over at the police department, the Subaru. Oh, but no, man. I'd like to give this, I'd like to give that to whoever the runner up is. All right. Well, the runner up is LJ Longhorn. It's Very showing nice. that they finished third, but that's a user error by me. I accidentally submitted your bracket twice. Oh, so I won twice. So, so I get a I get a prize and a runner up, huh? Yeah, well, it's amazing. Bucky G and Bucky G, a.k.a. D's Nuts, had the exact same bracket, and they finished tied for first place in our bracket challenge. But um, no, it was actually the same person. So LJ Longhorn, and it looks like it's Letitia Jones, at least based on her YouTube comments. She's claiming 
that that's her bracket. And I've got no reason to disagree with Letitia Jones. So Very congratulations. Nice. Very nice. Congrats. Reach out to us on the Coda text line, Letitia or Leticia. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. 512-222-9328. Shoot us a text and uh, we'll get in contact with you. And we will let you know how you can get your prize. I think uh, if you live in the Austin area, I think Tom McKay and the crew at AV Consultations are just going to drop it by your place. I don't think you're going to have to awesome. do anything. That is that is great. They're going to uh, make it easy for you, and they will mount it. You know, you'll have to pay them a little bit if you want them to professionally install it, but they will you just the drop it off. Hanging, if you want the wires hanging out of your wall. Mm-hmm. But if you just want to, if you just want them to drop off the TV in that box right at your front door, they will do that for free. So reach out to us, Leticia or Leticia. Uh, congratulations. Well done. I mean, look, your your bracket was in the 99.9 percentile buck. Uh, Leticia's was in the 99.4 percentile, which is tremendous. Like that's in the top 0.6% of all brackets that were filled out all over the world. So sort of like uh, DD, sort of like DD. She's close, but she's not really that close to a weather. She just wants to be. That's called want to. I get it done. All right. Get it done. Hey, Zach's mom, the winner. Good job, Zach. Your mom did that's very nice. There we go. There we go. So I'm excited. And thank you to Tom. Thank you once again to Tom McKay because Tom McKay is uh not only for doing this, but what he does for us. And Tom is also an audiovisual consultation are giving away a 90 inch screen TV for the mullet open grand prize. And that's with the accessories. That's surround sound and the whole works. So that is that is gonna be an awesome prize. And no, I don't know who's going to get that because that's a random pick of the draw because that's how we do things. Oh, the randomizer? Uh, yeah, I'm not bringing that randomizer with me because there are people that will break that randomizer at the golf tournament if I start using the randomizer to pick names. But they don't play. <laughs> no, they don't. And I got to apologize because we forgot to give away that Cabo Bob's gift card yesterday. Ooh. And the randomizer just didn't come out when it needed to come out, so – we will be giving away about the sun and the moon. I guess so. Yeah. Y2K got to me a little bit yesterday or something, but uh, we will be giving away that $50 Cabo Bob's gift card today before 10 o'clock. I awesome. promised the people that, so make sure you uh, shoot us a text on the code of text line or leave us a YouTube comment. You will be entered to win that $50 gift card to Cabo Bob's. If you're not listening to us or watching us, you're missing out. You're, you're literally costing yourself the opportunity to win a bunch of cool prizes. We do more giveaways than like any Longhorn related YouTube channel, any radio station in town. And we're going to keep the giveaways coming. So uh, shout out to all of you who do listen and uh, congrats to Letitia once again on Take it home, that brand new AV Consultations TV. You know, yesterday, BK, when we were, we were you know, uh, we were talking we were talking to the guys about uh, WrestleMania. This dude, Roman Reigns, is Roman Reigns and The Rock, are they like cousins or something? Like actual cousins? Yeah, I mean, are, are they like kinfolk or something? Because they, they all, all these guys act like they're, you know, booger eating brothers. But I mean, are, are they, are they, they're not related, are they? Um, I don't know. I don't, think, I don't, so. I don't think, think so. I've never heard that. Like, I'm I'm far from the biggest wrestling fan in the world. So that's that's a question for Rodney or our guy Suplex Stu Myrick, and not me. Um, uh, I've never heard that before. So I mean, they were you know that they were was, on each that, other's. Obviously, that, that event was massive. Oh my god, oh, dude! Man. I I I had a great time watching that on Sunday night. I went back and watched the main events three times before I went to bed on Sunday night. Like I'm not even a big wrestling fan. And I was like jazzed up from what took place in Philadelphia this weekend. They crushed it. And they had John Cena. They had the rock. They had Austin zone, the undertaker make an appearance. Wow. Like, they brought back some of the legends in WWE for that uh, heavyweight bout at the end for the world championship between Roman Reigns and Cody Rollins and or Cody Rhodes and Cody Rhodes got the win. So ending the reign of the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Fun nice. night. Fun night for the booger eaters out yeah. there. All right. Uh, the game itself last night, Buck. UConn capping a dominant two-year run with its second straight national championship. Congrats to you. You had 5,000 units on the Huskies covering six and a half last night. They did that with relative ease, 75 to 60. 
the final score from Glendale, Arizona. This game, I mean, it, it felt decided basically with 10 minutes left. Um, you know, crazier things had happened. Like Purdue obviously had a chance to come back and make it a game, but UConn was just too good. They got whatever they wanted offensively in the second half, and nobody for Purdue besides Zach Eady even bothered to show up to that game last night. UConn is inevitable, Buck. The best team in college basketball all season long. They followed up last year's dominant tournament run with an even more dominant tournament run. They had the best scoring differential in the history of the tournament. They outscored opponents by more than 22 points per game in the six games that they played in the 2024 NCAA tournament. Just a dominant team. The first team to go back-to-back since Florida in 06 and 07. They were in a league of their own all season long, and they proved it in the big dance. Yeah, their guard play was ridiculous last night. You know, everybody was looking for the behemoths to get after it, and they did early, early early in the game because – I thought Zach Eady was playing really, really well. I didn't know what Connecticut was going to do. I thought Eady was going to file their big man out because they did let him play. Because they, they, as I said, that's a hard, that's a hard two to officiate because they were bumping each other, you know, using their using their elbows, using their arms to fend off the other guy. Eady with his little jump hook, and then he started to push. They started to push Eady out away from the basket because that that jump hook had to end up being a jump shot, and he started to come up short on it. But the guards from UK, the guards from uh, UConn were just too big for the Purdue guys. They they were just they were too athletic and too big. The six five six six guys, nobody else could do anything. Nobody could get a shot off. Their three point shooting wasn't there. You know they were they were going to let Edie go ahead and get his until he just couldn't get it anymore. You know what I mean? So his range just became too far. They finally pushed him out a little bit. But anything anything underneath the basket, Edie was getting. He was. He was moving that other dude all over the place. He got everything he wanted. It's just when they started to kind of double him a little bit and move him off the block that it hurt them because the rest of those guys didn't even show up. What did they do? What did they were? Did they forget to come to the game or what? They they were on the court, but did they actually play in the game? Yeah, I mean, UConn made Purdue one-dimensional. It's as simple as that. And I don't know what Purdue's game plan was. I mean, it literally felt like every possession, they just wanted to get the ball to Zach Eady and just say, all right, like this is it. Once we give you the ball, we're just not going to do anything else, and hopefully you can score two points for us. And that's yeah, and he that. crashed the boards, and Purdue went to the boards also early. Yeah, well, they got out rebounded in that game yeah. last night, so that didn't work. I mean, they I, look they they made ten threes against NC State in that semifinal game on Saturday, and I was saying yesterday for Purdue to have a chance to win this game, I think they needed sure. to make at least ten threes. But they only shot seven threes. And you credit UConn for doing a good job defending the three point line and chasing Purdue off the three point <laughs> line. But Purdue made they made one three last night. Yes, they were in their jocks. I mean, BK, they were going around screens and they were, I mean, going around Zach Eady on a screen, that has got to be you talking about frustrating for a defender to have to go around that big ass dude to get to your guy. But they did it. They found ways to get around those the, the big screens by the two bigs by Purdue. And they got there and they were in their face on jump shots. Like you said, but they only took seven. Those guys are frustrated even getting shots off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I, I don't know how you only take seven threes. They only made one. Like, of course, if you told anybody Purdue was going to make one three in that game last night, yes. uh, it would have been obvious that they lost by double digits. It was just everyone was passive. Purdue was playing scared last night. I don't know if there's like a mental block now when you go up against UConn just because of how dominant they've been. But, like, that was not the same Purdue team that I've watched all season long. Like, they, they looked like the moment was too big for them. And I was a little worried that was going to happen on Saturday, right? It was their first Final Four since 1980. Sure. And I felt like just a huge step for them, a huge accomplishment for them to finally get there. I was a little bit worried that maybe they were going to look a little scared going up against NC State. They didn't at yeah, all. They, they didn't get defended. Those threes were uncontested threes. They were, like, sitting in corners and making jumpers without anybody. The UConn guys had their hands up in their face. They made it tough for them to even get behind the yeah. three-point line. I mean, they they defended them, and, and that's – I mean, that goes to their coach. You're talking about being bought in. And that's right. a that's a different group at UConn, you know, from the group that played last year. When you bring a, a bunch of new guys in, you know, you lose two or three guys to the NBA and you bring all these other guys in from transfer portal. And then they play like the way they played and they defend it, not just play an offense, but defend it that way. That's a hell of a coaching job right there. You're right. And that, that's the beauty of UConn, right? Like it, it, it shows last night's game showed you that you need a team 
to win a yes. championship because Purdue had one guy who showed up last night and UConn had six or seven guys who showed up last night. And that's, yep. that's why UConn's so good. Like Zach Eady was clearly the best player on the floor last night. And if you run down, if you like rank the best players in college basketball, like you, you might not put a UConn player in the top 10. I don't know if you're putting a UConn player in the top 15 of just individual players in the country. But obviously, UConn was the best team. They were the number one team in the land for most of the year. They were the number one overall seed, and they dominated their way to another national championship. They are far and away the best team in the sport. Yeah, over 12 game stretch, there's nobody even close. Yeah, and they have so many different ways to beat you. Like Tristan Newton was the most outstanding player. He was the leading scorer last night with 20. He really could have given that award to four or five different guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's you can't, you could focus your attention on, on stopping Zach Eady. If you're going up against a team like Purdue, you can't focus your defensive attention on any one player, hell, no. any two players for UConn, because they've got about five or six guys who can go for 20 plus on any given night. And like you said, they're so well coached. The sets they run in the half court offensively. I mean, their ball movement was amazing. There was like a 10 minute stretch in the second half where they really pulled away where it felt like they were getting dunk after dunk or wide open three after wide open three like Purdue was just lost defensively UConn was just running circles around them and yeah. Purdue had no idea where the ball was going and UConn was getting wide open shot after wide open shot they had it was backdoor cuts on ED they had backdoor cuts and guys couldn't catch up yeah yeah I mean it was a masterpiece it was a by masterpiece the way, by the way all those guys that UConn play at the rim I mean they were going into the paint and at the rim you know they got one shot blocked but outside of that, BK, they still went to the rim. I mean, they still went strong to the rim on backdoor cuts. They weren't trying any wild passes that because they couldn't get their shot off against Edie. They were getting shots off. They were making bank shots. They were banking them off. That That's a very skilled team, and that's a very confident-looking group, too. Yeah, and uh, the craziest stat last night, uh, and, and just a stat that kind of shows how lost Purdue was on the offensive end. And look, UConn's been one of the best defensive teams in the country all year long, so you give them credit for really putting Purdue in a bind. But there was only one player on Purdue that had an assist last night. Wow. It was Braden Smith. He had eight, he had eight assists now, but nobody else on that team had a single assist. So while uh, UConn is just spreading the ball around, I mean, UConn had 18 assists as a team. And basically everybody who played outside of the walk-ons who checked in for the last 30 seconds of the game had an assist. And one player on Purdue had an assist last night. Like they, yeah, they had no offensive game enough. plan. And yeah. that dude didn't shoot enough. You know, he started to get his little mid-range jumper going. And I'm like, you should have been doing that from the start. I think he was afraid he was going to get his shot blocked. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened for Purdue, but they, they just got embarrassed last night and you credit UConn once again, uh, a, a dominant two year run for them. I didn't think it was possible for them to one up what they did in last year's NCAA tournament, yeah. but they, they did. They really did. Uh, and for UConn, I mean, they're a blue blood. They were before last night and now there's no way around it. And Dan Hurley said in the post game trophy presentation on the floor after the game, that UConn has run college basketball over the last 25 to 30 years. And he's right. They've won six national titles as a program. All of them have happened since 1999. Like literally since right before the turn of the century, there has been no program even close to UConn in terms of dominating men's college basketball. And yeah. oh, by the way, the women's team has like 10 national titles in that right. time too. So when you, when you think college basketball now, you have to think about UConn, men and women, they are the premier program in the sport right now. And yeah, I don't know if either of them are stopping. It's going to be interesting as as these leagues, you know, the SEC and the ACC, whether it's football or basketball, whether they – what direction they go in is there going to be, you know, two power conferences, three power conferences. But Bobby Hurley, I mean, he's going to have some decisions to make. Now, he says he's not going anywhere, but where – is UConn going to become the Notre Dame of basketball where – it doesn't matter. You're going to want them in any conference. You're just going to want them if they're, you know, will the Big East be a part of, of what's about to happen to basketball, just like the SEC has done. And, you know, teams from the Pac-12 have joined the, the Big Ten. I mean, because that's the next step is basketball is going to start doing that. And, and what is a place like UConn? UConn, is the Big East powerful enough to do that? 
I, I think so. Like, so here's Danny Hurley after the game, right? I mean, he was asked about the Kentucky job. Of course, sure. the Kentucky job is now vacant because John Calipari left UK for Arkansas a couple of days ago. That hasn't been made official yet, but apparently that will be made official later today. Uh, here's Dan Hurley. He was asked about the possibility of potentially leaving UConn despite winning back-to-back -back national titles. Dan, I, I hope I don't misquote you, but you said out on the court something about UConn giving you all the resources you need. Um, can we interpret that to mean you intend to be back at UConn next year? You're not going to entertain any conversations <laughs> with anybody else that might have a job coming open tomorrow? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that's a concern. <laughs> you know, my wife, uh, you should have her answer that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she ain't going anywhere. Yeah. So that, that tells you all you need to know. I mean, the thought of any coach leaving after winning two straight national championships is ludicrous, right? Like the only, the only way a coach would leave in that spot is if you do what Billy Donovan did and go to the NBA. Right. right. And even he waited a couple of years before going pro, but like that, that's the only job that it would make sense for Dan Hurley to leave for. If you wanted to try his hand at the next level, then okay, he leaves UConn, but for him to leave that for another college job, it makes no sense. Like he, he's built that thing up into a dynasty. He has proven that he can win there. And the crazy part is like, you go back to Florida in 06, 07. You go back to Duke in 91, 92, right? The last two teams to repeat as champions. And they were talking about this during the broadcast last night. Now, both of those teams were pretty much the same team in both of those years. Yes. Like they won it one year and just about everybody came back the following year and then they won it again. Uh, UConn lost five of its top eight scorers from last year's team. And they were even better this year. So, yeah, the thought of leaving that for another college gig is asinine. Uh, UConn's got the money. They already gave Hurley an extension and a new contract last year after winning one title. I bet they'll give him another extension and another raise after winning this title. That guy ain't going anywhere. No, right? he's right in the basketball mecca. I mean, he's right there where you can – I mean, he owns that whole New York, New Jersey, you know what I'm saying, all the way to the Carolinas. He's got – I mean, he's got whatever he wants. I mean, he's, he got a transfer out of Rutgers that made a difference for him this year. A guy came from Rutgers to join UConn. I mean, he's going to get anybody he wants out of the portal. You know, he's it, it, whatever he wants, he's going to get. And it doesn't have to be from the New York, New Jersey, you know, Ohio, Maryland area. He can get anyone from all, anywhere in the country to come play at UConn now. Yeah, yeah, he can. Yeah, he absolutely can. And he's yeah, still right out coach. He's a little bit of a hothead. Uh, he's got some crazy to him on the sidelines. Yeah. But like you said, he can flat out coach. Um, oh, here's a moment from last night. This just shows you the craziness of Dan Hurley. He got a warning from the officials for this. I was a little surprised he didn't get a technical foul, but I guess it was the first time it happened in the game last night. So the refs were cool just giving him a little warning. But this is so it's a 15-point game with about three minutes to go. The game's pretty much decided at this point. And you see Dan Hurley complaining. Here's what happened. During a game, Dan Hurley pushes one of his players basically to try to get Cam Spencer to actually do something. I mean, we, we, we talk about Shaka Smart, like in a defensive stance on the sideline. Dan Hurley's actually like shoving his players in the middle of a game, trying to get them to run the play that he wants them to run. Oh, no, he is. Hey, hey, can you can you get the play going? <laughs> this guy almost traveled because of his coach. Yeah, it's I mean, he coaches a lot like his dad did in high school. His dad was unbelievable in Jersey as, as a high school coach, just a legend. And so it's all in the family. That's just the way they play. That's just the way they coach. And they buy in. His players have bought, bought into his dad's high school system and he hasn't changed. I mean, they everybody has to play defense. I mean. If you can, I mean, you can't just be one. They don't have one specific player that does just as just a score. They play incredible defense. They play incredible team defense. I mean, they they can all run, and their bigs can run. That's the thing. I mean, they made it look so easy getting the ball in and out and backdoor cuts on little guys. You know, guys that can turn their hips and move. Their their big guys can can pass. I I enjoy watching them last night. I've, I've enjoyed watching them over the last two years. Like I said, that 12-game stretch of watching these guys is incredible. Yeah, we'll go back to a press conference from January of 2020. I mean, this could go down as one of the best shot calls of all time, right? I mean, Dan Hurley, you know, he's been at UConn since 2018. 
He was yeah. 16 and 17 in year one. He was 19 and 12 in year two. They didn't make the tournament in either of those years. Now in 2020, there was no tournament. They probably would have gotten in if memory serves. But then in the next two years, they made it to the tournament, but they didn't win a single game. They were eliminated in the round of 64 in both 2021 and 2022. And obviously they've gone back to back in 23 and 24. This cut comes from January of 2020. And I, I remember watching this and being like, man, this is a weird thing to say, considering that you, know, you haven't really done a whole lot at UConn yet. And it's not like Dan Hurley won national championships at previous spots. Like UConn was far and away the biggest job that he had. He did some good things at Rhode Island, obviously to the point where he got the promotion to UConn. But here was Dan Hurley in January of 2020 after a loss to Villanova. You know, people better get us now. That's all. You better get us now. Because it, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Two national titles later, I would say it came. Yes. And it's yeah. here for a while now. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think this thing is uh, going anywhere anytime soon. So congrats to UConn. Uh, just the superlatives for this team are ridiculous. The first team since UConn, uh, since UConn, since UCLA from 1967 to 1969 to win wow. multiple title games by 15 plus points in back-to-back -back years. UCLA, of course, did it three years in a row. So I guess that's what UConn has to work for next year. But just insane. And oh, by the way, for your cousins out there, Buck, UConn 12 and 0 against the spread in the last two NCAA tournaments. UConn 28 and 6 against the spread in the tournament since 2009. It's one of the safest bets you can make in sports these days. Is yeah, I would ride piece. that. I would yeah. ride that, and I couldn't find a cousin for that yesterday. I could only give you people an opportunity. Where was your I, cousin? I went bet U.S., of course. Where but, was your cousin? Oh, my cousin is uh, – I've, I've heard him too dearly so far this year. He took, yeah. a, he, took a, he took an NFL beating, and so now he didn't want to take any more of that basketball beating I had down for him. Oh, I hate when they run in high. When they run and hide, you know? Yeah. God, I thought with UConn, you'd uh, bring the cousin out of his claw. But I guess not. I don't know why it turned Unbelievable. out. Unbelievable. Okay. But I gave – you know, I've had quite a – I've had quite an NFL football season and to go for basketball right now. I dare not even try the NBA. I – no. The NBA is very hard to bet on, and I'm still suspicious that the officials are betting on games – Come on, so, man. Well, it's already been proven to have happened once. Well, it was a while ago, but still, you know, I'm, I'm suspicious that any ref is throwing games. I'm now suspicious that players are throwing games with how many guys have been caught betting on sports. You know, way more of them actually are betting. Of the course, they are. Been on their, on, you think they're not betting on their own games? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, congrats to UConn. Uh, some early odds for the... 2025. Are they like South Carolina? Are they favorites again? They're not favored. And I swear I like this tweet and I'm not seeing it. So I got to do a quick Twitter search right now. But the favorite to win the 2025 national championship in men's college basketball is the Texas Longhorns. No. Thank you, Paul Fombon. Really the, appreciate we'll, that. We'll get to that jabroni in a second. Duke. Is your favorite at ten to one to win the championship next year, and then you've got a three-way tie with UConn, North Carolina, and Kansas at fourteen to one. I think I saw Texas around thirty-six to one, if memory serves, but I can't find the exact graphic that I was looking for. My apologies. I don't think I'm going to waste my money on that one. Uh, I'll take that bet if you want. Thirty-six to one. Yeah. Give me a hundred bucks. I'll hold it for you. No, uh, no, you don't want to mess with that. I don't want to mess with that. I think you don't want to mess with no, that. No, I don't want to mess with that either. Yeah. So I, oh, I, don't even know who, I don't even know who's on their team anymore. I cannot believe UConn is not favored. They'll lose a bunch of guys again, but once again, they lost five of their top eight scores from last year and were even better this year. Uh, they're going to lose some key pieces to the league, of course. But, but like some said, great ones coming through the transfer portal. You know that. Yeah, great ones coming through the portal. Great ones coming from high school. Danny Hurley's yes. going to keep developing guys. And 
Um, yeah, they, they've got a very good shot to get the job done again in 2025. Okay. All right, before we get to the aforementioned Paul Feinbaum and some of the comments he had to say about Texas's impending move to the SEC, Buck, let's give a, a few more shout-outs here. Our good friends over at Texas Orthopedics. Folks, if you're seeking that specialized patient focus orthopedic care, contact the experts and our friends at Texas Orthopedics. Now, their physicians believe in surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, spinal care, sports medicine, trauma care, joint replacement, rheumatology, and more. While you're there, do say hello to our good friends, Dr. Christopher Danny and Christopher Stockton. They are dedicated orthopedic surgeons there, and their goal is to get you back into good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Folks, Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. For more information, go to txortho.com. Yes, indeed. Love our great friends at Texas Orthopedics. Shout out to the Altstadt Brewery as well, and shout out to Altstadt Beer. Really just a shout out because it's the best beer that you can find anywhere in the universe. And you don't have to wait 20 more years to get Altstad beer. Whoa. Altstad's a miracle, okay? Now that's real stuff right there. What we had in the sky yesterday, crock of crap. Altstad is real, and it is spectacular. Once again, it's the best beer that you can find. And they've got a bunch of different brews as well, something for every beer drinker out there. All of the Altstad beers are brewed without preservatives, without sugars, without unnecessary additives. It's a clean beer that tastes great. It's going to hit the spot every single time. So whether you're camped out, staring up into the sky with these stupid ass glasses on. If you're watching sports, if you're spending time with friends and family, it doesn't matter what you're doing. The good times are made even better with alt stat beer. Pick it up wherever you get your beer. H E B specs, twin liquors, total wine. Of course, 34 wine and spirits has alt stat as well. It is the official beer of BK. It should be the official beer of you as well. It is alt stat beer. No impurities, no regrets. Loving it, man. Love it. And how about now? A word from our great friends out at Covert Bee Cave. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert Bee Cave. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Oh, yeah. I saw the beautiful Covert van that's wrapped for 34 Wine and Spirits. Ricky and my son's uh, uh, Wine and Spirits store has one of the Covert, two of the Covert vans that are wrapped with big old picture. When you see that thing around town, man, people are going to stop when that van is pulled over and start taking a picture, thinking they're taking a picture with Ricky with his 34 jersey on the back of that thing. That thing is so cool looking right now. Yeah. Love yeah. It. That's a great collaboration right there. It certainly is. Covert family with 34 wine and spirits. Uh, love everyone associated with both of those brands. And uh, yeah, you sent me a picture of that van. I think I'm going to go wow. buy 34 wine and spirits a little bit later today. I got to restock the bar at home. I'm going to go see uh, AJ, but also go see what that van looks like in person. That is incredible. I mean, I was over there the other day to see it. And I mean, as they grow their business and my, my son and Ricky and Scotty have been growing this business for the last last 10 years. You know, they're just just a little store, a little corner store that used to be King's Liquor over there off of the Southwest Parkway. And now it is not only a wine and spirit store, but it is a class B distributor throughout Central Texas. It is it's amazing what they've done and they've worked their asses off. They've been standing behind that counter, you know, doing what they needed to do to get that business going. And now that business is kind of getting on top of the heap right now, BK. So yeah. we're going to be a part of that. And you now we're looking forward to the, to the football season, doing a lot of things with Ricky and Ricky is, uh, and my son have turned out to be quite the businessmen right now. That's what it's all about, brother. Yes, indeed. Yes. But you, you got to team up with the right people and with the covert family, they have teamed up with the right folks for sure. Absolutely. That is well said. Well said, my friend. All right. You want to hear what Paul Feinbaum had to say? Is this guy going to be a Texas hater from this point on? Or is he going to be, is he, I mean, I kind of like, I like him. You know, I'm not one of those guys that dislikes him because I, I because he's such an Alabama hunk, you know, I mean, I, I'm okay with that because I think he knows enough about the sport itself. He's just not shooting off a bunch of shit. You know what I'm saying? But he's not going to be one of these just everything. He's 
he's just going to despise about Texas. I, I hope that's not the way he's going to be. I don't know, right? Like Paul Feinbaum has been dunking on Texas for years, but for a long time it was because Texas was one of the premier programs not in the SEC. Right. And then it, it feels like even since the announcement came down that Texas was going to the SEC, Paul Feinbaum has been dunking on Texas, right? It's like, oh, well, you're not here yet, so we're still going to talk trash about you. Right. I don't know if it'll change. Like, you know, July 1st, right, when the official move happens and the Longhorns, we don't have to talk about Texas going to the SEC. We can talk about Texas actually being in the SEC. Like, maybe that flips a switch for Feinbaum to yeah. where, like, on that day, he starts treating Texas like Alabama and like the other schools that have been in the SEC forever. Or maybe he just doubles down and is like, oh, they're the new kids on the block. Like they're the freshmen of the high school. They're yeah. the pledge of the fraternity. Like they've got to be ingrained into this league before I can give them love. I don't know what he's going to do, but to this point, he has been a Texas hater. And I don't know if and when that will ever change. But he was on with that SEC pod a couple of days ago. This video was posted to Twitter yesterday. And, well, he was asked about Texas's move to the SEC and really why Texas is moving to the SEC. This cuts a little more than a minute long. Didn't want to cut it out. Wanted to give Paul Feinbaum his full context here. Here is SEC Paul talking about why the Longhorns are making the move. Uh, uh, because they they felt uh, that they had been promised that A&M would never come in. And... They were promised, and uh, Texas would never come in. But things change. Yeah, and 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 it's A and M's fault. You're supposed to ask why. Oh yeah, yeah why, why? Why? Yeah, yeah I was, I was thinking that. <laughs> One, two, three. No, uh, <laughs> the re A and M was so successful in the SEC, cousin Shane, that uh, Texas said we want some of that. I mean, it really. Yeah. It, it, I mean, they Texas in 2010 was heading to the Pac-12. I mean, they had already commandeered uh, a bunch of schools because they wanted to be more aligned with the Pac-12 academics, uh, the Stanfords, mm -hmm. the Cals, yeah. right. <laughs> what's now in the ACC. <laughs> uh, and they finally realized we, we need to do something. And Texas could have gone to the Big Ten, ACC. I mean, all this nonsense that we heard from, oh, well, the SEC. The SEC didn't do anything but answer a phone call uh, from yeah. their their attorneys answered a phone call from, the same phone call that uh, that everybody else got. They were they were on the prowl. They were leaving him, and they were going to go somewhere. So there's Feinbaum. Yeah, and the money quote in that buck is A&M was so successful in the SEC. Texas said we want some of that. That's just about money because it ain't about championships. I don't see a bunch of championships on the walls for Texas A&M. What were they successful at? They were successful at cashing a check. And I, I mean, if that's what he's talking about, well, hell yeah, Paul, that's what they're all there for. They're all there for the money. You know, they're, they're, you're going to play at the highest level. Obviously, when it comes to the highest level of football, for sure, you're playing at the highest level of football. There's no doubt about that. There's, there's no denying what that is all about. It's not, no, you can talk about the Big 12 and the Pac-12 and all that and how close. It's not close. You're, you're, you're talking, but you're talking about money. We understand that. And if you're mm -hmm. talking about being successful, and money-wise for your university, well, hell yeah, that's why they joined you. They didn't join you because, hey, we we want to be we love your academics here at Mississippi State. Well, shit, no, they didn't do that. They joined for the money. And where's A and M been so successful? Collecting checks. That's where they're successful. They're not winning any championships unless there's some championships they've won that we don't know about. Oh, well, they're winning conference championships and other sports, right? They're not winning them in the major sports, but they've had some success in some of the quote unquote Olympic sports there. But obviously in football, they have not won a conference championship to this point. And no. men's, men's basketball, I don't think they've won. I mean, maybe no. they have a tournament championship, but they have not won a regular season conference championship since joining the SEC. I don't think they've got one in baseball yet either. So well, in the three in the major sports, they haven't won. No, no, they're, no, they're, no. They're, they're, they're big. The, the deal is they're successful is, is cash and checks. Yeah. Like I, I, I can't, I like Paul Feinbaum is right. People like I, Texas fans took that as what you said, like, Oh, what, what championships have you won in the major sport? The move to the sec has been incredible for Texas A&M. 
because they were winning shit here. It's not like they were winning a bunch of stuff in the Big 12 and then moved to the SEC and didn't win anything. If that happened, it's like, well, maybe we shouldn't have done that. But they're having like similar results, but they're making 10 times more money right. than what they were making in the past. Yeah, so the really move has been incredibly successful for them. Right. And if you're a Texas fan saying Feinbaum's an idiot for saying that, like, I, I'm, you're wrong. It's been a great move for AM. And it's not like they have had no, no success in any of the other sports. They've been doing great in a lot of the other sports, and they have held their own in a lot of the other sports. But in terms of the big three, they are having similar levels of success to what they've always had. Not much, but they are making so much more money. They're That's getting right. facilities upgrades. They're getting more donors to donate because they're in the SEC. And that is helping the university and it's helping the rest of their athletic program. So it's been an incredibly successful move. For the Aggies jumping to the SEC, it's yeah, the of best course thing. that's why. And if why, of course that's why we joined. You think we're joined for free? It's the best thing that they've maybe ever done as an athletic department. So, like, look, if Texas fans are just using this as like, ah, we want to dunk on A and M because they haven't won much in the major sports, then that's fine. But like, I've seen a lot of Texas fans say, like, what type of success are you talking? That's the success. Yes, the money. The athletic is- department is so more, uh, way more successful. So now I sound like an Aggie. So more successful, way more successful now in the SEC than it ever was in the Big Twelve or the Southwest Conference or yeah, any other. Conference losing in those today. conferences and not getting paid the kind of money you're getting. What's the difference? I mean, the difference is you're not getting paid. Right. I, the I, difference I just, is now they're getting big money. And for Feinbaum to say, "Well, yeah, Texas wanted a piece of that." Of course they do. No shit, we want a piece of that. That's why we did it. Yes. It's way harder to win in the SEC than it is in the Big 12. But we're taking that challenge because of the money. And the athletic department's going to be more successful, and the university's going to be more successful because like of the money. He's, he's acting like he's telling people a secret. Like, here's the secret. They're going to get more money. That's not a secret. That's why we're there. We're not there for your academics. Texas isn't there to, to, to hold hands in graduation with you and Mississippi State and Mississippi. I mean, serious. Really, Paul? We know it. It's about the money. Well, I'm, I, you know, a lot of Texas fans, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just seeing these comments and like, I, I don't understand why what he said was so groundbreaking. And every Texas fan is like, Paul Feinbaum's an idiot. He's an idiot for a million other things that he said. But saying AM has had success because they moved to the SEC is an incredibly accurate statement. And I, I don't, I don't know why that's like, shocking or hard for anybody to believe. And it's exactly why Texas is moving to the SEC. It's exactly why Texas is moving to the SEC. Yes. And why did the SEC say yes to Texas, even though they told a and they would never say yes to Texas? Because of the money. Yes, because they can make more money. These are all businesses. And what is success in business? It's making a profit. Yeah, that's, that's kind of – I don't know why people get riled up over that. You can hang all the banners you want, but if you're not making any money, if you're making Big 12, Pac-12 money for your championships, then and you can make it in, and still make money in the SEC and not win championships, but cash in for your entire university, it's just not about your athletic program. It's about your university. That's a lot of money going to the universities. TV says Texas made the most money every year prior to the SEC move. There have been years where AM's athletic department has made more money than Texas, number one, and number two, uh, okay, Texas is going to make even more money now because of the SEC. Movie. Sure. I mean, look at these TV rights contracts. Look at these these are ridiculous. The amount of money that's about to come Texas's way because of the move to the SEC, and A and M making as much money as they've made. Like they they've been riding the coattails a little bit of Alabama and Georgia and LSU because of their success, but A and M gets to reap the benefits of. Of that. course they do. So if you're gonna be an average, like if you're gonna be average at football. Like you said, Buck, why not be average and make a shit ton of money instead of hanging around the Big 12 and be average and make an average amount of money? Yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, my thoughts were Texas was going to this for the money anyway. With the TV rights are about to happen, they couldn't afford to hang around the Big 12, whether they won championships or not. Yeah. Why, would you, why would you do that? Go compete against the best. Be with the best you can be. Your university makes money just being your university anyway. Why not join the best of the, the athletic programs and make triple the money and still be able to win championships? It just, I, I mean. Like it, it, was a no, it was a no, it was a no brainer move for Texas, right. To go to the right. SEC. Like I, th- I think every Texas fan agrees and every Texas fan is excited about that move. Like 
that it, it's been a no brainer decision for A and M. To, to like it was absolutely the right decision for them to go to the SEC. And it wasn't that we need to get away from Texas deal either. It was about no, we need to go make that money. That was because by the way, we're going to be pretty average in sports anyway. Yeah, you know, they, they were definitely hoping to to get away from Texas, and they're they're mad that uh, Daddy's coming. But no kidding. It's uh yeah, I just I like I saw some of the replies and some of the reaction and heard some people talking about those quotes and they're like fine bombs an idiot. Once again, you can call him an idiot for a thousand other things that that guy said about Texas and about college football over his career, but saying AM has been successful in the SEC and Texas wants a piece of that, like that that's accurate. That is smart, that makes sense, that is yeah. like factually accurate. That move has been very good for them. That's a huge part of why Texas is going there because they want to have similar success to AM in terms of what it's done for the department as a whole. And win some championships along the way. And yeah, you know, Texas expects to win more championships and have more success on the field than AM has had. And we'll see if uh we'll see if they can do it. Well, now uh, I feel like that's not quite the shot that I thought he was taking. I just it's the shot that just makes sense that people have an understand hard time understanding that's all sure he, he sure. just didn't want to say the word that they were coming for the money which he could have very easily said and everybody would have said yep you're right let's move yeah. along but he he when he when he puts a and m in there people started to kind of scratch their head going what is it that they've done well they've collected some huge amount of checks since they've been there that's what they've done and yep. they've been okay in their sports department but they were just okay in the big 12 I mean, they weren't so. getting huge checks Right, and and I feel like the the brand recognition for AM is a lot stronger now than it used to be. Oh, of course it is. And AM's recruiting now a lot of its money, but a lot of that money came from joining the SEC. Yeah. So they're recruiting better. Like more people want to go to AM to play sports now. Obviously, it hasn't translated into championships, but like to me, yeah, any way you slice it, it's been a good move for the Aggies. It's based on their history. And Texas wants some of that. They, you know, yes, we want to take we, some of that money for sure. We, we've already heard recruits say, like, I want to play in the SEC. And, like, recruits who committed to Texas in 24 and 25 and L even 23 talked about the move to the SEC being a big part of why they committed to Texas. That's right. So, yeah, it's uh, – you don't need a pair of these jabroni-ass glasses to see. Hell, I can wear these and I can see what Paul Feinbaum's talking about. That's Come on, man. You got gypped. You're the one. Yours are darker than mine. Oh, it's really? It's blacker than yes. Yours are yeah. darker than the ones I got. I mean, I, I, these are ridiculous, man. You know what? They were there to, for protection. They were to protect you. That's all the vendor had in mind was your protection. You know what I'm saying? Well, and they did a good job of that. They protected your eyes. These are the opposite of protecting because if I tried to walk around with these, I would run into a door. <laughs> Could you drive the car? Could you drive the car with those on, dude? I, I would. I would hit the car next to me in the parking lot. <laughs> like I, if I if I put the car in reverse, I would back up too far and hit the car behind me. Like I cannot see anything with these on. I was just walking around my apartment complex parking lot. I would run into a car. Oh God, I can't believe it! I just put those things on, looked up in the air, and said, "It's too dark." What is that? I thought I was looking under the bottom of my roof at first. I'm like, no, that's where the sun is supposed to be. We need we, Is this blind Sean trying to recruit more people to the blinds? <laughs> I guess. They need Those, more bodies. I'm doing I'm doing special eyewear for the next one. I'm having by that time my grandkids, they'll be looking for jobs. So I'm gonna put them to work and do some special deals that you're gonna be able to see. And plus, you know what? You may be able to see Uranus. With the glasses, I'm gonna do. I can already see it. I don't. My own or yours? Well, you can see mine if you want to. If you want a glimpse, but if, with the special eyewear, you'll be able to see the dimples and everything else in your anus. What is it, like you a magnifying see? glass or something? <laughs> yes. uh, it's like imagine trying to climb Mount Everest with these. Remember this oh, video? No. Oh no! Oh, oh, they don't want the sun shining in your eyes off the snow, right? Yeah. Great. Well, or you know, the guy tried to climb Mount Everest once with these. Right after the break, we're going to interview Eric Weihenmayer, who climbed the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. But he's gay. I mean, he's gay. Excuse me. He's blind. So we'll hear about that coming okay. up. Okay. He's gay and he's blind? <laughs> wow. He climbed Mount Everest, but he's, but he's gay. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm so... 
you know, I was waiting for some of those to happen with the eclipse. Wait till some of the newsreels come out from yesterday. You know there had to be some people making some mistake. You know there had to be a couple on the air. Because they oh. were on hey, the Weather Channel people. Somebody had to make a mistake yesterday. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody oh, got man. the moon mixed with Mars. Someone said something wrong yesterday. They had to. Of course. Of course they did. I mean, most people had no idea what they were talking about. Like, they did a Google search five minutes before, and then were trying to impress their friends with the knowledge of the eclipse that they had. Like that's that's. I was no impressed by my wife. My wife had it down. She knew. She knew the stuff. She knew the stuff about the sun and the moon, and how far mm. they were away from each other, and how how massive the sun really is. And it looked like when it passes by, when the moon passed by it, they were just it closed it off. That thing isn't even close to closing off the sun. That's how big that son of a gun is. So, you know what a miracle yesterday. You witness a miracle that you really didn't even witness. You didn't even appreciate the creation. God gave you that creation and gave you just a little glimpse yesterday. And you know what you did? You just threw it out the window. You just went and bought yourself a pair of shitty glasses and said, that's not a miracle. I can do that. I acknowledge that the earth is a miracle. I acknowledge that us being alive on this earth is a miracle. All right. I respect and appreciate the greatness of human life and just life in general. There you go. Now you're sound. That's better. What I saw yesterday was the same shit I could have seen if I just waited four hours. It was just, it was just dark. <laughs> it was dark. Or this morning with clouds and yeah. a, a storm look throughout the sky. I could have just waited a few more hours, not gotten these stupid glasses, not wasted my time. Going outside and staring. I don't know what's guy. going on over there in that Oak Hill, Monterey Oaks area, but it was dark where I was. It was, it wasn't pitch dark. Like I could have thought, I could have tossed the football around without getting hit in the mouth with it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I could have driven know. around with my headlights off, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Okay. It was blue. Yeah, it, was, it was like a darker blue. That's all it was. Dark blue. No, it was darker than that. I didn't. I didn't get darker than that, man. Maybe. I mean, I was only out there for like ten minutes. Now, I was out there for what was described as the zone of totality or just the totality. So I thought I was out there at the right time. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I was not out for the right time. But Once again, I, it was just a way for the G-man to let you understand it. He didn't want to make it total darkness because people could have been in a panic. People could have been killed. If, 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 he'd have, if he'd have done something that would have put us over the top, people could have scattered all over this world and, and stampeded each other. So it just gave you just a glimpse. You were supposed to just get a glimpse and understand it. It could have been more, way more powerful than that, which we all know. But right. so that's just that's just the G man doing the right thing because you didn't want to be scared. You were scared enough, probably putting those glasses on. I mean, just I the was scared idiots. that I was going to run into something. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was scared about right there. Oh uh, my god! I wonder if people were having brunch outside yesterday. Oh man! Bottles of wine sitting in corners. I love the guy who's laying on your sidewalk. That's the best. That's how you're supposed to view. That's natural. That guy should have been butt naked laying on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> butt naked in the apartment complex? Yes. That's what that should, Why? That's not natural. I mean, what? Okay. If he was naked, I yes. could have called the cops on him, right? Somebody could have called and turned no. this guy in. It was that's un- not an excuse. Oh, it's eclipse day, so I thought I had to be naked. <laughs> The kids aren't in school, and there's a grown man naked. Officer, Officer Peacock is not going to find that excuse acceptable. Oh, the so. eclipse day. Oh, no, the kids are out of school. They're wandering around the sidewalks. Here I am laid out naked for the eclipse. You don't think that excuse would have worked for somebody, for that dude? Yeah, that's... And look, at he's on it. Plus, he's on an angle, and all the blood is rushing to his freaking head. What is wrong with your complex there? What is wrong with the people there? What kind of people live there where you are? Oh, man. There are all sorts of jabronis who live around me. Oh, my God. This guy, no towel, no chair, no, no nothing. Man. He didn't even lay on the grass. He's laying on the sidewalk. Right where the so, bikes need, where the kids who are off can come flying through there. And Should this was the it? guy. There was a guy next to me, like, on FaceTime. I don't know if he was talking to his mom or his girlfriend or something, but he was on FaceTime, like, I guess, showing them a picture or a video of what was going on. And this guy from the ground is like, he's like turning around like shushing the person it's like dude shut up guy 
He's waiting for God to speak to him. That was the opportunity when the moon and the sun came across, the message from God was supposed to come down to us. You're screwing up down there. That's what people were waiting for. They all got silent, like, why do you have to be quiet? What's the deal? There's not going to be, is there going to be an explosion? Are they going to hit each other or something? Oh. I didn't get the, the whole quietness about that. People if, were like, people were like in Indianapolis. The guy said, there's such a hush over the Indianapolis raceway. I'm like, why? What, what is, what is, is there about to be a message here? If they were going to hit each other, then uh, that would have been the end of days right there. Yes, it would, yes, it would have. <laughs> we would not be doing a show this morning if the sun no. and the moon collided yesterday. That'd be a huge issue. That would have been a disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, people would have been doing something else instead of just staring at the sky with these dumbass glasses. Oh, it would, it would, it would have been in a hurry. Don't worry, it would have been over with in a hurry. Yeah, I think there would have been a lot more intercourse going on yesterday. <laughs> yes. Now yes. that that is something that I I regret not doing. That that's a mistake. What? By me. Now I'm a believer that there will be another eclipse soon. People say 20 years. Yeah, I call, oh, no, you're not I, buying that, are you? I call BS. I say two years tops. Yes. We get another eclipse. But could you imagine just like, you know. Everywhere all over the world. Hitting your eclipse. Wow. During the total eclipse. Right? Like the climax during the zone of total itty. Now, wow. How, how's that Great. for something right there? And as they called it, the diamond ring getting engaged yesterday. I wonder how many people got engaged during. I bet you tons did. Oh, like an eclipse engagement? Like it gets dark outside and then you drop to a knee and propose? Oh, yeah. You know that happened all over the world. I didn't think about that, but I bet it did. Of course it did. There's going to be eclipse babies made nine years from now? Absolutely. Nine, years, nine months from now? Of course there will be. Okay. But hey, but it ain't happening with your buddy laying on the sidewalk there. No, that guy was not getting laid, and he's not getting laid anytime soon if those are the decisions the only he place made. he was going to the dispensary for more gummies. That's the only place <laughs> that that dude was going. <laughs> Unbelievable. Or more Jack Daniels, going to 34 Wine and Spears to pick up more Jack. That's oh, all that dude was going to do. My God. Yep. Uh, that's... Yeah, did, your, did your apartment have coolers? Did people have coolers out? You know, I was only outside for a few minutes. Um just because we were on the air for, I guess, most of the two and a half to three hours that people what did were Jordan watching. Do? Did, he, anything, did he come back with anything exciting? Was he impressed? Uh, it was with Barker. Was Barker, Jeff, was he impressed at all? A little more impressed than I was, but it wasn't blown away or anything. He was up in Hutto, too, so he had a very different vantage point than what I had. He thought it was fine. But he was he was like me going in, like he just he wasn't super bought into the hype leading up to the day itself. So he was maybe got what he expected. I got even less than I expected. I didn't think it was. Well, gonna of course, be cool. you did. You got less than anybody except for our guy Brad over at Jack Allen's. He wasn't impressed. I heard he was not impressed whatsoever. Now, did you talk to him? Well, I I've heard through Jay that Sue Patrick that Brad was not impressed. He would be listening this morning to our impressions of what went on. But, you know, he's had some miracles happen for him. So yep. he should have been impressed yesterday. If there's anybody to be impressed, I was thinking it was going to be him. He was not. He wasn't buying. That guy knows what a miracle is. Yes, and yes, yes. what happened yesterday was not a miracle. That was a wow. sky. That was a sky. Here he is from Jack Allen's on Anderson Lane. Not at all. Read. Not impressed at all. No, he's, Gosh, he's doing man. cool stuff in his life. What happened yesterday? Go outside Not right a, now. It looks looks pretty dark out there because it might rain. I'm gonna take a picture and post it on Instagram, and people will be like, "Oh, nice eclipse shot." Oh no, it wasn't the eclipse. It was just the sky because that's what day, yesterday was. Tell them day two of the eclipse. You're you're missing out. You should be out there today. <laughs> it's day two. I have drizzle. I have rain here, so my forecast is correct. Of course. Hey, there you go. Thank Congratulations. You Thank you. Yes. All right, before we get to some Masters odds, because, of course, it is Masters week here <laughs> on Texas Sports Unfiltered and everywhere across the world, a uh, quick check of the code of text line. A 281 number says, stop showing your youth, probably talking to me. Texas is Texas and would be good regardless of conference. Yeah, Texas would be fine in the Big 12, but why, why be fine when you can be better? Like, what, what business turns down $30 million a year more? Like None. It, that, if you do business like that, then I do not want to do business with you, 281. That, that's absurd. Yeah, I mean, really? 
Like, of course, Texas would be good, and they've been good. They've been fine, and they could have stayed fine, but you want to associate yourself with the best when you are the best, and you want to reap the benefits of being the best when you are the best. You get that shit in the SEC. You don't get that in the Big 12. No. That, that's uh, Captain Obvious stuff, I think, but hey, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. All right, before we get to the golf, Buck, what, uh, how about another sponsor shout-out this morning? Talk to our good friends over at Relax the Back. You know, since I've had my surgery, I have been sitting back into my chair again, and I missed my chair while I was out of town. Now, the surgery was a success, but I'll tell you, this chair from Relax the Back has been a success for me for over 20 years, folks. And you're going to love the relief that you get from your thoracic, lumbar area, your neck. They've got tempur mattresses, tempur pillows available at their two wonderful locations in BKs at the Hill Country Galleria across from Whole Foods and in Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. Live pain-free, and I'm telling you, I miss this chair, and I'm glad to be back. Folks, you're going to love everything you see at Relax the Back. Yes, indeed. I'll give some love to Jack Allen's Kitchen, of course. Five Austin area locations since 2009. They have been serving up unbelievable southern comfort food with a Texas twist. The menu is spectacular. The burgers are ridiculous. They've got tacos. They've got great salads. They've got great enchiladas. They've got chicken fried steak and chicken fried chicken. Of course, every time you dine in at Jack Allen's Kitchen, they're going to hook you up with that house-made pimento cheese Make sure you get there early because I've seen the buck just go table to table stealing. <laughs> if, if you get up and use the bathroom or go wash your hands uh, and that cheese is on the table, I'm here to tell you it won't be on the table if the buck is around. It's fantastic. Of course, they've got the full bar, great drink specials, the happy hour going on. TVs, phenomenal service. It's the total package. Everything you're looking for in a great dining experience. You can find at any of the Austin area jack allen's kitchen locations our guy brad great friend our guy jack gilmore great friend they do amazing work they're going to take care of you just like they take care of us every time you go in there now i'm going to get a, i'm going to tomorrow i'm going to go out and play my first round of golf and of course i'm going to have my big hat spirits mojitos they've got the mojitos now and the margaritas the non-alcoholic drinks that have orange and lime and kombucha and ginger it's kombucha without the hoochah in it B. Cage likes the hoochah in his drink. I don't have the hoochah in mine. I just drink the kombucha. Mm. But I love that ginger taste uh, in the mocktails that Big Hat they have. And you can find those, of course, all over the place. They are getting at HEBs, of course. 34 Wine and Spirits has the ones with the alcohol in them, of course. But you are going to love the folks over at Big Hats with some of their great drinks that HEB is really starting to get into those non-alcohol drinks. And I will be into non-alcohol drinks for the rest of my life. It looks like that. Unless there's another... Eclipse, maybe that's the time where I start powering down again or powering up. 20 years from now, I'll be 80 some years old. I think I can yep. have a little. No, that's what they call in the business stinking thinking. And you can't think like that. I could oh. never have alcohol ever, ever. Isn't that something, BK? I always thought that when I turned 80, don't I deserve a nice glass of wine? But guess what? Can't do it. Can't do it. If you make it to 100, <laughs> okay. All right. You should be allowed to have a glass of something, right? Or glasses. You might, you might die on your 100th birthday if that's the approach that you take. But that that to me feels like... Uh, I don't think you can do that. In the in the world of alcoholism, you, you, that's called stinking thinking. And it you is. Can't, you, you, can't even, you can't even look for it because remember, every day is, is, is the battle. So even if you get to, to a certain point of your life where you get to be that age of 100... You're always thinking that you're going to be 101 day, so you can't give up the fight at 100. What's uh, what are the three sayings? Easy does it, live and let live, and first things first. First things first. Uh yeah. The first things first is to get to that hundy. Yeah, yeah. First things first. Get to a hundy, then you can think about it. And by right. the way, it wouldn't be with a glass of wine. It would be with a shot of JD. Yeah, no. that's yeah. No. It wouldn't yeah. be a shot. It'd be a pull. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're going. You're, you ain't wasting your time drinking out the glass there. You're you're going straight from the bottle. Slide it right down there, Bach Keep. Yeah, that's the way it used to be. Yeah. That's how I got to this point. Yeah, but no, I, I love I love the mocktails and I love the folks at Big Hat. They've been fantastic, and it's good to see that they're having their success all over the place too. And we do appreciate their sponsorship too with us. Amen. And also a shout out to our friends at Pest Wranglers, effective, reliable, and affordable since 2006. Our friends at Pest Wranglers 
well, they are there to wrangle any pests that you don't want around your house or place of business. If it's mosquitoes, if it's ants, if it's scorpions, if it's spiders, it doesn't matter. If there's a creepy crawly around your place that you don't want around your place, reach out to our friends at Pest Wranglers. They don't do contracts either. Like you can use them one time. They will come take care of your problem and then they will never talk to you again. But if you have problems or repeated problems, they will always take your business and they are the best in the business at what they do. Pestwranglers.com. That is the website for more information. You can give them a call 512-670-7808 for more information as well. Love our great friends at Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. Our friends over at Leaf, where their where their locations in Monterey Oaks, and of course up north they have another location, a wonderful location. But I was there yesterday because I wanted to put something in the ground during the eclipse, and I did. And now it's raining; it's going to be perfect. It was perfect time to plant. That's when I was using my farmer's almanac to put some things in the ground yesterday, BK. And I'll tell you, my garden is starting to look good. I'm starting to get zucchini starting to come up right now. My tomatoes are starting to. You know, to flower out and starting to get some tomato buds to get. And I know there'll be people that are going to tell you, oh, I've already had tomatoes in. Well, I'm a late bloomer and I think everything is just going to work out. I was thinking by the end of April, it's going to be too hot and we're going to have scorching temperatures. Not so fast. I think we're going to be just fine. So I think we'll be able to flower out and grow tomatoes straight on through April. Now, getting to May may be a little difficult, but folks, the folks at Leaf, if you're if you're interested in doing some landscaping, around your home. That's what I've been doing over the last couple of days. Find out the shrubs, the roses, the bushes that you need, or the trees that will, are going to fit your landscape and your area of, of Texas that, that'll that work, the fertilizers that you'll need to make these things grow out. Because once you buy them, you don't want them to die in a week, or you don't want to say, okay, you know, it rained, I'm not going to water them for months or now, now in. So just make sure you know exactly what you're doing or you're wasting a lot of money. And if you go to Leaf, believe me, you're not going to waste the money. All those Folks here will help you put in the landscape that you're looking for or the plants or the gardening stuff that you're looking for. Amen. Love those. Folks. And 20, 20, over, I'm going on close to 30 years of going to Leaf. I am. And I, and I love the folks here. That's awesome. Leaflandscapesupply.com, the website for more info. Make sure you tell them you heard about it on TSU. You'll get a little bit of a discount when you go in there. All right. Uh, don't forget, we will be giving away a Cabo Bob's gift card within the next yes. 13 minutes. So. If you haven't sent in a text or left a YouTube comment to enter, make sure you do that. Uh, your chance to win a $50 gift card from our great friends at Cabo Bob's in honor of the Texas softball team winning two of three from number one Oklahoma over the weekend. Still can't get over that. An incredible showing from Texas softball. Becoming the first Big 12 team to win a series against OU since 2011. So we so need to win tonight baseball, men's baseball, right? Yeah, Texas baseball is in San Marcos tonight. It's a quick two-game midweek home and home against Ooh. the Bobcats. So down there at Bobcat Ballpark tonight, back here at the Dish tomorrow night. Texas looking for a little bit of revenge. These two teams played in Houston early in the season. That was a crazy game, but Texas State won 11-10. to Texas was down 6 to nothing at one point in that game. They came all the way back. They took a lead in the 7th. They took another lead in the 8th, and they gave it away. In the ninth. Uh, yeah. And, it's, and, as, and as well as, you know, Texas State has been playing over the last couple of years, your thoughts of Texas shouldn't be losing to Texas State. No, 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 no. I mean, these two teams have done these midweek series <laughs> in each of the last two seasons and they've yeah. split in both years. So uh, we'll see if that happens again. But obviously, if we get a split over the next two days, that would mean Texas State won the season series against the Longhorns because of that matchup at Minute Maid uh, back in February. So, uh, yeah, hopefully the Longhorns can take both, but just find a win. I, I don't know what to expect from Texas anymore. So I'll, I'll be watching. I'll be rooting like I always do. But my expectations for this team are about zero right now. And if they win tonight, my expectations for tomorrow will still be zero. They have to prove to me that they can put it together. Uh, really, in a little streak. Yeah. Like they, they had that three game win streak and it's like, oh, maybe. But then they You're dropped right. two or three to the worst team in the Big 12. And it's like, uh, maybe not. So I, I need two weeks of good baseball in a row okay. to buy in. And they're coming off of zero weeks of good baseball in a row. So they could it's start nice. it. They could start it tonight if they go on a little bit of a, a stretch where they're like five and one over the next couple of weeks, or maybe six and one or five and two, whatever it would be. 
then I can uh, start to think that this team can actually do something around the postseason. But if they keep doing this one step forward, one step back bit that they've been doing, then my expectations will be what they are now, which are zero. All right. Uh, Astros got a win last night over the Rangers, by the way. First series of the year. The team split the four-game set in Arlington. The Rangers took the first two. Uh, the Astros took the last two. Houston in Kansas City tonight, open up a, opening up a series against the Royals. The Rangers welcome the Oakland Athletics. So some winnable games coming up for both teams. But I, I promise. Know, I know you've got to be excited about I, I know it's it's getting close to you, but it's going to take you probably till tomorrow to start getting excited about the Masters. Wednesday will, Wednesday will come and you'll start – getting it cranked up for the Masters. I, I'm i I'm starting to get that feel right now. I guess when I get out there and shoot my 75 tomorrow, I'll be starting to, to get it back. You know what I mean? We'll see if this surgery really oh, yeah. works once I get out there tomorrow. Oh, you're only playing nine tomorrow? What? <laughs> no, just windy tomorrow, no rain. Just winds tomorrow. Okay. Just what right. I don't need. Where are but you yeah, playing I'm, tomorrow? I'm going out to, we're going out to Lake Cliff. Nice. Wide Very open. Cool. Let the wind take the ball. Let it hit the fairways and run, run, run. Yeah, yeah. You're not. You know, I, watched, I, I, I watched the Valero Open last week. I watched an awful lot of that. And boy, oh boy. You know, I'd gone down. I've been to twice. I've been down to the Valero Open just to to follow the golfers and, and watch. And what a what a fantastic place to watch. I played that course a few times. And man, if you don't stay on the fairways there, BK, there's nothing but a bunch of cactus and stones growing out of the ground. That hill country there is awful oh. just cedar and stones and cactus every every place if, the, if you don't hit it in the fairway if you just get off of the fairway there it's a a tough place tough place to deal but it's a it's a nice walking court oh geez. you want to watch this video again <laughs> look at this fool oh, yeah that's what, it's like. that's what it's like at the valero uh, I got to call NSFW. I thought I saved the one with no sound, but this one has sound, and I think there's an F bomb in of here. Of course, so. there is. There's got to be one. There should be. Here's your uh, earmuffs warning for the children out there. Oh my fucking god, dude! Yo, you rip this out of my hand. What? The <laughs> what? The <laughs> Can you rip this out of my hand? No, I'm not going near you. I don't want those things to get off onto my hand. Oh my god, that's just one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. And I'm glad that he need to make things. that shot with his boys. I mean, really. I mean, you're not playing at the Masters, dude. It's not the Valero Texas Open where you're trying to get a spot in the Masters, dude. Move the ball away from the cactus. What do you think my cheating friends would do? That thing wouldn't be near that cactus. No. Oh, it would be in the fairway somewhere. God. Oh, it ricocheted off. Oh, here, here's where I found it, right here. They're not even going to attempt to make that shot. No chance. All right. I'm getting excited about the Masters. Maybe we'll put together a little Masters pick em for Texas oh. Sports Unfiltered. I got to I gotta find a way to do that here today. Uh, but uh, we've got the odds. These are from ESPN Bet for the 2024 Masters. And no surprise who the favorite is. The world number one, the lifetime Longhorn. It's about to be legendary lifetime Longhorn. Scotty Scheffler, plus 475. He's got more than double. The best odds to win this tournament this weekend. Rory McIlroy plus 1,100, the second best odds to win the green jacket. John Rahm, the defending champ, is at plus 1,200. Brooks Kepka and Xander Shoffley round out the top five. Oh, the livers are here, aren't they? The livers are here. Of course, John Rahm, yep, the defending champ is a liver now. Uh, but he will be trying to defend his Masters championship from a year ago. Brooks Kepka, of course, is back. One of the best major players of this generation. He's got the fourth best odds, as I mentioned. You got Joaquin Neiman, who's been having a fantastic season on the Live Tour. He's in the top 10. A lot of livers going on yeah. because that is the best golf tour in the world right now. Buck. Shopley's at least going to be in the top five. But, uh, I, I'm, you know, I like Wyndham Clark and rewards, of course. Yeah. So... Uh, and, and Scotty Scheffler, I, I think Wyndham Clark and Scotty Scheffler are going to be in the top five. 
Yeah, God, that's, those that's odds for Scotty are so bad, but it's like wow. impossible to not bet on him the way he's been playing. And it, it all depends on how he putts. But the that course at Augusta is like the second shot is so important, right? Absolutely. And Scotty Scheffler is the best approach player in the world right now. He is so good at sticking him close to the pin. So the greens at Augusta are impossible. And, uh, you know, Scotty Scheffler is not the best putter in the world. So, you know, if, if he is not hitting his approach shots and he's got right. some distance on his putts, then it could spell trouble for him from Thursday to Sunday. But if he's, uh, I mean, gaining the strokes that he usually gains off the tee and then on the approach, then it's going to be tough for anybody in this field to hang looks, with him. And BK, it looks like you make some money off of Wyndham Clark there. I mean, that yeah. guy's being out of his mind right now, too. He's a plus twenty eight hundred, so a hundred dollar bet would get you two thousand eight hundred. Um, not bad there. What about Jordan Spieth? He's at plus twenty two hundred. I mean, Spieth, we know what he's been in recent years, but it feels like he's always in the mix at the Masters, doesn't I it? I said that that guy would win more Green Jackets than anybody. I I thought he was he was when he first started out. That I I originally said that this guy will win more. He will have his times where he doesn't play well, but he will have more Green Jackets than any other other golfer. I don't believe that anymore. I, I just, I don't. Yeah. I, I, I think there's so much going on in his, and, and and it's all a head game with him. I mean, athletically, that guy is gifted, but it's just a head game that's going on and some guys never get it back. I don't, I'm not saying he's never going to win another major or tournament. It's just, I don't think it's now. I don't think he's there yet. Uh, I don't know if he's ever going to win another major, man. Like, I hope I'm wrong, but. And he's only 30. He's got so much time to yeah. turn things around and get back to the guy that he was during his early to mid-20s. He could also get worse. But, yeah, he could get worse. And I just, you know, obviously won the green jacket in 2015, had the collapse in 2016 at Augusta, and it just feels like he hasn't been the same player since. So no. he's been close in tournaments over the last year or so. He's not having a horrible start to this season. No. But. I just I, I don't have the faith. I mean, maybe a top ten bet for Jordan Spieth could make some sure. sense. I, I definitely top ten bet with Hideki. Hideki Matsuyama. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you get uh, what plus two hundred for that, so a decent decent return. It. He's won the Masters before, and it feels like he plays that course pretty well year in and year out. Let me let me scroll down a little bit and get to some of the longer shots. See if there's anybody on this on this list that's. Uh, and we'll, we'll get a golf guy on tomorrow and get uh, some expert predictions and thoughts on the tournament coming up later this week. But anybody with relatively long odds that you think has a chance to make something happen? What about more Cower or uh, Patrick Delay? Patrick Delay? You mean Pat Fatty Reed? Can't lay. Oh, Patrick can't play. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were talking about Patrick Reed. My bad on that. Oh, is he getting an opportunity to come back and play? Oh, that's right. He's a winner. He's a winner. Yep. He'll be there. Uh, can't lay it plus 3,300. What about Phil Mickelson? <sighs> Oof, I might have to scroll a little bit longer. Yeah, you're going to have to go deep down the board for that one. To find those odds. Tiger Woods plus 10,000. You doing it? For a $100 bet? No way. There's Lefty at plus 12,500. On that deal, Tiger pretty good odds for Tiger. Tiger says he has no mobility in his left ankle, and that's dude. That is like I've never been to Augusta, and I hope that changes at some point. But you know, from talking to people who have been there, and more importantly, from watching coverage of this tournament for my entire life, that is a tough course to walk when you're healthy. Yeah, that's there are that, a lot of hills. Yeah, it doesn't look as hilly on TV, but that thing is straight up and down. It is a pain in the ass to get her. Like, even as a fan, like if you go as a fan, if you walk around one day at the tournament, like if your plan is to go Thursday to Sunday at Augusta, walk around the whole time, you, you will be so sore on Friday when you wake up. And you're gonna do it because you're there. You're you're gonna, you know, tough through it and power through it and enjoy the weekend and go out there and walk the next three days. But you apparently get so sore just from walking around that place. So with Tiger Woods being where he is and also saying that he's got next to zero mobility, 
Like, I, I'm worried about that guy even finishing two rounds, let alone having a chance yeah. to win this thing. And forget weather-wise, if it's slippery and slick there, if it gets wet. No, it's it's my son has been there, and he said, Dad, it's nothing like you can see on TV. He said the hills are straight up. It's like straight up and down. There's no slant to the hills. It looks that way on TV, he said, but no. Those things, it's hilly there. Yeah. And uh, Now, Tiger, Tiger's, yeah, you can hope all you want for Tiger. Just going to see if he can make it through day two. I mean, he's got to make the cut. That's the, he's going for a cut record, I believe, like 25 straight cuts at the Masters. Tiger Woods is minus 110 to make the cut right now. Um, I, I would honestly bet against him, which is the dumbest thing I've ever said because it's betting against Tiger Woods. But like, I, I don't even have faith that will make the cut, let alone compete. Ooh, that's a good one, that cut one, huh? Yeah, it's about even money right there. Phil Mickelson, runner-up last year. Forgot about that. He was awesome last year. And the Masters. And, of course, he's won three green jackets. Bring in, Phil. There's some money to be made there. I shouldn't say, of course, because I don't know the answer. But I think he's won three green jackets, if memory serves. There we go. All right. We'll talk more about the Masters tomorrow, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. My surprise pick is going to be who I always have as a surprise pick, Shoffley. Okay. I'm going to go Shoffley this time. I'm going to give him – the opportunity to come in fourth like he always does or fifth or whatever because he never wins anything. Yeah, very he's, waiting cool. the, he's waiting for Paris for the Olympics. You know, he's the defending Olympic champ, so he's, he's focused on that. Very bold of you to pick uh, the guy with the fourth best odds to win. That is really going out on a limb there, Buck. What? Well, well done. All right, quick shout-out to Olipop, and we're about to give away our Cabo Bob's gift card. We can yeah. bring on Double R and Wags, but uh, I've got an Olipop in the fridge that I need to down very soon. It's the best soda that you can find because it tastes like soda, but it's also good for you. Yes. And nobody, nobody else does that besides Olipop. All right. I see the gentleman in the waiting room. Boy, calling them gentlemen feels like a stretch, but it's Double <laughs> R and it's, yeah. it's Wags. Boys, good morning. Thanks. Yo, what's up, guys? How are we? Uh, we're doing good after the eclipse yesterday. I'm, I'm gathering all my feelings back. You know, I the euphoria I had yesterday was incredible, and now I'm starting to come down from it. Oh, there's the glasses. Yeah, it's Did you sit outside the, and watch it? Did you actually sit outside and watch it? I worked outside and in preparation for it and spent the with time Javi? with, with Javi my over? You know, Javier. Oh, by the way, Javier has, has called me BK. I'm talking to my surgeon last week on the phone. And guess who rings me? Javier. No way. He did. We you brought back the spirit. He's back around. He's looking for, he's looking to talk to his friend because we are friends. We're friends. So he, he must need to get back across or something. I don't know. <laughs> but <clears throat> dude, where's, yes, where's Tabo? We got to get Tabo on here. Tabo's back. Tabo has a ranch. Tabo is like a real person with real money. Javier is like a real person with no money. <laughs> they apparently that's what we need right there. That's, I mean, that's, that's that's the friends I need. But listen, I did hey. have a I had a lovely time with my wife outside yesterday. Just us two looking up into the heavens, but not with those things that be there. That yeah. right there is a jib job. We got I got abused by the convenience store in the corner. They used that's me. 3D hidden at a 3D glass. Is that, no, dude, that that is the biggest was, rip off in the history of rip offs. We as a man as a mankind should be ashamed of ourselves for actually well, thinking that that shit is going to work. It is no good. Well, hey, look, my, my daughter glass works glass, at the, the, glass, at the glass Paramount. The glass, and then yeah. when we were in full totality, I pulled the glasses off, and you could see like the ring around the. It looked like heroes. Save the hero. Save the girl. Save the world. Look at BK's glasses, guys. That's yeah. it. That's thing. You can't this, see them. This is this is what uh, I saw during the eclipse yesterday. Did you, you guys see any ring? You you saw nothing through your glasses? Nothing, just total darkness in mine. I saw, oh, I saw this. Get out of here. You got gypped. I got the Stevie Wonder pair, I guess. I don't know. No, man. It uh, it worked out good here. Um, and here's you know, I I had mine, you know, I was ready to go. My, my daughter works at the Paramount. So, so she was like, here you go, dad. So, so mine were free, but, um, so uh, I'm sitting around, I'm kind of waiting to see what's, what's going to happen. And I'm looking outside, you know, I keep waiting. Is it getting dark? 
you know, I wasn't sure when to go outside. And then like one of my neighbors is like laying out in the yard in like booty shorts looking up. <laughs> and I'm like, time for me to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> the creepers, like, come, the creeper comes out. <laughs> Here comes Creepo Johnson. <laughs> time for me to go outside and check this shit out. Oh, see what it's all about. Maybe that it was, was my mistake. I, I wasn't looking at any tail with these glasses. Maybe that would have given me a better experience. <laughs> Rodney, you should have seen the people in BK's apartment complex. There's dudes laying out on the sidewalk, not in chairs, not with not not you know, not laid out on a blanket or a towel. Look at this dude. <laughs> Look at oh this God. guy. Well, I mean, he that is that is what we call grounding. He is actually well, he is he is getting down with earth right there. Oh my God. Well, take yeah, your that's... clothes off. Be naked if you're gonna go like that. Just take your clothes off. Well, and then we had, then we had, so, so I was out in my yard and then the bad thing was, so I'm kind of sitting out in the yard and there's all that green shit everywhere. So I couldn't breathe the rest of the Grass? day. Once I said, no, all that mold or whatever the hell that oh. shit is falling out of the trees. And so it's there falling. are like people walking through my neighborhood um, with their kids because there was no school apparently. Oh yeah. Um, Thanks for the education where, there yesterday. Yeah, wearing these. They're like walking around wearing these. I'm like. <laughs> I'm like, I ought to back my car out of the driveway right now. <laughs> just back my car out and just. You guys are awful. They're supporting science by letting the children stay home and look at this thing. Oh, that, you know what? That was a wasted day off right there. I'm going to tell you that. I, I well, paid all my lottery money to help support these kids and their education. And that's what they gave me. They took off for that yesterday. Your lottery money. Yeah. Your you lottery money is going to help wait. out the kids in the future. That's for sure. You're going to be all pissed off when they want to be off on flag day. And they're going to say, nope, you got to come to school because we burned a bad weather day for the eclipse. What about Columbus Day? Do we yeah. still celebrate Columbus Day? When is I think that? we do. I don't Explor know. Exploratory Day where we explore the world. Columbus. Oh. That's what he did. I was explored. I, I mean, he, say didn't, this, he didn't hurt indigenous tribes. He explored. He explored them. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, he used them as experiments. Explored By the way, I did enjoy yesterday. I, it was a good time for me to spend some time with my wife outside. I, I mean, the it wonders was. of this universe, Roddy, were were on on display. I thought yesterday. For those who are expecting something really, really like BK, BK was expecting a lot more than he got. I enjoyed yesterday. I really did. You know, we didn't I get to too. Audrey too. We didn't. We didn't get like a weird plant that came after the eclipse that eats people. What's going on? Yeah, disappointing. I was let down. I was expecting uh, some more post-apocalyptic shit. Little yesterday. shop of horror. We didn't get none of that. I didn't get Steve Nothing. Martin with you know the dentist, the crazy dentist. This makes yeah. me want to go Friday night somewhere and watch Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's uh -oh. it's shake. Bring in the Whoa. Rocky, the Rocky get, Horror Picture get, Show. Yeah, that's what I want next. Hold what do we got? Do we get, do we get away yet? Place. The You're randomizer, done. the randomizer is is working overtime today. Uh oh, uh, it's all it's the eclipse. It's on delay. To get a, this to get week's fifty dollar combo Bob's gift card is somebody on the Coda text line. Oh, nice, a five one two number. That helps. That Congrats nails it down. Nine three seven three. Our there you winner. Go. Lucky the numbers. Cabo Bob's gift card. The comment, the text today, I listen every day and totally forgot to message about Cabo Bob's, and then BK mentioned that he forgot as well, so I hope I get lucky. Well, you got lucky today. There you Excellent. go. How about that? How Thank about that? Every day. All right, well, I got to go out and get some work done after the eclipse. It's a great time to get the, the grounds nice and wet, plant some things, let Mother Nature take care of itself, get get that all done. Just, you know, I – I was into it yesterday. I'll just say that. Good I'm, point. Bury, bury good your point. root in the ground, I'm Buck. Bury your root. I'm not going to bury my root in the ground. Get your hand in Mother oh. Earth moist. There you go. <laughs> there he goes. Oh, it's chaotic already on this Tuesday. Welcome to Chaos Theory on Texas Sports Unfiltered. I am Wags. That is Double R. You can find me on Twitter at Nuts Fake Wags. You can find Double R there at the underscore, excuse me, at the Rodney R, and then on Instagram at the underscore Rodney R. I'm on the Instagram at the Wagner Wire and all other social media platforms that way. Or if you are mobile, out and about, driving around our Fairburg, listening to us on that code of text line, 512-222-9328, make sure you're hitting us up and telling us all about it. That way you can be a part of this Cabo Bob's giveaway stuff sometimes. You know, when we forget, you forget. And then you hit us up on that 
uh, go to text line and hey, man, you become a winner of a Cabo Bob's giveaway card. Anyways, if you're not listening to us mobile, if you're at home looking at our ugly mugs on this YouTube channel, make sure you're smashing that subscribe button already if you haven't done so. Oh, and tell five friends like our friend Harge always says, man. And welcome to Chaos Theory on this wonderful Tuesday. Hopefully everybody is out of totality and didn't get eaten up by Little Shop of Horrors Plant Audrey too. I don't know if anybody got that reference. Apparently I'm the only dork that has watched Rick Moranis and Little Shop of Horrors. So, anyways, yeah. Welcome, Rodney. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, dude. Uh, Have you seen Little Shop of Horrors, or am I the only one? Uh, I, I think I saw it. I, I think I've seen it. Uh, but you can tell if, if I think I saw it, you can tell the impact that it made on me. It, so it's like that. I don't. I don't know. Cultureless swine. Cultureless swine. You don't know. watch musicals, it's, uh, dude. I, I just, man, I just no. What's up, I, Rob? What's up, Jake? What's up? Jason, what's up, Ruth? What's up, everybody that's wishing us a happy Tuesday here? Uh, Longhorn Bear LB and uh, Gabe, um, we got everybody, man. What's going on? Longhorn Bear, what's up, my guys? Yeah, Twitch, you know, entropy. Thank you. That that really was cool yesterday, and and you know, like for me over here, I like it, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I thought it was actually pretty cool, you know, seeing the whole thing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I lucked out over here in Round Rock because, it, I mean, it really, it looked horrible. But it was like, I mean, the timing and people were like, oh, the clouds cleared out. Didn't, I felt like the clouds cleared out for us, man. They did. They did. And people were like, oh, it's divine intervention. And I don't think it was that. I think the wind just happened to blow. <laughs> and boom, there it was. What's up, and, Diane? I mean, it was cool. Um, I mean, it really divine, was. Cool. Yeah, divine, divine intervention might be a little bit of a stretch. Uh, um, but yeah, the clouds did part ways, and it opened the sky opened up, and you know we had clarity so that we could you know experience the eclipse. Um, I saw. I, I'm going to try and pull this up, you know, during the show. But I saw one meteorologist in. in um, are they called weather? Go I'm pretty sure they're just called meteorologists. Uh, weather extraordinaires. Um, yeah, they're just called meteorologists. There's no uh, other professional name for them i saw one meteorologist i can't remember the station that she represents or whatnot but i mean you want to talk about embracing the yeah. total eclipse she was all about i mean she was letting them fly i mean she was her pitch was elevated she was excited i mean the most excited i've ever seen anybody for the total eclipse i sat there and looked at it in you know in in you know just wildness you know what i mean just completely astonished um i've never seen anything like it man checking out the checking out the shadows on the trees when the mm -hmm. totality yeah. actually happened man like seeing the it was wild it was it was weird in uh, in the craziest thing to me was that just for a moment almost like for a minute or two minutes even the birds stopped talking you know yeah. what i mean like they're like even animals like usually like at night you hear like crates and everything right yeah. or, or a, a, a few of the insects and the come awake and come alive it was so weird because, um, you, you know, the, the the nocturnal animals, the nocturnal insects or whatever that were supposed to be out, went out and the birds were just like, well, wait a second, yeah, what's going on here? Go yeah. to sleep yet? You know, what what are we doing here? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, so yeah every, everything's, you know, a little bit out of sync, um, a little bit of that eerie feeling. It reminded me of a, a little bit of something similar towards the apocalypse, which I've never experienced in my life, but I know I'm going to thrive in. Yeah. Yeah, and Jake, not doubt in the Lord at all. I, I, I don't doubt Lord. I am yeah, really saying that we were lucky here because uh, a lot of other believer, people, guy, I'm a believer. The, the clouds did not burn in other places. So, um, yeah, I mean, it worked out well for us. But, um, yeah, well, man. It, it, story it, about, about faith and believing, about believing in the higher power or whatnot in, in yeah. God. Um, I don't have many stories to explain stuff, right? Especially when in terms of, of uh, theology in the study of, of God. But I, I got to tell you guys, like when I was young, I experienced my mother, my mother, I wouldn't call her a, a highly educated woman. She can't speak multiple languages or whatnot, mm, but okay. I saw her speak in tongues. And I don't know if anybody ever has ever experienced speak, you know, someone speaking in tongues or whatever, but it's a little bit weird, uh, especially when you're like 10 and you don't understand, you don't understand what's happening or whatnot. But anyways, my mother was going through something and they were praying for her or whatnot. All of a sudden, she just starts speaking in tongues. That's kind of a little, I mean, I've seen a lot of other things that it just I can't explain. But yeah, when in terms of theology, I use that as an example. And I use the term of bombs coming down and just not blowing up. That could have been a coincidence, you know, that happened to me in war. Like we got hit by a few mortars and they didn't explode. 
that could have been coincidence or also divine intervention. So there are some things that are just unexplainable, my guys. That's it. Thank you for letting well, me share those stories. Well, the good thing is, I mean, it worked out, I mean, for us. And I got to tell you, some of, some of the images that I saw, uh, for one, I mean, you want to talk about getting a hard on about stuff. When I saw the folks at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, when it went dark there, and that place was jam-packed, and they're on the front straightaway, and, and then it just got dark. The Niagara Falls stuff was really cool. I saw some folks uh, post that as well. What so, had the best spot to see it? Like, do you know that? Where you Did you check that out? Do you know which, uh, which spot, which ge geographical location was able to see it the best? I don't, I don't know where that wound up being, you know, because I think the whole totality thing kept changing depending on what was going to happen with weather. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know where it wound up being, but that, that Indianapolis and the Niagara Falls, dude, that, that Niagara Falls, dude, look badass. Did you see any of that? I it's did like, not. So I had a pretty oh. good shot. So one of my friend, one of my friends that actually works with me at EA is, lives in, in Round Rock. And I wasn't, I was not able to capture a really good shot of uh, the eclipse, but he was able to capture a really good shot. And he shared the picture with me and I shared it on Instagram. I'll share it on Twitter again, but it was a really, I mean, it's the darkest I've ever seen the sky with the sun in it. it it's just, it was, it was freakishly crazy and wild, man. And it's, I don't know. It, again, like I joke about it. I say, it, I say it tongue in cheek, but when the apocalypse happens, guys, I hope you're on my side. Cause I'm going to win. I'm not only win, I'm going to thrive. Like you thought Negan was fantastic. Wait till Wagner comes. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. No, I it, it, I am yeah. Wagner. It, yeah. it really was. It really was one of those things to where to where you watch the the fascinating thing that is where we live. I mean, just Earth in general. I mean, just just to see things moving around and to see that actually happen. Because you know, I, I know a lot of people say, "Well, the Earth is actually flat or whatever." Man, whatever. Flat Earthers, Kyrie Irving's. Yeah, flat Earth. Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> Dallas Maverick lovers. It's like you guys believe whatever the hell you want to believe. I don't care. It ain't my place to tell you different. But when you see that kind of shit yesterday, you're just kind of hanging out and boom, it's dark. And and you watch that thing moving and you actually see it. And then you can see like a little bit of a flame right there. It's like, okay, yeah, all of this shit is really that was real. Crazy. That was the flame. It, it, I it, forgot about that. The flame coming off the, the yeah. sun or the, the eclipse yeah. too. That was nuts. It's like, okay, this shit is really real. You know, if you don't believe in, in whatever, you see stuff like yesterday and it's like, holy fuck, what, what is this? I mean, it, it really makes you appreciate the miracle of life and yeah, the miracle um, of earth and the moon and the moon and the sun and all that shit. Makes you want to go out and touch grass. For those of you guys that stay inside all the time and don't get outside mm -hmm. and breathe fresh air and see sunlight and touch grass. Yesterday was a really good example and a really good reason for you to go outside and touch grass. It was pretty fun. Yeah, I, I'll tell you one of the things that I really uh, learned through through the COVID. You know, when we kind of got all all tied in and couldn't do different shit. Um, I, and again, I, I'm a big dude. I mean, I'm six oh, foot. I, remember when we were idiots and put masks all over our face? Remember that? Well, what what I learned during that time is is like you were talking about with grounding. I really got into and and look, I can't do all this fancy yoga and all this crazy shit like uh, flexible people can do, but like going outside and putting your feet flat on the ground and yeah. and putting your hands flat on the ground and doing a downward dog and planting it's called, your, it's called grounding. It's literally called grounding. Absolutely, and it it like does something to your body to where it's like I mean you just feel energized you feel trained well, you're, you're back you're 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 becoming aligned with nature rod exactly exactly and uh so thank you covid it wasn't that big of a deal <laughs> ap ap one when you rely on your immune system it's really not going to be that big of a deal so uh, apd one on the covid text line uh fuck covid and that mask bullshit yeah go. exactly i'm with you hey there you go now we're speaking my you know, you're speaking to the choir here or preaching to the choir whatever those old cements were hey did you watch any basketball last night no was there any on there was a there was a, a a game that was dominated by one team yeah man i'll tell you that i mean we 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 called it let zach edy do what zach edy's gonna do that's all you have fine Let's... go ahead go ahead dominate I'm, I'm not Dom mike shishetsky i'm not bruce pearl I'm I'm not Gary Gary Williams. Um I'm not Bob Knight, you know. Uh, but I am I, I do know some basketball, right? And I do know how to attack an offense or to attack a defense, especially if I've seen them, you know, half a season or half a year. Like I I figure I feel like I've I've figured out Purdue a pretty decent bit. Um when and also when when you're 
number one scorer has 12, 13 points more than the second scorer, right? That's that's not that's not hard math. It's really not. You, you take away the number, you take away the, the offensive threat, you do what Bill Belichick does, you neutralize the, the number one attack um, potential, right? Or the number one attack threat, and then you see what else, you know, people can do. Jones got, I, I thought Jones was probably the guy that could hurt um, the Huskies the most, but he got into foul trouble very early and he couldn't, yep. you know, he wasn't out there in the first half. So that took away some of the shooting power and, and firepower from, uh, from Purdue from the three point line. And not to mention that defense that we talked about from UConn, they were exceptional last night. I mean, you're, you're holding what one of, one of the toughest teams in the nation to 60 points total overall um, at the end of the night, that's, that's not going to get it done, especially with an out an output that, uh, that UConn can get up. Um, and I, I said it yesterday, right? Uh, I said, remember when, you know, a couple of years ago when Hurley lost to Villanova, he came on and he said, you better get us while you, while you can now because we're coming. And it, it, it feels like I'm not, I don't think I, I don't think I pioneer anything, but I feel like whenever I say something, ESPN repeats it, you know, I, I, like I, I don't, and in all last night, you know, I, I saw nothing but montages and snippets like, Hey, get us, get us now because we're coming, get us now because we're coming. Um, yeah, I get the advantage of of speaking early in the morning and, and speaking first, but damn it, it it feels like it feels like ESPN is just jocking my style at times, my guy. It really does. Well, and you know, with with UConn, I mean, four guys in double figures. I'm kidding. I say that tongue in cheek. God, I, oh, I, I wish you would that. smile and laugh at some of my dumb jokes. Oh no, I, I'm sorry. I'm gathering my thoughts. I got I've, you. I've, I got you. I've got a hot spot over here beeping on, on a different computer. I don't know what the hell's going on. It must be all this mess we have going. This is man, that looks shitty out there. Is the eclipse coming again? It's all no, I don't think so. I think it's just the aftermath. Um, it's the fall. Um, but but I'm with you. But I'm with you because a lot of times I have heard some of the some of the takes or bits or whatever you want to call them that we talk about, and then it's like boom, there's they start talking about it, and it's like, come on, man, they're listening. It's, it's, it's very, it's freakishly, it's freakishly coincidental. I know, I, I know, but I mean, this this thing last night, I mean, it, it was a pretty simple game plan that we saw from Dan Hurley and UConn. It's like, look, let 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 the big man do whatever he's going to do, and it's like you you get this thing when it's kind of in garbage time. I mean, they made a li- Purdue made a little bit of a run right there, but you know when when he's in there in the paint and, and he'll get in there or uh, Edie would get in there and get a jam or whatever. It's like, oh, you know, they're like oh, jams it in. I'm like. They're not even trying to stop him because yeah, that's not, like when you're when you, when they can't hit from the three point line, you're trading yeah. twos for threes. That's yeah. that you know at the end of the yeah. day, that's not going to end up in Dude, your favor either. Absolutely, and and then when you look at UConn, I mean, you got four dudes in double figures, and and this really was where you it's know like, that, when that, UConn was running set pieces, Rodney, right? they were running I offense know. last night, what and it's Purdue, like Purdue was just dribbling the fucking ball around. And it's like at one point Castle has the hot hand. Uh, then here's Newton. Newton, 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 right? Newton was sensational. Newton, you know, player, um, offensive player of the tournament or whatnot. Uh, got or excuse me, most outstanding player, right? Yeah. And then also he was most outstanding player, you know, last year as well. We, we, we talked about it when one person when when you're trying to contain the other person, you know, they just rotate the ball over and find a way to fill the bucket up you know another way man they just they just got weapons last night and how about the dude from how about the dude from boys latin boys mm-hmm. latin the lacrosse school in maryland boys latin uh the the boys latin school is what it's actually called it's a private school in baltimore maryland davidson maryland if you really want to call it that um but yeah it's it's us- usually known for its um it's lacrosse players, but they produced one hell of a basketball player last night. Spencer, I mean, he was all over the place. Not just, you know, controlling the floor as a floor general um, and, and setting the pace as the point guard there, but also, I mean, on defense, just taking away the perimeter play for, for Purdue and just being a pest, being the being that gnat at the picnic yeah. that's just constantly in your face, man. Um, yeah, just uh, in, in all an all around dominant performance by the UConn Huskies. Uh, back-to-back champions now. Um, damn. I mean, six. I mean, I mean I, I saw, I've, I've seen like the two early predictions right now, and they got Duke. Uh, Duke's obviously getting Cooper Flag, you know, one of the, the best highly talented uh recruits in all of you know, all of college or all of high school basketball right now. Um, he's going to, to the University of Duke, so they're projected number one going into next year. But hell, man, I think after I think after the domination you saw last night. 
And remember, UConn had a lot of turnover this year too, right? They 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 dealt yeah. with turnover and they got back to where they needed to be. It's probably way too early to sit here and say that they can maybe go back to back to back, but I mean, hell, Dan Hurley's got something cooking right now, and I don't. Think I, I, I don't think it. it's too early to say that. I mean, you look at right there. I mean, what they have. I mean, they've got great culture, like you're talking about the turnaround. What they did right there. You had what at least three guys that 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 were gone, and then you had to replace them. And and what you're watching with these guys, and 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 that was kind of my two big points that I wanted to bring to you. And you hit the first one right there where you talk about the turnover and, and look at the, look at the run that they just went on. But number two, I mean, the, the other part of this is, I mean, these guys at the end of the game, and I heard this mentioned a couple of different times by some of the analysts that we're talking about. It's like, okay, in this game, who's the MVP? There are too many to choose from, from UConn because they are so, I mean, they, Again, Wags. We, I think they, I think they got it right. I think Newton Newton was yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Night. It's it's vanilla. It's generic. They're too good. They are just too good. And and with this matchup last last night, like we said, I mean, uh, Purdue had one thing: let Edie get in there, run, and and go score. Right. And it, that was it's it. like that it's like was it. To methodically pick you apart. It's like all right, I want to attack this portion yep. of. I want I want to attack the low yep. block right now. All right, now I want to attack the elbow. Okay, now I want to attack the baseline right here it's it's like whatever whatever dan hurley visualized on the floor now and and you know dan hurley's probably got a a mixed batch of of people that admire him and people that hate him i'm sure he's very brash he's got that yukon he's got that he's got that yukon pretentious vibe does he not like either you're really on board with dan hurley or you or you, you're not a fan of him at all. And, I mean, some people might think he's a little hands. Hell, uh, him, you know, coming on the floor yesterday, or last night in the National oh, yeah, grab the player. Moving yeah. the center in the yeah. position or, 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 you know, trying to tell him to go, right? Like, that's – coach, you got to back off a little bit there, man. You're a little bit hands-on. Yeah. Um, I've also seen people, you know, that if you – know, uh, national pundits, you know, sitting there saying, like, hey, if you are Kentucky uh, with, 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 uh, with Cal out, um, if Cal's moving right, I think you throw whatever you can at Dan Hurley to try and get Dan Hurley to come to Kentucky. But it, guys, it's it's not happening. I, I, he I built not. himself a monster. I, I am not leaving. I am not leaving that fucking place. And I mean, it, it's not going to get. Uh, I mean, it's not going to get. Uh, I mean, they're not going to lose anything. I mean, that's where you talk about. I know we're in the time of the transfer portal and the NIL and or NIL and all these different things. But look, if you're a basketball player and you're one of the elite basketball players in the country, you want to go play for Dan Hurley and UConn because I, mean, I would think championships. so. And and it's, and it's and it's like been kind of quiet, right? Uh, I mean, it's like I mean when when you think. And, and oh, by the way, the women have been pretty fucking good too. Oh yeah, yeah. So, they're, usually, so, they're usually really good. But six, I mean, yeah. and I, I didn't know this stat until I heard it last night on on air, man. Six and zero. UConn is six and zero in national championship six games. Six and zero since, six and since and the nineties, since nineteen ninety nine. Six six and zero. Oh. And and look, we have talked all season long about through this college basketball season. I mean, we talked about the Big Twelve, how competitive the Big Twelve was, and just everything there. Well, a Big Twelve. Uh, it it is Big Twelve. The Big Twelve is, is the is. strongest conference. It is. D- didn't play in a championship, but look at the run that UConn just went on, dude. They if, blew everybody out. If Shed and you know, again, you guys know how I felt about Houston, right? Um, I thought Houston was the best team in the nation. If Shed, if Shed is not my man, Shed is not least. Hurt, yep. If Shed is not hurt, is this for is this for like could Houston actually put up a fight against UConn? They did, no. they won they won every game by thirteen points, Rodney. Every game by thirteen points at least. You you know what UConn would have done? They'd have done the same shit they did last night. Let Shed have his. We'll lock everything else down. But Put see, it other on people can score than just Shed. Other people like well, um, Clark can score. Or, well, against or other teams. Uh, against other teams. I don't know about yeah. against UConn. You're right, <laughs> so you're right. that's, that, dude, that's a that's a great that's a good point, man. Yeah, it, it's like man to to sit here and watch them. And you know the thing is, it's um, I don't think that we saw the I don't think we saw the second best team in the nation last night. No, no I don't think Purdue's the second no, best team in the nation. No, absolutely. You not. can't tell me that the best team is 15 points better than the second best team. And you know what? <laughs> UConn plays Purdue. Uh, 10 more times, UConn wins 10 more times. I'm convinced. 10 more times, yeah. I had them playing Creighton. Uh, I mean, uh, it didn't Creighton beat UConn at one point during the season? Uh, and I'm, I sure, think, like, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure during the regular season, Dan Hurley is going to rest starters or he's not yeah, going to be. Course. 
of course, you know, in, in tournament mode, so but, to speak. But but this is where uh, you know you go back and you watch this, and, and there's not really anything that, but unless unless that you love basketball and you love fundamental basketball, you love rotations, you love personnel changes, you love all of that, man then you love what UConn is doing. I mean, if you're all about the flash and all this shit, you're probably like, hey, UConn's kind of boring. Well, fuck. Call me boring. Call me boring. It ain't boring to watch 80 points a night. It ain't boring to watch 80 points a night, man. You damn right, man. That was, and, he, was, and like I said, man, they got five players. They got five hoopers on the, on the court that can score in double digits, that do score in double digits. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, I, think yeah, I don't I don't know how much boredom you're gonna get watching UConn because usually you're gonna be pretty impressed because they can score on each you know everywhere on the floor they gotta they gotta play for it it just seems like that man the absolute domination on defense absolute domination on offense as well you try and speed them up and they 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 don't let you they play to their pace they control the action they control flow man and when you control flow you got the game well look 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 on the women's side. South Carolina, what do they do? They're fundamentally sound. They control the game. They control the flow. Look what UConn does. I, I mean, look, look, look at the UConn, South Carolina. I mean, hell, I thought UConn put up a damn good – UConn women's uh, – UConn Lady Huskies, I thought they put up a damn good fight against, you know, Iowa and, and whatnot. Personally, I think Alabama played UConn better. Well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that I'm saying anything that you need uh, these glasses to – that you can't see it. I think Alabama played UConn better than fucking Purdue did. Uh, I mean, Alabama, it seemed like, you know, you pull within seven or eight or whatever, you might be able to make a run right there and do something. But then, but, or Alabama but, played UConn better than Purdue. Yeah, yeah Alabama. Would, yeah. Uh, yeah. But UConn, they're just not, they're unfazed, dude. And, and with Hurley, good, yeah. And Hurley ain't going pretty nowhere. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, not, I mean, anywhere. we were, we were saying that tongue in cheek. Like, I know better. Like, after what you've just built, after, after where you've gotten UConn back to, um, you ain't going anywhere. Hell, how much you think that check Hurley's going to get next time? How much? How much, you know damn well they're going to extend this dude. He's in rare company right now, man. Back to back champions. Yeah, yeah. He ain't that going that no. I mean that, that hell no way that, that hadn't happened in a long time. That had to happen in forever. And, and I mean he's put himself. You kind of put themselves up there with the elite, with the elite. Oh, one hundred. When it comes, you're talking. I'm talking dynasty right here, dude. I mean this is well, yeah. It's back to back champions, Rodney. Right? Um. What uh? What was your biggest surprise and takeaway from last night? Um, I, nothing. I, I mean, everything. Everything kind of went to script, just like I thought it was going to happen. Okay. Um, I, I thought that you know, again, give Edie what he's going to have. Uh, you lock everything else down, and then you just play sound basketball, and you methodically work, and then you just kind of, you kind of just drive that dagger into him. I mean, that that's exactly what I thought was going to happen. Um, there were a couple of times there where Purdue made made some runs, but but I mean, I knew, like I was talking about, you you just look at Hurley and you look at UConn, dude, and they are just not phased, man. It's like it's like a prize fighter or or, or somebody where you're in the face of adversity, and it's like okay, well, here we go. I mean, I hate to say it with UConn, you know, when you used to talk about the Showtime Lakers and all this, where they would hit the switch and the Bulls, where they would hit the switch. These guys just kind of dim this. They have a dimmer switch. They might dim it just a little bit. And then when things get a little bit tight, it's like, boom, ramp it up and go. Exactly what I thought was going to happen last night. They're, I thought I thought this good. was going to be, I thought this was going to be a 13 to seven, 17 point win for UConn. It's pretty damn close. Pretty damn close. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I wasn't I wasn't embellishing yesterday on the show. Like when I thought it was going to be, they beaten everybody by double digits. I thought for sure they'd be able to beat Purdue by double digits. Either it's not Zach Eady does not scare me. Did you see him last night? Did you see him missing bunnies last night? Yeah. Like I mean, hook shots from five. And again, the the hook shot is not the easiest shot to hit. But when you're sure. you're practicing it over and over and over again, when you're you know damn near you know a foot over your opposition you feel like you would have a chance to to see the rim a little bit better than others right but he still struggles at, at missing little bunnies and you know five to ten feet you know jumpers so do i you know what i mean but i'm not projected to go to the nba so anyways yeah. no i think that mean, at may my guy again I, you know I'm, I'm very harsh I'm, I'm very um i'm very tough on zach e and rightfully so right because when you're the biggest player in college basketball you're supposed to be dominant all right um mm -hmm. I'm I'm not saying that you're bad. I'm just saying that you're not the you're not the greatest talent that that Jay Wright is making you out to be. And if Jay Wright loved you so much, where was Jay Wright's you know 
fluff for you last night, you know, for lack yeah. of better terminology. You didn't have, I mean, you looked fantastic, almost went for 40. I mean, and he did, he had an exceptional game, dude. He did everything he could yeah. to keep Purdue in the game. Yeah. That's the problem. Like, everybody knows without Zach Eady, Purdue is just nothing. When you were, and, and I'll go back to this stat, man, 25 points per night, your next best score is, is Braden Smith, and he's at yeah. 12. With 12, yeah. And he you know, couldn't you, get a shot off last yeah. night. So. You, you, you get a double-double. You get a double-double, and that's great. I mean, uh, the, but but he scores 37. The team scores 60. And that tells you exactly what all you need to know. That's yeah, that's all. And and the fact that you know, and the fact that if ZD if ED wasn't pulling down a rebound, the other rebounds were going to UConn. Absolutely, you know, it wasn't there. Dominate. There wasn't there wasn't much offensive uh, rebounding for Purdue last night, and there wasn't much uh, re- glass support for Purdue last night. I thought UConn was was absolutely dominant yeah, on all facets of the game. From the tip, it's one of those where you look at seventy five to sixty, and it's like I didn't think it was that close. You know, I mean, and I don't know, but th- that's where now that we, you know, put put the cap on on college basketball season. I mean, you had two dominating performances on the men and women's side and you've got I mean, I saw the the way too early top 25 that comes out on the women's side. Obviously, South Carolina right there on the top with Don Staley, yeah, you know, going yeah, for yeah. another championship. Texas you'd number think, two. You'd like to think that UConn's kind of breathing down their necks, too, right? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think UConn's like number three or four. Texas is sitting there number right. two. We talked about that yesterday to to where that that's something that's going to make it even more intriguing for us. But uh, yeah, I wonder what Ellen has I mean, got to reload because Reese is leaving, and then um, mm-hmm. uh, Van Lith or whatever she's entering the transfer portal again. So um, yeah, that's got to tell you. I mean, you know, I'm we sent here. We had a conversation about Kim Mulkey the other week. That's you know, if you got other players that are leaving after. I guess just getting there um, or maybe, you know, Haley Van Lift just made a bad decision to come to LSU in the first place. She, she looked a little bit out of a place yeah. uh, playing there this year for, uh, for LSU anyway. So yeah. I mean, where was she at last? Uh, Louisville, right? She was at Louisville before yeah. she came to yep. LSU. Yep. I believe that's where that was. I believe that's where that was. Hey man, if, uh, um, I know we're not going to get into clips every day. So you're be out there to, to play pickleball. So pickleballers, listen up. <clears throat> if you're ready to gear up, uh, with the gear that's designed right here in Austin, Texas, look no further than Pick Sports Gear, right? Their equipment is crafted with precision and passion right here in the heart of the city, known for its love and sports and innovation. From the top of the line paddles with premium accessories, they have everything you need to dominate the court with style. Plus, keep your eye out for demo days happening right here in Austin. It's your chance to try out the latest gear firsthand and score exclusive deals. Check out the website for locations and details. Gear up with Pick Sports Gear and get ready because they're their clothing line drops this summer right show off your austin made excellence on the pickleball court now go play with some picks all right learn more at www.picksportsgear.com that's picksportsgear.com p-i-x sportsgear.com hey and uh quickly over to the uh code of text line uh, it looks like we have the uh 50 uh cobble bobs uh gift card winner oh they, D- they chime in they're here yeah, DV Pegram. I hope I'm saying that right. Are you fucking uh, right. me? Is that your real name? What'd you just oh, call me? Mind. Yeah, DV uh, P- P-E-G-R-A-M. Pegram. Pegram or, or Pegram. So well, you better uh, stop, stop Round Rock Resident. That. Right there, the winner. One more time. What is it? Oh, muted there. Uh, DV Pegram. DV Pegram. The winner of the Cabo Bob's. Uh, yeah, or Pegram. Is that a- one of the two. I'm sure All they'll right. tell me. Okay, I'm sure they'll tell. Uh, and then the the TV winner, the winner of the TV, uh, Leticia. Uh, so check out this message for for the uh, for the program director and uh, chairman of the board right here with uh, Texas Sports Unfiltered. If this is the real BK, if it's Brad, I want you to know that you have done uh, what you have done with TSU is amazing. Love your drive and resourcefulness. You are my son's age, and your personality would fit right in with him and his buddies. So there you go. Hey. Businessman and a cool dude at the same time. Our you know man, what? Brad. Kelly. My father loves BK more than he loves me, too. That's something else. You know what I mean? That's, you know, Tracy and I were laughing when we went to uh, when we were at the Sugar Bowl because we were sitting with with BK and we're walking up there and, and I lean over to Tracy and I'm like, people probably think this is uh, our son. It's like uh, here we he are with our like kid. You. Not all Rodney. Contrary <laughs> to your belief, like Tracy, Tracy, contrary to your belief, not all white people look like Rodney. 
no, 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 that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, um, no, no, we we all don't look alike. Okay, I like I, I know that you know you throw us all in in the whole you know white supremacy deal or whatnot, but none of us all, not all of us are white supremacy. Okay. Well, it's like it's like when I meet people and they're like, "What's your name?" and I'm like, "Rodney Rodriguez," and they're like, "Rodriguez." I know a Rodriguez. I'm like, just one? Where the fuck have you been? We're everywhere. <laughs> we are absolutely everywhere. I had one guy one time, he's like, is that anything like Gonzalez? I said, that sure. sure. Yeah, it's our cousin. <laughs> yeah. Gonzalez we, is my cousin, you know? We both like tacos, yeah. uh, all of us. Burritos, <laughs> baby, burritos. <sighs> On that note, how about a word from our great friends at Covert PK? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Great family since 1909. The Covert family, uh, man, serving generations of Central Texans and beyond. Nobody beats Covert deal, not now, and sure as hell, not ever. Great folks right there. Hey, um, like I, I know we we say a lot of things tongue in cheek, and you know there there is actual news that's out there in the world. Um, we'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up because it actually is. It's got it's got some scary vibes to it. So I don't. Do you watch soccer at all? I only when I have to. No, only when you have to. No, no, not not a lot. Not a lot. Not all right. Lot. Um. So are you are you familiar with like Champions League and UEFA Champions League? I am. I know okay. exactly what that is. I know. Okay. Exactly so what that is. the European football's governing body, uh, UEFA, right? Um. They there has been threats over the past week. Um you know, from ISIS, there's been, you know, the ISIS oh, terror shit. threats, the, the terrorist activist organized or activist terrorist organization, uh, ISIS has made threats. Um, and sure enough, um, UEFA has, you know, made a statement that they're going to go forth and play their games, uh, this week with, uh, champions league. You have Arsenal scheduled to play Bayern Munich, um, over there in Germany. So, um, Things could get a little bit wishy or wishy-washy, especially after, you know, some threats made from ISIS there. So just make sure you guys are keeping your eyes out and uh, looking. And, you know, I mean, not that we can stop anything, but just be careful, guys. There's, it's just a, a nasty vibe out there at times, man. And when you see the bad shit and the bad people in the in the world start to rise up, man, um, it just it, it gets me. It gets me back thinking to myself about 20 years ago, man. Damn, I wish I was. I wish I had my athleticism to go back out there and be, you know, John Rambo and stop the world with just one, one damn rifle in myself, man. Because I feel like I could do it, but nah, dude. I see these stories, Rodney, and it pisses me off, man. Because, yeah. um, it's it's one reason why I like, and this is gonna sound really corny, right? But it's one reason why I like the Olympics so much. Um, I believe in ideology, right? And I subscribe to the ideology that, especially. When you're honoring the games, um, and the games are supposed to, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a traditionalist at this point, you know, for, uh, for this stature, right, for this incidence. Um, when you're honoring the games, you're supposed to take, you know, two, two weeks or whatever it is that the games are going on and have peace. No fighting in the world. Just try and have peace, man. Um, and from a guy that has, and I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that are in my shoes that has, you know, supported the, the, the military and supported our country. Um, but for people that have just fault and, and kind of gone through the ringer or whatnot man peace is just all you want anymore like i don't want to fight i don't want to have to pick up a rifle anymore i don't want to do that anymore like i'm done I've, I've fought my fight you know what i mean i did it for 11 years i'm done um and then when i see when i see stories like this when i see you know isis making threats and trying to hurt you know innocent people while people are just trying to play you know sports or whatnot it, it sucks or just trying to go to to events or trying to go to venues to see sports uh footballers play or whatnot just to try and escape you know the, the rigors of of the actual real world and shit and trying to find their sanctuary from that real world from the vigors of the real world right and then you have terrorist groups that go in and try and destroy um you know wonderful peace it, it just it really chaps my ass and it makes me want to get back out there and Jump back into the game, Rodney, and that's the wrong game we're talking about, my guy. But yeah, sorry, I just wanted to bring this up. It was a a little bit of a headline that happened on on um, 
ESPN. And of course, I'm into soccer. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Thank you for entertaining me, Rodney, and allowing me to talk about this on your birthday. Felice, is it Felice Navidad? Is that what we're saying today for your birthday? Dude, that's Christmas. I'm, that's ch- Christmas. I'm kidding, man. Oh, okay. it's, it's, well, I don't know. It, so it, it's I, like Complianos. Um, you you can call me Christ. I, I, I'll be good with that. You know, I've been I've been. Can I call Lord. you God? Am I going to call you God? What? How do you? How do I say? Come on, you Say happy birthday in Espanol. Feliz cumpleaños. Feliz cumpleaños. It's not Feliz Navidad. I, th- I said cumpleaños. You didn't say anything. Oh, sorry. You don't sorry. see. You don't listen to me. I'm reading the code of text line. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you said Navidad. No, I didn't. I said Navidad first, and then I said Complianos. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, uh, Code of Text Line is really blowing up on, chat, on your I know comment. chat heard me say Complianos. Okay, so that's good. That That's good for me. Um, look, man, ca- kind of... You know what, I listen what? to you every... I listen to every word you say. I hang on every every one of your words. Do what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so Wags, kind of kind of what, what you're talking about right there is... Um, I think this is where yesterday was so cool in a lot of ways but like what you're talking about right there that this this is a very ugly scary world right now i tell you i i fear i mean not fear but every every night with my kids my daughters that are out living in the real world it's like oh my god i'm so fearful and worried about these two going into this world and i think that's why yesterday for a little bit of time for a little bit of time we got to cherish that you know the, the amazing sanctuary peace man peace the amazing things. It's like everything stopped. It's like we are a married couple, double D. We are a married couple, by the way. We are. We you, you damn right we are. Uh, the world stopped. The not the world didn't stop, but all the bad stopped for fuck four minutes or whatever it was. Just watching the amazing um, place that we live, and that's where I always go back to. And it's like you know when we have nine eleven, and, and I know that that obviously that day is a horrible day. But I've always said so many times, Wags, with all all the bad in the world, it's like. To me, 9-12-01 was a day that we were all, we all fucking loved each other, right? And I mean, I know you're stuff abroad and everything, but it's like, it seemed like that day, even though the the worst that we had ever seen happened the day before, we were all like, and and I go back, the simplest advice that I can tell people, it's like, look, you ain't got to like each other, but it's all right to love each other. You You ain't got to get along. You just got to be able to breathe each other. Love thy neighbor. Yep. That's what I'm talking about. So, look, um, you know, I mean, it, other it, people, you know, other, other people would say that you know, one of the worst tragedies of 9/11 was the fact that we forgot about 9/11 too. So, um, we yep. said that and said that yep. we'd never forget, and then within yep. a year, we were at each other's yep. throats already. So, yep. same shit, same shit, all over yep. again. Yeah, man. And, and it's uh, learn, I, live, love, forget. You know, all them happy cliche bullshit that we say. Hey, what else is going on in the world of sports, by the way? Ah. Uh, what else you're really got? not uh, listening Dallas to me Cowboys, are you on Rome? delay or am i on delay what's going on um no no I, i'm listening to you okay. um and, and man, but now basketball's done i mean it's like everything has been centered around college basketball so no, that's well, all i done. mean we got baseball to talk about ronnie we got the rangers and astros last night the astros i have figured out how the houston astros can win games i don't watch them it was like i looked yesterday and and the astros got in big time trouble and they found a way to win again so it's like, okay, I figured it out. I'm not going to watch Space City TV. I'm just going to watch from afar. I'll do game recaps coming up uh, every uh, every morning, and then recaps. we can talk about it. Game recap. You like that? Go to the box score. Go read the twib notes, as they said. You remember that, the, this week in baseball? They're remember called that cliff notes. Oh, no, you're They're too young. Cliff notes. Well, that, yeah, that's that's good stuff, too. Yeah, Astros uh, hitting machine yesterday, man. Uh, and to salvage a 2-2 split right there, uh, that's pretty impressive because the way all of that started out, it looked like it was going to be uh, something pretty bad. I told you I felt like the Astros could get to Haney last night, didn't I? Or yesterday, didn't I? Yeah, you did. You did. You called it. You called I, it. I mean, sometimes I, I just get lucky, especially like in baseball. You, you honestly, like, you have all the stats. Baseball is great for giving you all the stats that you need to make your picks and to make, you know, kind of help get the green in your pocket. Like I would sit there mm-hmm. and say that, that baseball arms you the most with the stats that you need, but still you got to get, there's, there's a sliver of luck that it all has to come together in the stars align. Right. It, yeah. it just felt, it felt like the lumber was going to wake up and it felt like Houston had, had a number for Haney. I don't know. I, I don't know why I had that arbitrary feeling in my gut. I just, 
or a contrarian feeling in my gut, I just went with it, man. I went with it um, yeah. and scored a nice little, nice, you know, 130, nice little 130 on the night, but I put that on a parlay. So, anyways, yeah. man. Yeah. Not bad on a Monday. Uh, I'll tell you one topic that hey, I'd I love your angels over the Rays. Can you believe that? <laughs> I'd love your thoughts on this because one of the things that keeps coming up and I keep reading different uh, variations and different thoughts on this uh, with the pitchers getting hurt. And this is a code of text line. That's why I go there because that's where it, where it comes up here today. Could all these pitchers stop getting hurt? Greg Maddox needs to teach a master class on picking spots and not just throwing as hard as possible. And I saw that um, a lot of that, uh, some folks were kind of pointing towards the pitch clock, which that's a pretty lame way to go at that because that, that shit didn't happen last year. But, I mean, I think a lot of it is exactly what's being said right here where pitchers are going for velocity and for speed and all of that. And to me, that's that's what's hurting the pitchers. I don't, so wait, I don't so think are, are, are people actually trying to say that the pitch clock is the reason why it's why it's, pitchers are thrown out there? That has been nothing to do with how, as, much, as the, how much velocity they're throwing. It's, 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 it's speeding up their delivery. It's speeding up how many times they throw the ball, right? Like, you're mm-hmm. going to throw the ball regardless as many times as – as you would regard uh, the same amount of time that you're out there. It's just now your whole mantra is being sped up. Your process is being sped up. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the outcome of how many times you do it. It just changes the speed of how you do it. Yeah. Um, and, and a right? lot of that I mean, was, I, I did, I I'm getting that correct. Right. Like I'm not yeah, overthinking yeah. that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I, I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're throwing at max velocity or trying to at times, and then you're doing it faster. So, right. so that, that's kind of the argument right there, but then MLB releases a statement. I think it was Monday that said, or maybe Monday or Sunday that that's, uh, they're saying, no, it's not the pitch clock. The, we don't feel that the pitch clock. I don't is believe that. it's the pitch clock either. I don't think, it's the pitch I, I don't clock think either. it is. And then G- Garrett Cole, who's on the shelf, uh, refutes that uh, statement a little bit. Uh, and I quote, when I read the response from MLB, I didn't think it was very thorough uh, to be able to say you implement something in one year. It has no effect is short sighted is what he says. But um, <laughs> Garrett Cole just wants to, to take his time on the mound. Yes. Yeah. And, and as, and as Ike says right here, um, the, the MLBPA they're they're blaming the pitch clock. And I mean, maybe, well, ML, MLBPA it, it, does not want the pitch clock in the game. That's that's what I'm taking out of this. Yeah, yeah, and because you're exactly right. I mean, I don't care if it's Garrett Cole or who it is. They they want to sit up there, scratch their nuts, and sit yeah. over there and put to do whatever. They want to wear the batter down men- mentally. They want to make sure that they're in the batter's head and do whatever they can to, you know, to to get him out of his vibe. You know what I mean? You know, out of mm-hmm. that flow, and then get him off pace or whatnot and then throw the ball. Yeah. That's yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I think it's kind of, man, I was always in your ear, dude. I was always trying to get the best of you. It, and, and I think it's kind of ironic now, you know, they've limited even more, you know, mound visits and stepping off the rubber and all that. And now boom, here we are. The pitch clock is a problem where last year it, it doesn't, didn't quite seem to be that, but I, I think the bottom line, the, the pitch clock has just been amazing. I think from a well, fan I'm a fan of it uh, again. Oh, now what? you're also, you're talking to a guy that I, I, I don't, I don't believe I'm a biggest purist is BK. The biggest purist is BK or as big as a purist is BK. Um, but I do, I do like tradition in baseball, right? Uh, I don't like the ghost runner. I've, again, I, I know it speeds the game up, and I'm a fan of extra innings, right? Um, but also, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of some of the other rules that have happened. Like, I, I, I feel like you should keep the shift in the game, uh, but I do like the pitch count. I like, you talk about, you Absolutely. know, expediting, you know, play or whatnot and, and picking up the pace of play. Pitch clock is one thing that you can do that. Um, you, you don't have to add manufactured runs or try and get manufactured runs on there by adding a ghost runner on base. You're just speeding up the pace of play a little bit. You're not giving anybody an extra advantage. Um, you're, you're only speeding up pace of play. Uh, so therefore I do like the pitch clock. Yeah, I I agree. And, and, and in that discussion, you know, Garrett Cole is like, Okay, I'm not the biggest fan of what they're saying that the pitch clock isn't the factor, but at the same time, I don't think that the pitch clock is really my problem. It's some other variables right, that have caused right. a problem. So I'm but like, I'll, okay, like I also agree with Gary Cole. Like, if you implement something and you're seeing a little bit of, you know, uh, an up an upcrease or a spike in um, in entries or whatnot, then yeah, it, it's kind of bullshit to sit there and say, well, it's probably not just the clock. All right, you can't rule everything out, but you got to 
you know what I mean? Like you can't exclude everything just because uh, you don't want it to happen, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and great point here from Rob. I mean, the, the main thing with the ghost runner. Yeah. I mean, for, fuck that. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's what, like when we talk about what, overtime what and Rob football. What do you say? What do you say? I didn't say what? Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Boom. I love the pitch right clock and I'm enjoying band shift. Ghost runner is dumb. You know, I'm one, I'm with you 100%. It sounds like Rob and I eat at the same dinner all the time or eat at the same place. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally like everything that he's saying right there, but, uh, you know, it's, it's where we go back to, to the, to the football overtime rules. What's the best way for the overtime rules? Um, you know, what, what's the best way to do that? I mean, how should it be sudden death? Should you start on the 25? Death I think, I think sudden death is best for overtime in NFL. Okay. Like I know a lot of people would sit there and, and want both teams to get the ball. Um, but I, you know, I think one, uh, it, it's an extension of the game. It's, it's it's an extension of regulation. It's not an extra quarter. Mm -hmm. It's an extension of regulation. That's why I, I love sudden death. Now, I'm, I'm probably on the minority of that, I'm sure, and I'll I'll take getting dragged under, you know, from you guys. But again, sudden death is just the best way to go. Yeah, and and it's like you know the year that Buffalo didn't get the opportunity to to you know when Kansas City beat them in overtime. It's like okay, be pissed off at your defense. I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. Stop them. Stop them. I mean, that that's See, I, I love sudden death. I like the pitch clock. I feel like I feel like the shift should be left in the game. If you're a professional hitter, you should be able to hit around the shift or bunt and get on base. That's just how mm -hmm. I feel about the shift, right? Um uh and one, it's it's all on the field, it's happening on the field. You're not you're not putting an extra player on the field, you're just moving your 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 positions around to yeah. the statistics that where the batter hits. That is absolutely in fair play of the game. I don't know why that was, uh, you know, out, ruled out. But again, I, I think it should not be a restriction. It should still be in the game. But uh, people, that's what I love about America, man. We're going to argue. We're going to have different, you know, opinions on this. I'm all for I'm all for the pitch clock. I hate the ghost runner. And I like, you know, the shifts. So we're all yeah. going to have different takes on this, guys. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, just don't come blow up my house because I like uh, the pitch clock. That's all that I ask. And, and I mean, here here's a great point right here from Longhorn Bear. I mean, it's like baseball with this, and and it's two totally different situations right here because football. I mean, you can't erase injuries in football. Football is a violent game. No, I, mean, I, I don't care yeah. how you look at yeah, it. LB's right on even, point. Even even right. with yeah, the, changing the kickoff and all that. Still, you're sitting there knocking the shit out of each other where, where somebody's getting a running start at you and all you can do is sit there and, and maybe make a lunge at them. It's it's inevitable. I love like, the new implemented rules I, for kickoff. I it love keeps, that. It, it keeps uh, special teams viable yeah. to or, or um, relevant to the, to the actual NFL, right? It, it allows special teams players to find their way to stay on the football team um, mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. hell, that, you know, sometimes that's the only way that, that – some players can get on a team is just through special teams and um, through kickoff and kickoff return and, and uh, you know, field goal and punt or whatnot. Um, yeah. I'm all, I'm all for that, but I'm also all for making the game a little bit safer, right? Like to me, yeah, as a, as a wedge, as a wedge buster, there was nothing better than running down there and, you know, knocking three dudes out, but I, I, I'd sit here and be an idiot to, or a liar. If I said, I didn't feel the aftermath of that, you know what I mean? <laughs> like yeah. there's, there's one time where I walked into the, to the wrong huddle you know what i mean like and and i had actually had the referee it might have been a uh, state playoff game or not a playoff but like the the playoffs for for maryland football too it might have been that where I, I just actually walked into the wrong huddle and the ref actually said hey man you're you gotta he didn't and he didn't even pull me out of the game he just put me back on my other side like that's yeah. the thing too. like he knew i was messed up if you if you're pulling me out of the wrong huddle you at least tell me to get off the damn field, man. Don't put me in my huddle. But yeah, hey, dude, I played the next damn play. Yeah, and, and there's going to be things that happen. I mean, there's going to be things that happen. There's no doubt about that. I, I mean, look, here's the bottom line. I mean, go, go back and look at the Aaron Rodgers injury. I mean, that that didn't look violent. I what, mean, four it's plays just into it. Yeah, yeah. He didn't even get uh, touched, right? Yeah, that didn't even get touched. I mean, he made a move and blew his Achilles. I I could walk down the stairs at the end of this show and blow my Achilles out. I feel like uh, my I mean, Achilles blows out every time I walk up the damn stairs, Rod. I tell you, I feel man, like I blow my, my Achilles out, man. My knees, man, they they pop, and it's like somebody making some Jiffy Pop popcorn around here or something. It's like pop, pop, pop. 
pop, pop. I'm hey, let me old. tell you what's better than Jiffy Pop popcorn. It's all the visual consultations. 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. If you want to watch the national championship, well, you're a little bit too late now, but we'll have baseball national championships coming up. Swimming and diving. You can watch some swimming and diving too, man. Also, we got Major League Baseball they were just alluding to and NFL. NBA is just right around the corner, so we got to get primed and ready for the NBA championships as well. All that is done with audiovisual consultations. And, of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you about the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs that's about to be primed up and, and ready to go. you got to get it done with uh, audiovisual consultations. 512-255-8678. That's adconsultations.com. Over the past 35 years, have been setting the standard in audiovisual automation. Um, you, you just got to go and look at the website. It's pretty easy, man. If you don't have an idea of what you want in your house, check out the gallery of projects that they've done, that they've done over the past 35 years, and I guarantee that you will get an idea. 512 That's adconsultations.com. You know, Tom Tom could use that phrase, uh, dream it, and we will come. Not they, we will come. What? You dream, you dream up uh, something that you want uh, in your in your man cave or whatever. Dream it up. Audio visual, uh, audio visual consultations will come, and they will put it up for you. My mind was in the wrong spot. My bad, my guy. That was we, yeah, way out there. About things. Um, I'll way tell you what, there. guys. We've been telling you about the autograph app here uh, for the last few weeks. Well, it's, it's continuing to get. Cooter, you don't like the pitch clock either? Cooter's not a fan of the pitch clock. All right. Okay. I love the See, pitch I would, clock. See, I would sit there and think that Cooter would be a fan of the pitch clock. If you want to get it rewarded. Does, it does speed the game up a little bit. I like, again, get... I like the pitch clock. I like the shift. I hate the ghost runner. Um, yeah, the ghost runner's stupid. Ghost runner absolutely sucks. That, that, I, know, I know, but I know a lot of people that love it, so. Uh, whatever. Um, if you want to get rewarded uh, for listening to Texas Sports Unfiltered, our friends at Autograph, co-founded by the Congressman Tom Brady, they are really redefining that fan experience for you guys, letting you earn points for your act of fandom, which are super simple, like listening and watching us right here all day on Texas Sports Unfiltered. That Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content in one place and offers you uh, exclusive merchandise and more like tickets coming up later on this week. You heard us uh, talking about it yesterday. There's going to be an opportunity there for you to get an $8 pair of Texas-Michigan football tickets. Let me tell you something. That's an act of fandom right there. That's how you earn points and get rewarded for it. It is the Autograph app. You can head over to the App Store, search Autograph, like we say. <laughs> Autograph. Download that bad boy on uh, in the iTunes Store, on Google Play, wherever it is. Hey, look. In the YouTube description right here, there's a link right to it. Use the referral code TSU, like Texas Sports Unfiltered, because that's uh, that helps us help you. So autograph, <laughs> the link can be found down there. Sign up and win and be rewarded for acts of fandom. It is the autograph app, co-founded by the Congressman Tom Brady. Thomas. Where do you see Zach Eady in the NBA? Um... Do you think that he – well, I guess that's an unfair question. Do you think he'll have a decent career in the NBA? I I, I think he's going to be one of those guys where – Does his game translate or is he too slow? I, I find him slow. I've, I've said very, all year that he's boring. He's, very he's boring. To but you, you'd like to think that his footwork will get better as he – as yeah. all he has to do is work on footwork as a pro, right? Yeah, yeah, and I th and I think he needs to bulk up a little bit. I mean, if he's gonna if he's gonna be in the paint and he's gonna be one of these guys that's battling with these NBA again, the league is softer. Um, they seem he he seems to be uh, have done a good job in college of drawing fouls. I don't know if that translates over to the NBA, but I think he needs to bulk up a little bit. He needs to get there maybe just a little bit quicker. Um, I, I don't think he could be an impact player. I think he could be a role player. Um, I don't see him going as an early draft. Pick. Well, uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't see him. Well, the guy that he was draft. up against last night, Klingon, is a lottery pick, right? Now that um, son of a so gun is a lottery pick. He's, yes. he's a lottery pick, and you'd like to think, uh, and of course, keep Edie's stature and size in in mind with all this. Zach Edie, you know, thirty seven points last night and ten rebounds. Um, yeah. Again, we we talked about it. It was basically, you know, he had fifty percent over fifty percent of of the yeah. team points. All their points. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I I. Yeah. I I I, I kind of hard I kind of find it hard to sit here and say that the NBA a uh, team on the NBA couldn't utilize his size right like I would love to see what Popovich or you know a, a, a brilliant NBA mind could do with development of Zach Eady um, but to me like the biggest knock for Zach Eady it's not the fact that he misses bunnies um, at the basket or whatnot because he does he takes he does take a a beating right but he's going up against smaller. Yeah. 
smaller individuals. He's going to be going up, not just not just taller dudes, but bigger physical dudes in the NBA. Men. He's going up against men in the NBA, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Or he will be. And, well, and not, with with that dom- with that physicality, also comes speed, Rodney. Team speed. And for me, that is the biggest knock with Zach Eady is his speed, his lack of speed in his footwork. Yeah. Sure, you could argue for being seven four, yeah. he can dance pretty damn well, but he looks he still looks slow to me. He does. He does. And that's why I had somebody reach out to me on Twitter and they're like, Why do you call him boring? I said, because he's slow. I, I mean, he just he just I, I don't he doesn't move well. And he's a big man. I mean, and I, I totally get it. He's a big dude. It's Honestly, hard. like remember that athletic play that Newton scored at the rim, which everybody's just like, how in the hell did Newton get that yeah. off? Right? Yeah. That, my, that's a legitimate. How in the hell did Newton get right. that off? How in the hell did Edie not block that uh, exactly. that shot? Because he's, he's slow. Over. Yeah. Because he's slow. And I mean, that's the whole thing where you get these athletic big guys. And when I say that he he needs to bulk up a little bit, I mean, I think if he's going to bulk up a little bit, I'm probably going to fucking slow him down even more. Well, remember, again, and that's what we got to talk about with footwork, right? And and athleticism, agility, right? Remember when um, Anthony Davis came into the league right after Kentucky, right? He. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like, all right, this is a a lottery pick, dude. And I was just like, all right, well, this dude's skin and bones. And then within – Two years, his shoulders were super broad. Um, maybe he just got strength from the eyebrow, from the unibrow or whatnot. But mm-hmm. his, I mean, my God, like his, he just, his body went through a complete transformation. Uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo went through the same transformation too, right? It's because, you know, they're, they're coming to the league. They're coming to the association when they're mm-hmm. 19, 20, 21 years old. And then, right. hell, you, you put a little bit of, of you know, man uh, man weight on them a little bit, get them a little bit bulkier or whatnot, and then their shoulders actually fill out or, or, or something. So, again, maybe it takes Edie two, three years to get his his NBA physical stature upon him, but I think the, the stature is going to come naturally. The speed is what he needs to work on most. He does. Because that, that's going to be the biggest differential and the biggest takeaway from him in the NBA. Yeah, and, and I think the thing about it is, I mean, I, I don't think it'll happen. But I, I genuinely think what would be great for Zach Eady is to spend a year, year and a half in the fucking G League, or and, and maybe maybe go play in Europe. A go play bit. in Europe, yeah. Maybe yeah. develop that. Maybe develop that that skill set. Yeah, um, he, uh, he's and, not that bad of a passer. He can shoot like he's pretty decent from the free throw line, right? He just misses some bun. That, that's my question. He he has questionable misses around the basket when it doesn't mm-hmm. look like he's being leaned on or fouled that much. So yeah. you got to be able to dominate. Here, here, and look, I, you know, I thought. Again, last night, dominant performance, 37 points. You can't take that away from him. 10 boards. I, I would have loved to see, you know, a, a little bit more domination on the glass from him. But, he, again, consider the fact that he did not have that much support from his team. Um, yeah. Getting, you know, yeah. over 50% of the buckets over the team's buckets, you got to have a little bit of, of help from your team. But also, that's that's credit on UConn, man. Taking away the perimeter play on the, on the defense – or, excuse me, uh, taking away the perimeter play for Purdue, not allowing them to get their shots off. Um, and then just complete, I mean, just absolute domination. Just, yeah. I mean, we yeah. talked about how we gave you an hour of it, an hour, an hour yeah. breakdown of what Dan Hurley was able to do, man. Yeah. Great. Thanks great. Play, point man. Right here the the, uh, you can go flow by guy. Code a text line, uh, to, to close us out right here. Longhorn, Longhorn and Lubbock. I like this. If I was eating, I'd legit, I, I would take boxing training to make those feet faster. Yeah, feet work, like work, work, and hand work. Yeah, 100%. Go do ballet. You guys I mean, in the do waiting do... room, man. I see Jordan and I see uh, Hank down out. there. What's up, guys? How are we doing today? Hey, good. How are you? Doing good. How are y'all? Not fantastic, good. man. Did you guys see the national championship? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. I had nothing invested. I didn't really care. I wanted I wanted UConn to win. I'm not an Edie fan, so uh, all right. I was happy you UConn think, got it done. Do you think What's UConn – and, and, again, we're we're way early in this, gentlemen. We're way early, but uh, I'm sure you guys have seen ESPN already. Cooper Flag. everybody knows that he's going to, to Duke, and they're projected to be the number one way too early projections right now. But after what you saw last night and knowing the turnaround – and turnover that Dan Hurley had to go through to get the team back to the national championship platform. Is there a chance that UConn could go back to back to back? I, I think in the transfer portal era, there's there's always a chance. I mean, yep. you can rebuild rosters and have it completely uh, completely uh, back to to what you want it in, in a year's time. So and it's a, it's a destination. He's an incredible coach. 
Yep. One, I think the sell point of what Dan Hurley hit on the head last night on the national spotlight was his recruitment tool of saying, we just find really good NBA players. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was huge. That yeah. was, I mean, that is, the, <laughs> you can't beat that. On man. the biggest stage, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can't beat right. that. Uh, gentlemen, Who's you guys have a great show. We'll see you guys tomorrow for Athlete of the Week. Have a great day. All right, All right guys. Yeah, I'll yeah. see you. Yeah, my bad. Sorry, I wanted to get a post on the board that uh, it was going to be mostly all recruiting today. Um, so, yeah, so Jeff is still sick. Uh, we have Hank filling in. If you don't know Hank, uh, he's who I work with at Horn 24-7 covering recruiting. Um, fills in, or doesn't fill in, uh, comes in on Je- uh, Chip's show a couple times a week to talk recruiting. So that's uh, mostly what we'll be doing today. So, I guess, you know, first piece of big news Um Michael Fasusi, the number one offensive line target pretty much for this this whole class, uh, this whole cycle, it seems. Um, he's on campus today. So what are you thinking? Yeah, I, I, we were just talking yesterday. It's funny because, you know, you, you get you get up these big visitors weekends. You know, we just had one uh, at Texas on Saturday. You know, we had a junior day earlier this year and, you know, sprinkled in big week- weekends here and there, but then you forget that, yeah, a kid could just show up on a random Tuesday. Um, and we didn't forget. I mean, this visit's been planned for for a minute. Fasusi was saying um, April 9th, really dating back to the Under Armour Dallas um, camp. So, yeah, um, you know, get this guy on campus as much as you can. Um, like you said, arguably the biggest offensive line target in the class for Texas. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of them in the state. So I think that speaks to, you know, how highly – Texas thinks of him, you know, having him up there with the big three with him, Lamont Rogers and uh, and Ty Haywood. But, you know, Fasucci is the guy I think we all kind of have felt, you know, Texas is the team to beat for. Um, and, and I think everyone's kind of been like, you know, Fasucci, Texas, Haywood, Oklahoma, Lamont Rogers, Texas A&M. And obviously that's all subject to change. But, yeah, um, loaded, loaded class. You know, I'm, I'm curious to see how this um, this visit goes today because, you know, the, the kids we talked to on um, – on Saturday, um, after their visit to Texas, that we're able to watch the scrimmage. I mean, every single one of them, offensive linemen, all of them were talking about just how physical the practice is and how they're pretty surprised how physical it was. You know, consider it was a practice, they're on the same team, and these guys were just popping each other. Um, so, you know, we'll see if that that uh, remains the case today. or Hopefully, we'll get, be able to get Fasusi's thoughts on it um, or, you know, at least get some intel on how the trip went um, before he comes back for an official later this uh later in june yeah um so yeah i mean fasusi has been kind of the top guy so interested to uh hear the feedback i'm i mean we haven't really you don't really check in with sources just for an unofficial visit but um i've always highly assumed that fasusi's visit today is gonna kind of be like andrew marshall's visit and kobe sellers's visit from last week where they're kind of there all day so um if we're going to get a reaction from Fasusi, it probably won't be till the evening because I assume that's how long he'll be on campus. And, uh, and so on, as far as Michael Terry, uh, we actually haven't talked about him in a minute on on this show, Jeff and I. And um, it's kind of the same as what we've been reporting over here and on Horns 24-7 where, you know, he's a really highly ranked prospect. But, you know, it's always important to remember that college recruiting boards are going to be much different than NFL draft projection rankings, which is what 24 seven sports rankings are. Um, so that being said, you know, I think they're still uh, trying to kind of figure out maybe an exact position. Uh, whenever Terry was offered, uh, he was in the office with Sark and about six of the position coaches. And they told him all these guys are in the room right now. Cause we don't know what position you're going to play yet. We're just going to recruit you. And then however your body kind of develops, we'll figure it out from there. So that being said, um, I believe he's supposed to be either back Saturday or for the spring game. Um, I know he's coming in town sometime this month, uh, one of those dates. He was at AM this past weekend, uh, actually said his official visit. Um, and, you know, talking with sources to, throughout this one, they didn't offer him till January at the junior day, but Texas was kind of always a school he grew up wanting to wanted to go to. I mean, that was the school he grew up rooting for. Um, and he kept coming back and visiting whenever they wouldn't offer him. And he probably did that about four or five times and never really developed those, uh, I guess, hard feelings that you'll sometimes see. Um, but I mean, it, with Terry, I I think honestly, we're, we're just going to have to see what it looks like after he visits again. Um, but I do know there are people at A&M who feel like uh, they could get that done. And Sources kind of said from the jump, like, 
proximity to home isn't going to be the most important thing, but it's probably going to come down to A&M and Texas. And uh, right now, if you had to ask me to pick between one of those two for Michael Terry, it would 100% be A&M. Um, but there's a long way to go on this one. And again, he's supposed to be back either this Saturday or the next Saturday. So we're going to have to kind of see how it works. You know, he, he's such a, a unique prospect because he can play like 20 different positions. Um, but that also hurts him because, you know, 6'3", 210 pounds and a freak show athlete, a lot of different things you can do with it. But, you know, whenever you play at a school that's used you in seven different positions each game, it's really hard to develop at a specific position. So that's kind of why, you know, he's the number 18 overall prospect, but his kind of top schools list consists of AM, Texas, TCU, and kind of Nebraska, uh, Texas Tech, Oregon. You know, it's kind of just a weird group. And I think it's because a lot of schools are kind of hesitant to take on the, the ball of clay that he is. Um, just because, you know, you there's, there's so much you have to do uh, in working to make that a playable player, I guess, in college. But sorry for kind of rambling. I know that was everywhere, yeah. but uh, we haven't covered Michael Terry in a minute, so I figured I'd try to cover all the bases. But what were you saying, Hank? This, no, this is completely sidetracking from that. But, you know, there's been a lot of mention of Nebraska with, with a lot of these kids in the state of Texas. You know, Bo Barnes is going up to Nebraska in a couple weeks for an official visit. Um, there's a few – I mean – Michael Terry, there's a few other in-state guys. I mean, do you think that that's just the Matt Rule connection? Is there anyone else in the Nebraska staff you, you could think of that's, like, really helping them dip into Texas? Or just, I mean, Texas is kind of the biggest state with talent near Nebraska, I guess. Uh, but it is interesting. I feel like we're hearing Nebraska a lot. Yeah, um, I think a lot of it is Matt Rule. Um, and Joey McGuire's son, Garrett McGuire, right. who yeah. is Nebraska's receivers coach. He's the youngest um i believe on field position coach in the power five or just on field coach in the power five uh he's like 26 or 27 something nuts like that but uh yeah and another thing that nebraska does that has them kind of in the mix with so many kids is they run their personnel and scouting department very similar to tech where it's personnel and scouting is who's offering the kids and telling the position coaches to recruit um which most schools don't really do and also, Nebraska is kind of under the same model as Texas Tech, where if you have track times and can play football somewhat decent enough, you have freaky track times we're going to offer you. Yeah. Um, but it, it's especially interesting because Texas Tech has the state of Texas to do that from. Nebraska's in the Midwest, so they have to come to the state of Texas and offer a lot of kids down here. Um but also Nebraska, they're not – like, I feel like Texas Tech does a better job of being like, okay, this guy can actually play football. Whereas Nebraska is just like, oh, he has the track times offered. <laughs> but that's the, kind of just my read on it. Um, yep. And also another thing, like, no one would ever think about it just because it's like the least flashy program that I think could be considered a blue blood maybe. But, like, Nebraska has some damn money. They got money. And yep. – it's just going to be about having to get kids from the South to want to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's something they've always struggled with. But, but yeah, that's – I remember for, out of high school, there was uh, – I got a flyer in the mail when I was applying for schools, and it was one from Nebraska. And uh, they were like, Lincoln, Nebraska is like a sister city to Austin. These are all the similarities. And I was actually like, oh, that, that looks pretty cool because I always, I always liked Nebraska based off their helmets. I just – I thought their helmets looked really cool when I was a kid. So obviously that translates to me wanting to go to college there, I guess. But no, uh, yeah. I never applied. But I thought that was interesting. They were trying to uh, to compare Austin and Lincoln, Nebraska, which I've heard is actually nothing. They're they're nothing similar. So I mean, maybe there's people in the chat or the comments that have been to Lincoln or spent a considerable amount of time there. But I don't think I don't think that'd be for me. Yeah, I think I've driven through Nebraska. But I don't think I've been to Lincoln or Omaha. Um, but, yeah, uh, so next guy I want to ask you about, um, Kelshawn Johnson. You know, you, you wrote about how you like your crystal ball even more um, in yesterday's Stampede on Horns 24-7, if you all want to go check that out in part two. But, you know, you were one of the first people to put in a prediction for Kelshawn, the speedster from Hitchcock. Kind of why do you like that prediction even more coming out of this visit? I think, you know, I first really started liking it um... – Back at uh, Under Armour Houston or following that, you know, we were talking to him and he was saying, you know, 
he's actually been tempted to commit to Texas a couple times, you know, and, and, you know, we, we've checked, you know, Texas has pushed for him to commit a couple times. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when he's saying that, and then he's saying, you know, it's really kind of, you know, Texas, USC are kind of the, the two schools that he, he's really looking at. Um, you usually have to give the edge to the in-state school there. And obviously USC is going on a really incredible recruiting run. We'll see how long that lasts or, you know, once the season comes around, they're playing Big Ten football. Uh, you know, if they start getting beat up a little bit, uh, kids start jumping ship. But uh, they, they are recruiting really well now, so you have to take that into consideration with a guy like Kelshawn Johnson. But, you know, he visits Texas a lot. He's going to be back for an official um, in June. He was on campus Saturday for Longhorn City Limits. We didn't get a chance to talk to him. He kind of uh, dipped out uh, before we could we could, uh, we could see him. Uh, but, you know, from talking with sources, talking um, to people close to him, uh, you know, he he was he was enjoying the visit on Saturday as well. He actually showed up with Jonah Williams and uh, I don't know if they showed up together, but they all walked in the parking lot together with, uh, with uh, Jonah Williams and uh, and uh, Ricky Stewart. So uh, I don't know if they were kind of all hanging out um, throughout throughout the day. But, um, you know, I, I think that was another, it was another scenario on uh, on Saturday or example of him, you know, maybe considering you know, pulling the trigger and committing to Texas. Um, I know, you know, I think the intel favors more so him waiting, um, and you've reported this as well, kind of waiting until till the summer after these official visits. But, you know, the, the focus, the big focus on Saturday, receiver recruiting-wise, was uh, was uh, DeCorian Moore and Jamie French, the two five-stars. Those are Texas's two biggest targets at the position, and that's no slight to guys like Kalik Lockett or Kelshawn Johnson. Um, or, or other receiver targets they have in the class, it just goes to show how much, you know, the, the, you know, French and, and DeCorey Moore, uh, you know, just a step up. And I think anybody would agree with that. You know, those guys are, I mean, surefire NFL guys. Um, the other guys have a lot of potential as well. But Kelshawn Johnson is, you know, like I said, a freaky athlete. A lot of things they can do with with, with his play style in Sark's offense. And, and Texas likes him a lot. I think he's a guy that, that they're going to continue to push for, even with, you know, Moore and French being the two you know biggest targets. And, you know, they have a handful of others, Marsh, Lockett, um, Manuel Choice, um, Dalen McCutcheon, a bunch of others. But I, th- I think Johnson's up there in, in the guys that they, they really like and want in this class. And I think they're going to end up winning out for him uh, whenever he does decide to make a decision. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm that. That's actually a guy I could throw in the the crystal ball and story we've been talking about. Um, but yeah, so and I also think isn't Kelshawn supposed to be back for the spring game? Let me check my uh, trusty visitors. Wrong. I might have might have got that. Yeah, we Please. we gotta get that up soon. Um, yeah, it's coming up. But uh, but I do know, or I don't know for a fact yet because I don't think he's qualified yet. But I would expect Kelshawn Johnson in Austin the first week of May because that's when the Texas State track meet is. Okay. And if you're someone who's going to run in 10 fives, there aren't very many other people in 3A competition level that uh, Hitchcock plays in that can run 10 okay. five. So if he's healthy, I'm assuming he's going to be at the state meet. I hope he's there. Um, I should be there. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And then, uh, so it, is he going to, um, for the uh, for the spring game. Oh, oh, I didn't. I don't have him on my list yet, but he could. Oh, I think there's good. a big. There's that's like the regional track weekend too. So that might because that might yeah. affect Corey Moore's ability to to visit that weekend also. So that might be one he has to miss. Oh, Jordan's connection. Might have to re-log in. See if he comes back. But, yeah, uh, Kelshawn Johnson, we're not sure as to whether uh, he's going to be at the spring game or not. Um, again, track might affect that um, in terms of his availability. And uh, and we can start. I got Siri going and trying to. Okay. But uh, speaking of that weekend, I mean, it's still going to be I, I, it's going to be interesting because this April 6th weekend, you know, in terms of just uh, Jordan's trying to figure it out to get back in. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, just top targets, kind of a concentrated amount of top targets on campus. Uh, it was it was this April 6th weekend might end up being bigger than April 20th. Just, you know, you look at about two dozen guys that, you know, you could argue could all at some point be in this class. There he is. Uh, so we'll see if the spring game out does that. Because, you know, spring game, you got Riley Pettijan. Obviously, DeCorey Moore is planning on coming back. That would make, you know, three times in Austin in four weeks. I mean, I – you can't feel great if you're LSU about that, whether he's there running track or whether he's visiting Texas, you know, 
he's in Austin um, and he's a top target and they want him. Um, so, you know, that'll be interesting, but yeah, this April 20th visitors list, I think Haywood's supposed to come. Um, Michael Terry, like we just mentioned earlier, um, Pettigeon, and, Pettigeon. So I guess to, to kind of bounce off what you said about um, LSU kind of being started to sweat a little bit, maybe. Yeah. The Corey and Moore is not just a top target. He is the top target. And that's kind of why I think the whole kind of Texas market, whenever he committed in August, was like, this doesn't matter. <laughs> because how many times has Texas missed on their top target? They haven't. Yeah. This staff hasn't. Kelvin Banks got him. Arch Manning got him. Colin Simmons got him. And you can even – all the other secondary targets they wanted. DJ Campbell landed over Oklahoma. Um, uh, the next class, Ant Hill, flipped him from A&M. The next class oh, – Malik Muhammad also, I, I would say he's in that category of kind of the camp miss. They, they honed in on him pretty early. And then the next year, Kobe Black was another guy like Colin Simmons, kind of the whole cycle where they were like, we are getting this guy. Yeah. Corian Moore is treated the same way. The Arch Man and Hill Cam Banks, all those other recruits were treated at. Um, and never Texas is a guy that high on the board. They've never missed under the staff. So that's I think, you know, just why everyone likes uh, the chances. And I mean, yeah, it's you can't ignore four times in one month. Uh yeah. that's you, you just can't ignore that. So and if you know, I know his official visit dates aren't set to stone yet, but there's talk that the Texas official will be that twenty first through twenty third weekend, meaning, you know. If he is shutting things down and going to make, you know, his final decision in the month of August, that means the last official visit would go to Texas. If that if that turns out to be the case, you know, that you got you got to like the the chances there as well. So, yeah, it'll be uh, fascinating to watch that one throughout the summer. Yeah, And as far as OVs go, um, not sure when they could get posted. But like Hank said, uh, it's looking like Corey Moore will be in town last weekend. Um, and it is important to, because this is going to go into the season. Like, this, the Corey Moore is going to have this figured out by the start of Duncanville's season week one. Uh, his mom just wants him only. He just played football his senior year, focus on that. And everyone in Duncanville wants the same thing. You know, he's their leader. He's their best player. Uh, they're going to need him focused. So, and especially because the new district Duncanville's in, they just added Mesquite Horn and a bunch of other programs, and it's it got even better. So, yeah. And then uh, Jordan Davison, um, kind of your guy, you know, modern day kid uh, out on the West Coast, top two four seven running back. Came in. Obviously, there, there's been a lot of Ohio State buzz there. Uh, Ohio State hired uh, Carlos Lachlan from Oregon, the Oregon running backs coach, who's been at Oregon since that landing staff got there. Kind of uh, what are the vibes like coming out of this this weekend trip to Austin? You know, we've always been on the side, even with the Ohio State buzz, that, you know, Texas has a Tashar choice and other schools don't. Um, but kind of how are you feeling coming out of this weekend? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still feeling, and I wrote this in the Stampede, I'm still feeling relatively comfortable with my prediction for Texas. And, and you know, I, I'm not ignoring the fact, you know, Ohio State is one of those programs that, you know, equal footing on Texas in terms of, you know, they can pull their top targets. You know, they, they don't, you know, the, the Texas is the Ohio States, the Alabamas, the Georgias. Who else am I missing? Um, you know, those are the kind of high level programs. Like they get who they want typically. Um, so, you know, if they want Jordan Davison, um, if there's buzz going that way, there's probably something behind it. But again, he was back in Austin. What? This is the fourth time he's visited since last July. Um, you know, he had that late July visit. I want to say he visited for a game in the fall. I could be wrong. He might. I don't know. He was at Junior I think Day. Did come down. Yeah, he was at yeah. Junior Day, and then this weekend. So that's four visits. He's going to come back for an official in June. It's not set yet. First tour's close to him, uh, but he is going to come back. And, and you know, it sounds like this weekend went great. You know, he was in uh, in town with his brother. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, around the staff treated as a priority. He came in uh, the day before kind of the, the big event. So got a couple days. Um, and th that was another thing this weekend. A lot of the recruits stayed, you know, it was, it obviously wasn't official visits, but a lot of these guys stayed around and, and you know, Bo Barnes hung out. Uh, DeCorey Moore stayed till Sunday. Uh, Jordan Davis, I think left Saturday, but 
was there for a couple of days. Um, but, I, you know, it sounds like it went well. Um, again, like you just mentioned, you know, Tashard Choice, when he locks in on a guy, um, you know, that's the guy they're typically going to get. And I know a lot of people on Saturday were like, oh, how does Ricky Stewart's commitment uh, affect Jordan Davison? It's like it doesn't affect it at all. Ricky Stewart was a top target. Jordan Davison is probably the top target. Um, that's going to be a two back class. They wanted both these guys and, and now they have one of them. Now they can really focus on trying to add, uh, Jordan Davison to the fold. Um, so, um, I yeah, still, like I mean, Texas. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. My bad. No, I, was, I, I still like Texas's chances, especially, you know, and, and I asked, I asked someone close to him last week, you know, <clears throat> there's buzz with Ohio state and they're like, you know, it's like Jordan doesn't even know where he wants to go yet. And we're, we're saying this as like, you know, Texas is trending. You know, I, I think things kind of point towards Texas. I'm not saying that like he's already made that decision to himself or anything, but um, you know, I, I think there, there's still a long way to go. And I know that's an easy, like kind of cop out thing to say, but um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a while to go, you know, he knew the Oregon running backs coach was at Oregon. You know, we didn't see crystal ball picks going to Oregon, you know, so I think let Texas work a little bit more on this, get him back for an official. I think they can, I think they can get this one done still. Yeah. And also, I mean, uh, one thing that isn't even really being talked about, but Rashad Samples, pretty pretty dope dude, pretty cool dude. And I doubt he talked to Davison much during his time at SMU, TCU, Arizona State. But, like, uh, who's to doubt Rashad Samples, who's now the running backs coach at Oregon, to uh, kind of put the ducks in the mix? And, I mean, that was my next question. Like, besides Ohio State and Texas, what are some other schools you think he could maybe OB to? Yeah. I mean, Oregon could be one, obviously. Um, I, I think the other school for Jordan Davison, and, and you know, if you want to group in Marcus Harris to this as well, is Alabama. I think that's a school both of those guys are enamored with. Um, Robert Gillespie is Alabama's running backs coach, and, you know, he's proven he can be a, a top 10, top five level recruiter. Um, kids really, really like him. Um, and, and, you know, he was one of the coaches retained by Kalen DeBoer. So I think Alabama's a school to watch. You know, I, I don't think you can ignore Colorado, obviously with prime there. Um, but I, I think, yeah, uh, right now, I think it's gearing up towards Alabama, Ohio state, or I'm sorry, Texas, Ohio state for him. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, you don't want to ignore those, those other ones. And especially kids can take, I know it, it's like grinding of schedule wise, but they can take however many official visits they want. Now they can take, you know, upwards of 10. I know most kids still keep it to four to five and, and try to knock them out in those summer months. But uh, yeah, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some other ones get ma- mixed in, but uh, you know, Oregon, Alabama, Colorado, maybe some other ones to watch with with Jordan Davison. Yeah. Uh, dreaded read. Yeah. Do we truly have a real chance to pull French away from Ohio State? Look, so uh, most people you talk to are going to say no. Um, but I actually talked to someone yesterday who they, they think Ohio State is still the most likely landing spot. Um, but they don't think it's – nearly as done of a deal as a lot of people think and actually the source thinks that at this point French is going to give Tennessee and Texas almost every opportunity to overtake Ohio State um I kind of need to call you about this Hank when we get off so I can tell you some (laughs) some more stuff but but Texas could be very real for um Jamie French right now a, a lot of work that needs to be done but they're going to have a shot at this. Um, I can't say that. And, you know, coaches at Texas aren't stupid. They know they're kind of up against the wall here. But, you know, like we talked about earlier, DeCorian Moore is 1A. Jamie French is 1B. And then it's a big gap. And then it's a group of other kids who could call and commit right now. But those are the top two guys. So I guess to answer the next question, Jose, the top two receivers, in in I mean, in Texas' opinion and in my opinion, there are the two best: are DeCorian Moore and Jamie French. I think Kalik Lockett could end up getting drafted higher than Jamie French, which is why Kalik Lockett's probably ranked higher by our, our national team. But um, as of right now, uh, and being a ready to play freshman or contributor, Jamie French is going to be a safer bet, and I mean, DeCorian Moore is the safest bet out of any receiver I've seen. So. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I thought it was interesting on uh, on Saturday. Number one, that the fact that Jamie French actually came out and did an interview that was that was, and he's he's a really nice kid. But you know, some of those kids that you know they they go out the back door and and uh, and go don't go to media. But uh, Jamie mm-hmm. French did, and, and you know he was more than willing to answer the questions. And uh, 
you know, I thought it was interesting that, you know, we were asking him about official visits and, you know, he has Texas set for the, the 21st, 23rd. Uh, I think he last has Miami. weekend. Yeah. Last weekend. Uh, I think he has Miami set um, and a few others. And he, and he goes, uh, and I might try to squeeze Ohio state in as well. I'm not sure yet. So it was like, are you, is he trying to throw us off the scent of Ohio state? Is he trying to like make Ohio state not seem as much of a factor? Obviously I've seen that a ton with kids that, you know, they, they see these, they see the predictions. They see that the, the, you know, the, the crystal balls, the RPMs on three, you know, they, they get it. Um, so maybe that was a little, uh, uh, an attempt at him to be like, Oh yeah, Ohio state, they're there too. But he did say Texas jumped into his top three. He said they weren't there before he got on the visit and you know, the, Looked like he was having a really good time. Um, and, you know, as I reported in the stampede, I uh, was told his family really loved it as well. So it wasn't just him that was there. You know, he had a he had a group with him. So it wasn't, you know, kind of just one of those throwaway visits where, you know, just him comes. It's not really taking it seriously. I think he's taking Texas very seriously and, and, and vice versa. Texas takes his recruitment very seriously. So, yeah, we'll see what happens uh, this summer with him. Yeah, and it's funny for uh, for Jamie French, you know, when, when you ask people about him, uh, where do you think he'd go? Uh, like I said, most people are going to say Ohio State, but also the answer is usually followed by like, yeah, but it, it could be anywhere, but he's not staying in Florida. So uh, if Miami or Florida State, because UF is not going to have a shot here, they're getting fired in November. But if Miami <laughs> or Florida State, <laughs> I don't, it's true. If Miami or Florida State pulls this off, like it, it'll be very impressive uh, on their end. Well, um, we've seen Miami pull those like late. You know, Carmody rabbits McClain out of their out of hat nowhere. where it's just like, how did this happen? And he was like, how did it happen? But, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. They, they're, yeah, uh, I wouldn't ever really sleep on, you know, Mario Cristobal and that staff getting something like that done. But you also need a quarterback. And I guess they have Cam Ward, but that's only, that's a one year, one year loan on Cam Ward. Um, and then he's not I mean, going to be, they, they're not going to get a good ROI on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and, and Antoine, to answer your question, from a size, speed, athletic profile, who's a good comp for choice? I'm assuming you're talking about um, a manual choice. Honestly, I, I can't think of one. But if I'm going to be completely honest with you, of like the five, six, seven receivers maybe, after DeCorian and Jamie French, they could call and commit right now. He's one of them, but he's by far the least likely. Like I seriously can't remember the last time I wrote about a manual choice just because he hasn't he hasn't visited Texas besides the junior day and uh he's lined up a lot of other visits each time I check in with him um but never anything about Texas really so I know both sides are in contact but we're uh we're not expecting that to happen and um as far as contenders for him I think it'll be like a OU T uh, TCU type of thing OU was his very first offer Emmett Jones who uh long time Dallas area high school head coach um, you know, most people know who Emma Jones is. He's a receivers coach at OU, and he was uh, Choice's first offer last spring. So uh, OU's in a really good spot right there. Uh, TCU as well. I think he's also going to OV to like USC and maybe uh, Mizzou or one or two other schools, something like that. But it really seems like Texas is out of it. And um, in uh, dreaded read, I guess to, to answer Nick Townsend and Kiati for the other tight end sake. Um, you know, we've asked sources trying to figure out, you know, who do you potentially like more? That's sometime a, a topic amongst guys in the industry. Do you like Kiati or Townsend more just because they're two of the top tight end prospect, prospects to come to the state and they happen to be in the same class? And everyone at Texas will tell you either one. Um, like, we're, they'd love either one. They don't really necessarily prefer one one way or the other. At least that's not what sources say. Um but either one would be a take, and they're both going to come in on the same OV weekend. Uh, Imari Winston's also going to be in on that same weekend. And if Texas, I, I don't think in any world they're going to be able to get two of them just because I think that those two kids are going to be split by Texas and AM, by one going to AM, one to Texas. But if both of those kids did want to go to Texas, Texas would sign three tight ends. Um, they love Townsend and Kiati that much. And even though Imari Winston is a very unorthodox tight end, tight end body, um, he's a guy who Steve Sarkeesian can create plays for. Uh, really interesting kind of 6'1", 6'1 and a half, H-back body, but he plays tight end. 
Um, and <coughs> we have blood, blood we have him in the top two, four, seven. I don't think he's really gonna. I, I've talked to people about this. I don't think Amari Winston maybe necessarily should be in the top two, four, seven, but I think he's gonna be a really, really fun college player. Um, so if you get a six one tight end that can play all over as an H back paired with Keati Armstrong, who's six six, paired with Nick Townsend, who's basically JT Sanders light. That's a pretty damn good tight end haul. So, um, yeah. And then for the D-line room, they're, they're going to need a hit on someone in the portal, and they're going to need to sign. They, they can't afford to sign a Melvin Hills or DeAndre Robinson. Again, no disrespect to those guys, but they, they're they going to need a, a DJ Sanders or Zion Williams, Josiah Sharma, one of those three guys. And it, it's not – they, oh, they really want them. It's they, they, they literally need that. Um, the the D line room is incredibly weak right now. They're they're going to need to hit it hard. So, yeah. um, and I could see four D linemen, maybe five. But if it if it's five, I think it would be like them kind of cheating and being like, okay, we can make Lance Jackson a D lineman, yeah. or you know, potentially a guy like Kamorian Morgan. He can be an edge or D lineman just like Lance Jackson as well. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, and so. I guess back to kind of the junior day, another California kid who was there, um, another kid. I can't remember if you have a crystal ball in or not. Um, I know I don't, but we're both kind of talked about it. But John Mills uh, from San Francisco, one of the the most well-traveled prospects in the country. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was back. I guess this was his fourth visit to Texas. I talked to him on Sunday night. He was driving from uh, another – he was driving to Nebraska. He had, he had flown from Austin to – to Omaha and was driving over to Lincoln, um, gave me a call, um, said it was his most, it was his favorite visit yet. And uh, I will say I, I lost this recording. So this interview will never be shown on Horns 24 seven. Unfortunately, he said he was going to call me back, but uh, well, it might be a little bit later, but uh, I do remember the quote. He said uh, it was his favorite visit yet. Um, and, uh, and uh, that Texas is, one of the, if not the teams to be team to beat in his recruitment. So I think that's the way it's kind of been trending. I think, um, you know, we reported this in one of the insiders in the last couple of weeks. It was, you know, uh, the vibe with John Mills is it's Texas versus Washington. And, and he has a, he has a top six and I think Florida's in it. Um, USC might be in it. Uh, Cal. I, I don't have it right in front of me, but the schools you need to focus on are Washington and Texas um and, and washington is an interesting one because he has a lot of family that that went to washington i believe some played for washington so you know you can't discount that but at the same time you know washington's breaking in a new coaching staff um a good coaching staff but you know he has a longer um you know tenured relationship with texas at this point in his recruitment and and a lot of familiarity with texas you know again he, fourth visit um, he's going to take uh, a, an official visit on that June 14th through 16th weekend. So, uh, and, you know, when I was talking to him, I thought it was interesting. I said, you know, so decision after official visits, I would assume. And he goes, yes, for now. And like the for now kind of piqued my interest a little bit. You know, is he thinking of, you know, maybe taking this Nebraska visit and then announcing a decision? Um, I kind of got that vibe from him. And, you know, I was asking people around him and, you know, sources, you know, the, the, I think Texas is, is, is feeling pretty positive about where things stand with John Mills. And I think it show, goes to show, you know, how highly he's thought of, you know, when you have this big three in state, you've got a lot of offensive line talent in the state and even, you know, got a five star like Josh Petty you just hosted or you know, um, you know, there's other offensive line targets throughout the country, but um, I, I think that goes to show how much they like him. And, you know, from our, uh, from our vantage point on Saturday, you know, being outside the stadium or, you know, seeing kind of the recruiting activities taking place, he was getting a lot of love, you know, they, they were showing him around campus, you know, spending time with Kyle flood, a lot of the staff. Um, and so, you know, and another guy that, that spent more than one day in Austin as well, obviously, you know, you're coming from California, you probably need to have the weekend, uh, booked off uh, to, to not, you're not going to come in for one day and go home but um yeah I, I think texas is in a good spot for him and i'll be curious to see if if he announces a decision you know relatively sooner than we're expecting yeah man he's a he's an awesome interview always like when i get to talk to him um and, and it's funny you know we we talk about how washington is kind of the school we've always viewed as a competition he's had a ton of family that have gone as students He's also had a lot of family that have gone and played not only football, but other sports as well. And guess where he was January 1st? In New Orleans. And 
he originally uh, sent it to us or sent it to me. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to be in New Orleans and we just are going to stop by the game too. <laughs> and then about a week later, I figured out how much family he had with Washington. And I'm like, okay, wait, did y'all come down just for the game? And he was like, yeah. So, um, but yeah, was that the Washington, Texas game? Travel down for that. So, you know, shit, maybe Texas could get revenge for the Alamo Bowl in uh, the college football <laughs> playoff. So, um, but yeah, uh, another uh, big boy on the O line I want to talk about uh, this. I know he has a crystal ball. Tyler Thomas um, yeah. physically looks better than I've ever seen him. Uh, obviously, I didn't see him with my own eyes, but saw the photo you posted. And, you know, we, we've even talked about that. Like, he physically looks the best yeah. we've ever seen him. So, yeah. kind of where, where do you think his recruitment's at? Yeah, and I wrote, you know, I, I was kind of thinking, uh, you know, of changing my crystal ball, maybe to even A&M for him uh, over the last few months. It just didn't seem like there was a lot of buzz with him. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, interior guys, I think – <clears throat> excuse me, the Coleman brothers are obviously kind of the guys we look at the most, uh, you know, Jonte Newman's up there, a um, handful of other guys, Jackson Christian, uh, but Tyler Thomas has kind of fallen by the wayside, you know, where is he going to fit in? And, you know, he was on this visitors list. He has an official visit set. I, I think, you know, if you look at these official visitors lists, I think that's kind of a, if you're trying as a outsider trying to get a gauge on like who, what Texas's board is, if they've got an official visit set, it typically means they've been evaluated by the staff or are being seriously evaluated by the staff. And, you know, there, there's a pretty serious level of interest. So, you know, Tyler Thomas has an official visit set up. I forgot what weekend it's for. I think it's the last one of June. Um, and he was on campus Saturday. And again, yeah, he, he got out of his car. And I was like, is that Tyler Thomas? Like, we, I remember interviewing him like the first weekend I was covering Texas when it was at that elite camp. And, uh, you know, he's a big kid. And, you know, I was interviewing him. And I didn't really know who he was at the time. And he's like, yeah, I got offered today. And I was like, oh, nice. And, you know, he, <laughs> but he just didn't look like kind of one of these physically imposing guys that, you know, you would expect to, to, to get an offer. And he was young. So, you know, yeah, not he much credit, definitely but. did not have the look of a guy whose recruitment's probably coming down to AM, Texas, and LSU. Yeah, no doubt. And, and then, you know, I see him on Saturday and now he looks like a guy that, that his recruitment could come down to. You know, he looks a, little, he looks a lot taller uh, and just more physically put together. Um, and he was there with his parents. They drove in and, um, you know, he was getting he was getting the golf cart treatment and was going around doing the tours. And, you know, he said last summer, and this is when I put in the crystal ball pick, you know, he's like, I'm leaning to Texas. He's like, I'm not calling them my leader, but I'm leaning to Texas. So, you know, take that as you want. But uh, and I put in the crystal ball. I thought they were the team to beat. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of gone quiet for the, for the, the rest of the year until this point. And he visits again. And I, I think that kind of reignited, you know, his his liking of Texas. Um, and, uh, you know, I was checking around, you know, Texas likes him too. You know, he's, he's a guy that, you know, could, could join this class if he wanted to, um, you know, two months from now when he takes his official visit, you know, what, you know, if the Coleman brothers commit by then, or, you know, we see the class kind of fill up, you know, maybe that does that change? It could, um, but he's a guy Texas really likes. And I think he has an opportunity to be in the class now if he wanted to be, but I think he's going to wait, take some visits. And, and that's what he's been saying all along. He's like, I really want to take my official visits and then make a decision. So you, get, you can't you can't fault him for that. So it's going to come down to uh, LSU, Texas a and Texas. I still like Texas right now. Could change that this summer. Uh, I think he's visiting TCU this week too, so I wouldn't completely rule out them as well um, or somewhere else in the state. Um, but, uh, yeah, inter interesting prospect. Um, yeah, a lot of those like kind of – we had these like three-star interior offensive linemen all throughout the state. The Coleman brothers aren't even ranked by us yet. Uh, they should be. Uh, they're not yet. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you got this kind of top tier offensive tackles, these bookend guys, and then you got kind of the 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 uh, the guys that do the dirty work on the inside. So we'll see how that all ends up. Yeah, I think um, I mean, I've been screaming it from the, the rooftops since these this class were freshmen. But the, the 25 class is legitimately the deepest class of it I've ever covered. Um in my time covering recruiting and my, my, I mean, my first full class would have been the 22 class. Bless you. But, um, but yeah, I mean, especially at receivers, but like looking in at 20, I've started to do some 2026, uh, stuff and just looking in at our database. And I'm just like, there's only like this many receivers with power five offers right now. It's very, very concerning sometimes, but um, load up now. Yeah, but hey, you you brought up uh, two of my favorites. Um, I always love these kids because it just looks like they're vibing and just having a great time. Always, and the photos of them are always hilarious because 
the straight vibes. But the Coleman brothers, how are uh, how are the Coleman brothers doing? I know you kind of hit on there a little yeah. bit. Um, I know we've always felt pretty good about Texas's chances, uh, and you know texting back and forth with you coming out of the weekend. It the vibe I kind of got was you felt better after getting to speak with them. So yeah, kinda what what they have to say, and also who could be the main comp for Texas here. Yeah, that'll be interesting because I'm not really sure. Like, I just think Texas is in really good shape for them. Um, and, and it's funny, you know, and I, I think, you know, back on junior day when, when Jordan came, I think Devin was there on junior day too, wasn't he? Uh, uh, yeah, so Marcus Hutchins, who played at Texas uh, from DeSoto, is actually the Cedar Hill recruiting coordinator and drove uh, the two Coleman brothers down on junior gotcha. day. So junior day, you know, I was – that's right, because, yeah, I, I was checking in with uh, some sources afterwards and, you know, who who kind of – who look good, you know, who I mean, obviously in, in that setting, you're kind of just sizing them up. They're not doing any workouts, but you know, the, the hey, Coleman can I get brothers. a pass set real quick? <laughs> <laughs> They're walking into Moody on junior day. No, you're no, like, no, well, no, I'm yeah. yeah. Um, no. So I, the Coleman brothers were like the, the guys that came up. They're like, these guys, you know, it, it was pretty clear. They liked them a lot. And then they came on, uh, on this past Saturday and, they are just a really great interview. Like they're just like a fun loving, just duo of like twin brother. And it's funny because like there's another Coleman brother. They're triplets, uh, and he doesn't. I, I think the only school that's offered him is UTSA. Like all of them. And maybe? I think maybe Texas Tech. Okay, so we'll see if that. Yeah. And you know, talking to the Coleman brothers afterwards, you know, it was funny because we were doing like a joint interview with them. So like we're like Jordan and let let him talk to Devin. <laughs> <laughs> just like so we like just could remember their voices. Um, but they gave like a really, you know, candid interview. Um, you know, they're like, you know, we love Texas. We love coach flood, you know, coach, uh, Kyle flood walked him out of the, the facility on, uh, on Saturday and was just standing there talking to them for like 20 minutes before they, they got in the car and drove off. Um, and you know, I, I just think Texas is in really good shape for them. Um, I, I think when it's all said and done and they do say they're a package deal, you know, some kids are like, Oh, but they're like, no, we're a package deal. Um, and, and they I, they, they're it's not like one where it's like one's like an a really elite level guy and the other's like okay we'll take him too just to get this guy like they they could both legit play um yeah and, and so uh yeah and, and I, I got some pretty positive texas vibes from both of them yeah for sure um and so for throughout the fall me and a couple other people at 24 7 always kind of looked at jordan as like being by far the best one and then at the next level athlete camp in january Devin and Jordan showed up and Devin just destroyed everyone like was phenomenal. And coming out of that camp, uh, it's similar to Under Armour where all the reps are recorded. They don't do any testing at next level athlete camp. So, uh, but coming out of the camp, since he performed really well, he got like six new offers in two weeks. Okay. Um, and I believe, I think that's when Texas offered Devin as well. Um, if I'm not mistaken. So, but I do know Jordan was, I think the first one, to get offered and that was back when he pulled up to a, a camp in June last year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I love the Coleman brothers. I'd love uh, for them to end up in the class. Just great, great vibes and always having fun. Um, and also, Hey, I know the triplets, but I, I'm a twin myself. So I didn't um, know that. that uh, you <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. We've talked about this like multiple well, you had times. A bunch of brothers and sisters, but I didn't know you were a twin. No, so I will. I'm technically the youngest. I'd see, I didn't be C section, but me and my twin brother are the youngest of seven total kids. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, What's his name? <laughs> Jackson. Jackson. He's in the bodybuilding, is a ginger, and goes to Tulsa University. So, oh. yeah, that's, uh, that's what my twin brother's up to. Um, cool. Another guy, this, I barely even looked into him he you know he's just an out-of-state guy and it kind of felt like you picked it up as yours kind of but Josiah Sharma um you know what's up with him he's a really interesting prospect all the way out in Folsom California yeah I, I think Texas uh, I know Texas loves this guy and, and a lot of schools love him uh, he was committed to Washington with Kalen DeBoer um, Kalen DeBoer took the Alabama job he decommitted from Washington and he's since visited Alabama and so this is going to turn into a Texas Alabama thing um, and you know, West coast kid, you know, you, you probably want to still factor in all those schools out there too. But I think he's like, those are the two schools he's, uh, he's looking at closest. Um, and he was on, he was not te at Texas this past weekend, but the weekend prior, um, he spent the whole weekend in town for the first time he's coming back for an official, uh, the June 7th weekend, which is actually a pretty light weekend. So 
probably get a not i mean they're still official visitors but in terms of the next two after that you know they're, they're gonna get a lot of face time with the coaches and a lot of attention um and, and you know big kid six five great frame really good length um you know a kid that that texas really likes him once and so you know you look at you know one of the defensive line you know Domino's going to start falling, and they kind of already have. You know, obviously Brandon Brown's committed. They really like him. That you know, obviously he committed to Bo Davis, but you know, w- with Kenny Baker in place now, I, I, you know, the love is still there. They still really like Brandon Brown, um, uh, and then obviously Lance Jackson as well. So um, you know, Josiah Sharma, I, I'm not ready to make a prediction yet, but you know, I talked to him for like ten minutes a few weeks ago after his visit, and you know, I got a pretty heavy Texas vibe from him. Um, and, and, and again, get checked in, you know, they want him, they're pushing for him. So we'll be uh, interested to see that, uh, June 7th weekend. Um, and then how does, you know, how does Bama stack up? He's already visited out to Tuscaloosa. Um, they took, uh, they got his quarterback, Austin Mack, who was signed with Washington flipped to, uh, I think he was signed or either way. He ended up at Alabama. He also went to Folsom. Um, another big time Folsom recruitment I covered was Jonah Williams back in, uh, not Jonah Williams, but, uh, Different Jonah Williams. Tackle. Five star offensive tackle is now on the Bengals that uh that uh protects Joe Joe Burrow's blind side, which yeah, you know, his, uh, his profile sure. always pops up when I write about our Jonah Williams and yeah. Galveston Ball. Yeah. Um so that that recruitment was hilarious because he did not like media, like he did not no, he didn't like media, he just didn't didn't want to talk, but he made a Twitter account in the spring of 2015. Uh, said I'm committed to the University of Alabama. This is only you probably go pull it up. I think it's his only tweet ever. Um, and that was that he committed and was done, and then was a first round pick. Never did a camp. He he camped at schools. He never did like an Under Armour Nike camp. Did anything? We had him as like the number two tackle in the country, and it was a good eval because you know what? He went in the top twenty picks. Um, so we need. I, I would love some more of those where it's like, yeah, uh, th- we don't know what offers this kid has, but he's gonna make a Twitter account and tweet whenever he's like, basically arch. Yeah, yeah like, that's like, literally so what it arch did. Much, yeah, it's very arch similar. Um, I think I, he had <laughs> except the you're a five star lineman, not the most popular recruit of yeah. all time. Yeah. So, uh, but then he actually ended up being like one of the best personalities on the team. Like they did a feature on him prior to one of the games, and like. He's really big into cooking and like he like cooks like five star gourmet meals at his apartment and like so he's like actually a really interesting person. He just didn't really know it because he didn't like to talk do interviews and stuff. So uh, that that was a memorable one. But yeah, Folsom High School they they put out some kids. Um, you know, a lot of the times the the dude from Washington, the quarterback that took him to the playoff the year prior or the years prior, he went to Folsom. I think his name was like Jake something. I can't remember, but they have some guys remember. in Folsom. Yeah. So the last guy I want to talk about um, is Lamont Rogers. Um, obviously, you told me it felt like you got a lot of Texas vibes from him uh, coming out of Saturday's visit. I actually talked on the phone with, with the source for a long time yesterday about Lamont Rogers, and I don't think it could have gone better. Um, the, the same way it went for Kalik Lockett, where Mike Roach said he doesn't think it could have gone better for Kalik Lockett. Uh, if you want to read that story, you can go over to Horns 24-7. I feel the same way after talking to my source for Lamont Rogers. Um, there, there was a lot of uh, kind of a weird dynamic with, with Lamont and Coach Flood for some of the last few months. Once Chris Gilbert came in, him and Jamal Fenner kind of teamed up and smoothed things over. But there was still a little bit of disconnect with the actual, um, I guess, coaches and not support staff at Texas. So that was all smoothed over this weekend. Um, Lamont is not a fan of flashy things. Uh, <laughs> his camp let Texas know that. So Texas kind of had a, a visit catered to him where he was kind of kept separate from the rest of the guys who were all there for Longhorn city limits for different parts. And I mean, they only brought him to about three or four different places around the facility that, you know, they were trying to keep him in the same place and just keep it as low key as possible. Uh, that's what he likes. That's what he enjoys. That's the type of kid he is. So, uh, it really went well. Uh, my source thinks that uh, Texas is now in the top three of his recruitment alongside a and and Missouri. Uh, those are three of his four official visits. He has uh, four OVs in, in this order. He's doing TCU first, uh, or, or SMU, SMU, apologies. I believe that's May 17th, and then he has Missouri, May 31st to June 2nd. And then uh, AM that second June weekend, and then he is Texas the 14th through the 16th. So Texas getting the 14th through the 16th OV is incredibly important. 
um, because it's not the last OV weekend of June, but is the last weekend of June that Lamont Rogers' mom is going to be in town. So he's not taking an OV that last weekend, meaning the Texas one is going to be the last one, and he's going to announce a commitment before his senior year. So that being said, with Texas being the last OV, he's not going to take any other OVs past the summer. My source thinks it's going. It, my source thinks it's coming down to AM and Texas, and he leans Texas. So do I. Um, Missouri has been really dangerous at different parts in this recruitment, um, but you know the the people around Rogers' camp, they're going to let him make the decision, but they're also making it known that they'd like him, you know, closer to home, so they can stay next to their, their son, brother, family, um, and so. The, the source thinks it'll be AM or Texas is the final two. And, you know, I, I got to lean Texas there. You know, I think AM, they, they could offer him some more opportunities, you know, and, and say you can be our guy. They already have Fasusi as their guy. Oklahoma's Haywood is their guy. Come be our guy. Uh, you know, different dynamics like that. But I, I think it's going to be UT or AM here. And uh, another a note. You know, we we started off the show talking about him, but Michael Fasusi, him and Lamont Rogers have developed a, a pretty cool friendship over the last few weeks where, you know, they've been getting on the phone, FaceTiming, playing Xbox, different things like that. And they're becoming really good friends. Um, and, you know, Hank and I feel great about Michael Fasusi's chance of setting up at Texas. Um, and we've been feeling great about that. And we, we don't really see that changing either. So, um one way or another, could Fasusi and Lamont Rogers potentially be a package deal? Maybe. Um, I think that would just those two guys alone would make this kind of the second best O line class overnight behind the 2022 O line class Texas signed with Kelvin Banks, DJ Campbell, uh, NATO, Cole Hudson. I mean, you name it. Uh, Cam Williams, Connor Robertson. That was a loaded group. I don't know if that will ever be surpassed. Um, but a potential tackle tandem of Lamont Rodgers and Michael Fasusi might be the best tackle duo that the staff has signed since they've been at Texas. So, um, but obviously a long way to go for both of those recruitments. Uh, the one I feel better about is Fasusi, but with Lamont, I mean, Texas has gained so much momentum here in the last two months. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, and you also last question on, go ahead. I was just talking about Troy Hoon. We we're going to hit on yeah. him in this one. He is a national prospect. Like he's a guy that that Texas has like really keyed in on. Um, and you can it's easy to say that there's only a handful of offers out to 2026 quarterbacks. But you know Troy Hoon, Dia Bell, uh, Jordan saw Dia this past weekend. Um, two really talented kids. And, and you know the 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 top two four seven for 2026 is going to come out. I guess what in two weeks, two or three weeks. Uh, um, so April 24th. So okay. a week, uh, three weeks from tomorrow. So, yeah, I would expect both those guys, you know, I'm not going to, like, guess their ranking, but I think both those guys will be ranked. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I think it, it, you know, Texas really likes both of them. I think the better chance for right now is Troy Hoon, just because there's more familiarity, there's more exposure there. But, um, you know, we, we could certainly see see that change down the line. But I think I think after this past weekend with Troy Hoon in town for, for, uh, for the visit, um, I think they kind of solidified – um, they're standing and, and, you know, I was talking to Greg Biggins yesterday and you know, I, I didn't realize this, but Troy Hoon is, you know, Texas has been his dream offer or the kind of his dream school. So I think that just goes to show, like makes me feel even better about, you know, saying, I think Texas is in the driver's seat and he's not making a decision anytime soon, but you know, when he does, I think they're going to be, you know, in that, that, that top group for sure. Yeah. And, um, I wrote about it in, in my part, one of the stampede when I was talking about Dia Bell, but. There hasn't really been anything shown, any signs shown from either of those two guys. But like you said, like I feel much better about Troy Hun answer, or ending up in this class than I do Dia Bell. And like, I mean, Texas has just done more work uh, checking it on the background of Hun than they did with Dia Bell. Um, they did more relationship building and prep before offering. Uh, they had him visit before offering. Uh, multiple times, and then Dia Bell wasn't as long of a period of communication before the offer, um, and honestly, he just doesn't seem to be as interested in Texas as Hunt. So, um, and you know, he's 
I'm not sure what what Hun's timeline is. Did he give y'all an answer on when he? Yeah, uh, you know, I was asking him, and he said, you know, he he actually uh, mentioned Jared Curtis, who just committed to Georgia. He was like, I see, Jer- you know, Jared committing now, and you know, I think Jared's shut down visits, but he was saying, you know, I want to make sure, you know, when I commit, that there is no other visits I want to take, that I'm done, that I'm in, and uh, so I guess he's not fully sold, I guess, but I think they're get- I think Texas is getting pretty close with him um, in terms of. Of making it, and you know, as as Barton Simmons once said, that the former twenty four seven Sports national director of scouting, you know, follow the visits, you know, and, and you know, you look at a kid like Troy Hun, three visits to Texas, he's going into his junior year of high school, he'll probably be back for a game in the fall, going to be back for an official visit next year, probably two or three more in there somewhere in between. So I, I think you got to like the chances there. Yeah, and with Dia Bell, I asked him, like, hey, have you even thought about a timeline? And he was like, you know, I've thought about maybe trying to commit some time before my junior year, but I, I really don't know. Um, and it seems like Dia Bell and his camp are just going about this process and being a lot more open and taking their time with it, where it seems Hunt is much more calculated with his moves. Yeah. Um, and I just think – it, it, yeah, I, I just think the chances are so much higher of Han being yeah. the, the 2026 guy and not Dia. But yeah, but yeah how are you Dia's doing? A guy that's going to keep like, like we already kind of know Hun's profile, and you know he has his offers. Like Dia is like, I feel like he's still blowing up. Like he had that strong OT seven. You know he's he's going to just keep kind of building his name. It was kind of like Justin Fields. Like people forget Justin Fields was committed to Penn State. Uh, yeah, early on in his recruitment, his junior film came out, and everyone was like, "Oh my god." I mean, obviously, Penn State is not like the slouch school. Like, he's like not committed to like Tulsa or like no offense to your brother uh, yeah, or perfect. anything like that. <laughs> I don't care about Tulsa. <laughs> Man, <laughs> he wasn't like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He doesn't but, uh, play for him. No, yeah. So, uh, and then his film came out, he decommitted, and then like everybody, everybody and their brother wanted Justin Fields and obviously ended up at Georgia. We, know, we all know how that ended up. But, yeah, I think Dia Bell kind of seems like a guy that, you know, maybe he'll like really wow this fall and, you know, he's really like, you know, top. Not That's not saying Troy's not. I just think Troy's more like we know where he's at and mm-hmm. Dia's kind of still on the up and, up and coming. For sure. How are you doing, BK? What's up? I'm good, guys. Got your vintage, vintage uh, solar eclipse glasses. Got my eclipse glasses ready to roll. Uh, I might be st- – can you even see the screen trend with these? I might wear these. Dude, I, I cannot see shit with these things. And I could not see shit with these things yesterday. If you want my view of the eclipse wearing these glasses yesterday, here it is. Th- that is literally what I saw looking through these pieces of you know what during yesterday's happening. Disaster. I didn't realize Did how much dog would have just... been spent just keeping my three year old from trying to blind himself. He's like, I don't want to yeah. wear the glasses. I'm like, you're going to blind yourself. But uh, you know? I raw dogged it. It was perfectly fine. Now, you don't want to. Yeah, once it's fully eclipsed, it's okay anything. to look at. But when it's like peeking out, that's when it's dangerous. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, it was so cloudy where I was that not that I cared much about the eclipse anyway. So I don't feel robbed of any sort of experience. But it was so cloudy where I was that I didn't, I didn't see what a lot of other people got to see. Like for me, it was just a, dark blue sky that I would see whenever it's about to rain. So I, I thought the eclipse was a total waste of time. But but it's once in a lifetime, know. BK. Come on. You know what, Jordan? We've only had about 15 of those in my lifetime. So I look yeah, forward man. to the next. Yeah, yeah, the next one is only going to be 18 months from now, man. But it, it, once in a lifetime. Uh, it's different. They're all different. Uh Hank, thank you for holding it down. I was on sure. a phone. I was on a call with somebody else, and then I see Jordan calling, and I'm like, "Oh shit, what went wrong? What's going on here?" <laughs> you gotta uh, give me privileges. I can't ever let myself in from the back room. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I like the sound of any of that. <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll take care of that. We'll I'll, I'll call oh, you like tonight. That. <laughs> yeah well <laughs> sounds good well uh i'll i'll see you tomorrow hopefully jeff is uh recovered so yep, yep. Well, you great got job it. today hank thank you thanks and i'll, thanks, I'll call hank. you right now all right I'll cool see you. see you no problem thanks guys all right what's up kd yo 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 how are you doing i am good i am good how are you doing good man i didn't get uh good enough sleep and had to get up early and it was hailing at my place today like yo 
What's going on, man? We got earthquakes in New York. We've got an eclipse. We've got hail. Although the hail's not too, you know, uncommon around these parts. But yeah, how's your, how's your car? It's coming down. Did you, uh, did you check your car? Are you okay? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Is that you? Or okay. Did you? Probably. Uh, did yeah odds are it's you yeah. but i do not know for sure um how's your car any hail damage no it which is weird um because i mean it, it you know i was here when it happened and i went out there and i didn't see anything so i guess it you know it was feet you know what 100 feet away from my place so i don't know how it didn't get i mean maybe i missed something i'll, I'll have to go check it out but mm. You, yeah. you didn't get any down south, did you? It was storming pretty hard down here, like right before Bucky and I started. So a little before eight o'clock this morning, it was pretty loud thunderstorm and loud rain. I don't know if it ever turned into hail. I haven't even been outside today, to be perfectly honest with you. So I, wow. I have no idea if there's any damage to anything. But I don't, I don't think it was as bad as maybe you got in, in the Hyde Parkish area. So, yeah. Um, um, all right. Well, I want to get your thoughts on the eclipse. Also want to get your thoughts on last night's national championship game because you are a college basketball historian and there are folks trying to compare this year's UConn team to some of the great college basketball teams ever. So I want to get your take on that. But first of all, your thoughts on the eclipse. Did you watch the eclipse? Did you have these glasses? Did you do anything out of the ordinary to take in yesterday? I did not have the glasses. I did not do anything out of the ordinary. When it got dark, I went outside and there were people looking at it. And I just looked up as, you know, but it was so cloudy that, like you said, you couldn't see anything, that it didn't really matter. Um, I got a huge kick out of everyone's reaction. It does kind of remind you, man, that like, I, 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 I don't know. I'm just a bitter old man and I always have been. So nothing's really changed, but I just don't get it. I don't understand where humanity is. We just haven't evolved very much to be as fired up as some people were. Now, it's one thing if you just go outside and look at it, but there were people flying in from Germany. I was watching the news. Guy flew in from Seattle. Guy flew in from, like you're flying in. I mean, talk about disposable income. To fly in, it, to, to see something for two seconds. I mean, look, uh, you know, that, at 15, maybe if I would have had the money, I would have gotten an escort. And and that would have been two seconds. Maybe three, <laughs> maybe four if you're out in the country, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I, like, if it, if it would have lasted an hour and a half, I can maybe get that, you know? It's an hour and a half. Even then, I'm like, you flew in from Germany for an hour and a half? I mean, and you didn't know if the weather was going to be good? I'm just not much of a science nerd. I, I don't get it. And you just get online. Get on YouTube and look at it. It's not that big of a deal. I'll tell you what, every... Yeah, every picture and video I've seen of the eclipse was better than me actually taking in the eclipse with my own eyes. Like part of that part of that had to do with the cloud coverage, but like I was never going to get the best picture or the best view of the eclipse. So, I'm not mad that I went outside. I literally walked out to my apartment complex parking lot. It didn't take me much time at all, but like I, I didn't get anything close to what some other folks got out there. So, the fact that yeah, people traveled across the world to come maybe see what I saw Dude, that's that is tough right there. I, I just don't get it. Uh, I didn't get all the hype, I mean, especially all the hype. You know, I saw these glasses at every store I went to for a month now, and I never even thought about it. I mean, you know, I get to work yesterday. No one's there. Everyone is, you know, staying at home because they're going to watch the eclipse. And <laughs> I just like, you know, if it's an excuse to party on a Monday, I guess, whatever. But. I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it. I didn't get it. And I got a big kick out of the fact that it was cloudy. Oh, man. Yeah, I kind of did, too. I really did. And uh, shoot, the best part of yesterday, you and I were talking last night about this. There was no one on the road. Like nobody oh. went into work. Nobody went into school. They uh, People actually listened, right? They were telling us for weeks, hey, don't be on the road on April 8th. 
And usually people see those signs or see those warnings and are like, ah, the hell with that. I'm going to live my life. I'm not listening to you guys, whatever. But nobody was on the road yesterday. And if you actually went out and ran errands and tried to get stuff done, it's like peak quarantine level traffic yesterday. There was nobody out there. It was beautiful. It was great. It was going to a real good restaurant. The stuff to get into on Oscar night. You know, <laughs> another thing I don't care about at all that people seem to care about. And so I in New York, that was that was perfect. I mean, I used to always, you know, I think Trey got me on that when it's Oscar night, like go to a restaurant, the stuff to get into and and it'll be empty. So I, I went to the store yesterday, flew in, flew out. It was awesome. I mean, I wish we had solar eclipse, you know, day, you know, once a week. Because I did get all my errands run and do it real quickly. But yeah, no one was on the road. It was the quickest I got to work since I've been working there. Uh, just flew there. Nobody was out. I was like, this is great. I actually, I actually did kind of like it. Hey, you just had a little eclipse there. Um, yeah, I actually did kind of like it, you know. But but for me, the actual eclipse part, even if it would have been clear outside, just does not do anything for me. I know. I mean, I, I'm no fun. Yeah. I guess, I guess I'm not either. I mean, that was like, I had low expectations going into yesterday, right? Cause I'm not a big science guy either. And I, I just don't find space that interesting at all. I don't, either. Uh, yeah. like I, I mean, I, I think like, and I wasn't alive for the first moon landing. So I don't have like the, the nationwide pride that a lot of people had when we made it to the moon for the first time and the great space race between us and the Soviet union. It's like, okay, none of that stuff means a lot to me because I wasn't around, but like to me, just, uh, everything we've done in space feels like a colossal waste of time and money. So that stuff just doesn't really intrigue me that much. So I, I had low expectations going into yesterday and I was hoping like, okay, maybe this is one of those, you set the bar low and okay, you get impressed, right? Like you don't, you don't think too highly of anything. You don't set high expectations. So you won't get overwhelmed. I set the bar very low. I had low expectations. I'm a, was like wishfully thinking that I was going to be impressed and I'd have to eat some crow on Texas Sports Unfiltered and say, you know what? You guys were right for hyping this thing up. I'm sorry. Uh, that was cool. And I was wrong. But I, I was underwhelmed. I had incredibly low expectations and I was underwhelmed with what happened. Like, and I'm sure the cloud coverage had a lot to do with it. And we just couldn't see it the way that we were supposed to see it. But it didn't get that dark where I was. Uh, you could barely see the sun or the moon where I was. And there wasn't like a drastic temperature change where I was, like some people were talking about. Like it, it literally just felt like a sky when it's about to rain for three minutes and then it cleared up and got sunny again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but how cool could it have been? It's two seconds in the city, four in the no. country. Like, I mean, it, it could have been cool as shit, but still it's four seconds. Right. I don't, I don't know. They said it was three minutes. Was it four seconds? I mean, in terms of, you know, totality, you know, complete coverage, it was going to be that. Yeah. Uh, see if anybody is some guy at my apartment complex or a bunch of people in my apartment complex parking lot, like gathered around. Folks had lawn chairs. Some guy was sitting in the bed of his pickup truck drinking a beer. And you had this jabroni just laying down on his back, staring up at the sky. Like, dude, no towel, nothing, not even going on the grass. You're just laying on the sidewalk in the middle of the walkway for this. What are we doing? God, yeah, no. Nah. You and I are definitely in the minority, man, because there are a lot of people of all ages I knew who were fired up about it. And good for them. I mean, I didn't want to piss on their party, but the fact that weather kind of did, I do get a kick out of. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... That's uh, our Eclipse thoughts, clearly. I'm not the happiest people in the world that it happened. But there were some benefits, like you said, and I'm I'm mad at myself for not taking more advantage of the uh, lack of traffic on the roads because we don't, we don't have days like that very often in this city. No, it felt like old Boston. Like, I mean, you know, flying up and down Mopac. Um, it, it reminded me of how great it was when there weren't a lot of people here. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, uh, last night, uh, UConn, dominant over Purdue. It's an interesting game. You know, you and I were on the phone talking for like the first 10 minutes of game time last night, and it was back and forth, and it's like, all right, Purdue's got a shot here. They're hanging with UConn. These two teams looked evenly matched, but then UConn just does what it does, and 
they dominated. They turned it on towards the end of the first half. They pulled away in the second half. I mean, you really knew the outcome of the game with like 10 minutes left. UConn wins 75-60, to 60, the final score. Back-to-back national championships for the Huskies. First team since Florida in 06 and 07 to go back-to-back. Uh, and, of course, UConn won every game by double digits. They actually set a tournament record in terms of point differential. They outscored their opponents by an average of 22.3 points per game in this year's tournament, which was somehow more impressive than last year's run where they beat everybody by double digits. UConn goes back-to-back. Danny Hurley has that team rolling, and well, they are the class of college basketball right now, KD. No, they are. I mean, they, they, they you know, to go back-to-back, um, and we can get into eras here in a little bit, but um, they're really impressive. He's a damn good coach. Uh, defensively, they're really good. You know, every time someone would make a run on them in this tournament or really all year long, they just seem to have an answer. And, and you know, it gets down to two or three and then boom, back up to six or eight. Um, I love the sets they run, you know, especially out of timeouts. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they always have something dialed up. He's a hell of a coach. I, I'd be curious if Kentucky, you know, I'm sure they're going to try and make a run at him if he makes that move. But there's no doubt they're the class of college basketball right now. And one thing I really did like about college basketball this year was there was more of an inside-outside game. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the complaints about the NBA. The NBA has never been as skilled as it is right now. It is amazing, at, you know, the skill level of of – so many guys in that league the athleticism the size but it's just too many threes for me just aesthetically it is and i understand that you can say the same thing about baseball well, baseball is just too much you know guys just swinging for the fences and it go- comes down to the analytics of it so i understand why people are doing it but with that said it doesn't change the fact that at least for my eyeballs and i think a lot of people um the inside outside game you know working through the post and then getting other stuff set up is, is for me a more enjoyable brand of basketball. And we saw that we saw that with college basketball this year with with a lot of different teams. Yeah. Those two teams, especially, right. I mean, Purdue's offense last night was an inside inside offense. Like they were just getting the ball to Edie and hoping he was going to score. Like that was their entire game plan. Nobody else showed up last night. For Purdue, it was yep. weird to see. They only took seven threes. I thought they needed to make ten threes for them to have a shot. They only made one. They only took seven. And credit UConn for doing a great job of running Purdue off the line. But my God, I mean, if you want to hang with a team like that, you've got to be able to knock down some threes. And for Purdue to not even try, that was a little silly. But yeah, UConn's ball movement was ridiculous. And there were there was like a ten minute stretch in the second half, KD, where, where UConn took the lead and kind of pulled away where they were just getting wide open look after wide open look. I mean, a lot of dunks, but if they weren't dunks, they were just wide open threes and, and Purdue was just getting spun around. Like they, they, it almost looked like five on four the way it was going for UConn. And that just goes to what you're talking about of, of Dan Hurley's genius. Just the, the chemistry of that team. You don't see it much in today's college basketball because of one and done because of the portal. Yeah, the UConn, I mean, they're like the Golden State Warriors out there. They just all know where everybody is going to be at all times and nobody else in the country has that, and it's why they are in a class of their own right now. You hit the nail on the head right there, man. I mean, the way they cut, the way they move together, you know, the the beautiful thing about basketball is basketball is like, you know, the only thing I've compared it to is like an offensive line. When you see five guys that have played together for a long time, they they just – and it's even more important in basketball because just the way the game is, is built. When guys are cutting and moving – in unison, all five of them, um, and they're finding each other. I mean, like like you said, they got got a, you know some really good looks on some easy buckets and some dunks. But I mean, some wide open threes. Um, yeah, they they're well coached. But a lot of that too is those guys playing together and understanding each other. I mean, they, they were they were the best team in the country. They you know they deserve to cut down the nets. And man, only the third time in our lifetime someone's gone back to back. It's crazy. And, and they were talking about it on the broadcast last night, right? Grant Hill, of course, was a part of that Duke back-to-back team. And he's like, well, we we pretty much had the same team year over year. Yeah. And you go back to Florida in 06, 07, like it was pretty much the same team year over year when they went back-to-back. I and mean, UConn lost five of its top eight scorers 
from last year, and they were even better this year. Like, they were a four seed last year. They just got hot at the right time. This year, they were the overall number one, and they were number one in the land for most of the regular season, and they still found a way to get it done. So that's, like, that's the more impressive part of this thing for me is that it, there were a lot of new faces on that UConn team, and they were even more dominant than last year's squad. Totally agree. Yeah, you would think that, you know, they at least had would have three or four of the, you know, guys back or whatever, but that wasn't the case. So I think it speaks to Hurley. And, you know, I mean, it's it's what Texas is trying to deal with and what everyone's trying to deal with, building a new roster every year and then building chemistry within that. But you're going to have some misses, but, you, you know, trying to project how certain guys are going to come in, fit in your system and fit with the pieces that you have. That's not easy. Um, that's not easy at all. And, and you're, I mean, I don't blame some of these coaches that end up missing. It's like, well, that looked good in, you know, June when you got those two guys, but it just didn't work. You know, they got on the court and it didn't work. And I think we saw some of that at UT this last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you tell me if I'm being naive or foolish here. Like I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you this year's UConn team could beat some of the best college basketball teams ever. That's that's ridiculous, and I know some folks will go prisoner of the moment and start trying to make those comparisons, but I just feel like the style of basketball that this UConn team played could hang in any generation of college basketball. Am I am I on base saying something like that? Yeah, I think you are. Um, I mean, they're good, you know, and like you said, the style, they have size, so a lot of these teams now um, – or would be like Houston would be laughably small against teams that I grew up watching. I mean, mm -hmm. te Texas had six, what, six, nine Panama Myers and six, eight Loxley Collie. And we were laughably undersized that we just knew you're going to run it. I mean, you know, you'd run it. Uh oh. KD has gone black. Not in an offensive way. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. All good. I was getting a call, uh, work call. Um, <laughs> I always forget they're on your phone on this deal. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, but we were laughably undersized, and that's where they wouldn't be, you know, um, clinging, right? I mean, he, he's really good defensively, too. Yeah. The way he, he'll hedge, and then, you know, and that gets back to your chemistry, the way that they kind of help each other out and do all that. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, is it one of the top 10 teams I've ever seen? No, it's not. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they'd get laughed off the court at all. You know, I yeah. mean, I mean, I think they could play with teams. Right. Now they've got a little bit of everything and they've got a bunch of different ways to beat you and they're hard to game plan against. Cause it's not just, okay, let's stop this one guy and we're going to be fine. It's, well, if we try to focus our attention on this guy, then they've got three or four other guys who can go for 20 on any yep. given night. So, yep. yeah, Tristan Newton was the leading scorer last night. The El Paso kid, he had 20 points. He was named most outstanding player. But, I mean, Cam Spencer was great. Castle was great. Caravan didn't have to do that much, but he's been no. great all year. Klingon, as you mentioned. I mean, that guy, that guy's Rudy Gobert to me. Uh, or gives you a little bit offensively, but he's just, he's an elite defender and rim protector. Yeah. Um, and you know, Zach Eady was able to score a lot of points. He had to work for his points, but Klingon was doing a great job in off ball defense too, helping out against some of Purdue's guards when they were trying to penetrate down low. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a really good team. They're really well coached. And uh, how about UConn, man? I mean, they like for a large portion of your life, they, they weren't, much and since 1999 they've won six national champions they've been to six final fours since 99 and they've won the championship every time they've been there that in itself is pretty remarkable yeah they have really owned this sport since the turn of the century yeah i mean i look i remember when jim calhoun was building that and texas played him a couple times because penders was here but really it felt like it was like 90 on they had a guy named tate george on the 90 team and um, they actually almost beat one of those Duke teams in Leitner's freshman year. So it wasn't, it wasn't one of the national championship teams. Leitner's freshman year hit a, uh, I think it would have been 90, hit a game winner in the tournament to beat them. But you can see they were building it. But like, you know, UConn and UMass, like for somebody who grew up watching college sports and college basketball, but also grew up in Texas, I was like, UConn, Connecticut? You know, Connecticut was like Rhode Island. It, it felt like, you know, 
it was like a fart in the wind. Um, it was so small. It's like, what is that? The size of Bastrop, you know? Um, and <laughs> the fact that they've been able to build that and, and, you know, obviously, you know, did it like you have to do it in college basketball. So I'm sure, sure people would be like, eh, there's some shady stuff going on there. Yeah, there was, but I don't, it's impressive what they've done. And, and I mean, look, when you think of the state of Connecticut, that's what you think of, right? Sure. I mean, yeah. you think you think of you know the both basketball programs. I was gonna say, like for as good as the men's program has been, I think the women have ten titles yeah. since the turn of the century. So, like Gino, the goat of women's college basketball coaches, I mean, he's what he's done has been more impressive than what UConn men have been able to do since uh, ninety nine. So, yeah, yeah when, when you can't you know when you think college basketball, forget the state. You think college basketball, like you you got to start thinking of UConn. And I'm glad I'm glad UConn is a th- like I'm glad that nickname exists because Connecticut would not sound nearly as cool. I don't know the origin of UConn, but I'm glad that's what they go by versus literally just calling themselves Connecticut. That ain't fun. Yeah, I don't know if they took that from UMass. You know, Dr. J played at UMass, so UMass would have been a bigger name than than Connecticut was um, as a school or a basketball school, but. Yeah, I, I don't know if they took that from that, but you're exactly right. UConn's so much better than, you know, Connecticut. Yeah, thousand percent. A thousand percent. All right, quick. Hey, uh, yeah. What are you thinking about next year for UT? I was looking at a way too early top 25 and one, and uh, it was Gary Parrish, and he's got Texas at 24. Um, you know, it, I, the kids have to go to school now for at least one year, so they're going to get Trey Johnson, and – you know, I guess you what you lose A. Smith and DeSue, that doesn't help. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Like these way too early polls always feel way too early, but in today's college basketball, I mean it's there's almost no point at all. Like yeah. I don't I don't know if Texas could field a starting five right now with the scholarship right. players that they have. So it's damn near impossible to figure out what this roster is going to look like. And it's just a total guess. Like in football, you know, who's leaving, you know, who's coming back, you know, for the most part, what the roster is going to look like for any specific team when you do these way too early polls, but now with college basketball, you just, you don't have any clue. So uh, yeah, I'd like to think Texas can be a top 25 team next year. Uh, I, I would guess that they're probably right around 20 to 30 in terms of like the preseason poll. So they're either barely in or barely out in the first AP poll, but I, I don't know what the roster is going to look like. I mean, Trey Johnson may be the best player on this team next year as a true freshman. He's a projected lottery pick two years from now. He should be really good. Got a couple of other freshmen coming in that could be impact players early on, but you can't just win with freshmen. You look at the schools that win national championships and they're loaded with experience. And uh, well, Texas is going to have to get some of that experience from the tr- transfer portal. So yeah, it depends on what Rodney Terry does. I mean, Texas was right around there to start this season. Um, and it depends on who Texas is able to go snag from the transfer portal to see what I think they're going to be and what everyone else thinks they're going to be in 24-25. But Houston returns almost everyone, don't they? Uh, yeah, they've got a few guys with decisions to make. Um, you know, you still got that one extra COVID year that you could use for next year. So it still feels like nobody actually has to graduate and leave, which doesn't make any sense. But Houston, Houston should be really good again next season. Who's uh who else is in the t- I'm sure UConn's there. Duke's probably there. Do you have sure. the whole list in front of you? Yeah, they got Houston one, Carolina two, Iowa State three, Auburn four, Kansas five. How do you how do you not have UConn in there? They've got UConn at eight. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like this, the ranking is based on Dan Hurley's Huskies returning five of the top nine scores. It's like, yeah, well, um, yeah, you're right. I don't know. I don't know how you wouldn't have them higher. They got Duke six, Arizona seven. So it's a lot of the same familiar faces. Iowa State, though, at three. Texas will not have to deal with them next year. So that'll be nice. Yeah. 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 That's a uh, uh, look. The SEC had a pretty good year in college basketball, but everybody who keeps up with the sport knows that Texas is uh, getting a little bit of a reprieve going from the Big 12 to the SEC. 
most sports, it's the opposite. This one, it's not that. Yeah, Iowa State's good. I mean, Lipsy and, and Gilbert, I think, could both come back. Maybe yeah. maybe Lipsy decides to try his hand at the next level. But if those guys do return, then yeah, I mean, Iowa State was a two seed this year. Uh, and they, you know, they won the Big 12 tournament title this year, too. So they're good. But yeah, if, if all those guys, if Shed and Cryer and Sharp all come back for Houston, then uh, they they probably should be the number one team in the country, or at least very close to it, right? Like, I, I'm inclined to say UConn should be number one. They weren't preseason number one this year, and not that people care too much about those polls, but you look dumb for not having the defending champs as the number one team, considering they were the number one team. So I'd, I'd vote for UConn, almost regardless of what happened this offseason. But yeah, Houston too, Carolina being in the mix, Iowa State being in the mix, and then of course your your usual suspects being around there too. That feels that feels pretty fair. Yeah, it does. You know, I am really curious to see how Edie translates to the NBA. You know. Yeah, yeah. Like, what do you what do you think? I mean, seven four. Matt Painter apparently said he's gotten taller over the last month, which I don't know how the hell. Maybe you were telling me that. I don't know how the hell that's possible. That that guy at that height is still growing, and at that age is still growing, but. Maybe he's like seven five, seven six now. Do you think he's got any any shot to do anything in the league? Yeah, Painter, I do. But Painter said that. Painter said before the tournament that he's grown a couple inches over the last couple of months. Like, Jesus, that's like giantism, you know, um, which, which he may have. But, like, yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, obviously the NBA game does not really fit what he does. But I think, I mean, if you're that big and that big of a rim protector and – you know, he's got actually better vision than you would think. Now, yep. you know, he also got in better shape. So he's going to have to continue. He's never going to be super mobile or nimble, but he's going to have to continue to be able to work on his agility, which he worked on in the offseason, and he got better at it. So, yeah, I think he can be, you know, a, a functional guy who can who can definitely help out. I'm looking at a mock draft from CBS Sports, and this was literally posted this morning. So it includes, you know, the results of last night's national championship game. And I see Zach Eady going 22nd overall okay. to New Orleans. So, yeah, th- this is a really bad draft class coming out for the NBA, like historically bad. O- obviously, time will tell. I mean, we could look back right. five years from now and say, oh, shit, this turned out to be one of the best draft classes ever. But, like, on paper going into the draft, this is uh, not a very good year for the NBA. So that, that helps Zach Eady a little bit. I think like last year or in a couple of years, he's, he's a second round pick, uh, but he might be the beneficiary of a little bit of a weaker crop this year. Uh, yeah. Like I, I think, I think of a guy like Boban, you know, yeah, like Boban has had a very long career in the NBA. Now he doesn't play a whole lot. Uh, and I'm sure Zach Eady wants to have a better career than Boban Marjanovic has had. But like Boban being a freakishly tall giant human being has made a lot of money and bounced around the league and has been in the league for like a decade. So I, I think that that's the floor for Zach Eady. I, I for sure think this dude can play in the NBA and can have a career in the league. The question then becomes, yeah, is like, I, I don't know if he'll ever develop a three point shot that scares teams enough to where you have to respect him. Uh, is he is he fast enough defensively and is he quick enough with his feet offensively to where even though you don't have it happen that often where you just lob the ball down to the low block and ask a big man to get you two points is he good enough to do that when you need him to against nba talent i i don't know the answer to that question yeah it's funny man talk about being born in the wrong era it's oh. like the opposite of eric metcalf if metcalf would have been uh in this era um the way people would have utilized them. But yeah, I mean, if he's 25 years ago, he's a, probably the number one overall pick. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. I mean, UConn's got like all sorts of NBA talent on its roster, right? Like they, they could have three guys go in the, in the top 20 this year. Uh, and he, you know, he went what 37 and 10 last night against them. And he was going up against an NBA big and Donovan Klingon, who's one of the best defenders in college basketball. And he was pretty damn good offensively last night. So yeah, like I, I think the the strong tournament performance that Zach Eady had is going to help him creep into the first round. But I just, I don't know. I like someone will take a chance on him. Someone will give him a shot. But I'm not expecting him to be an All NBA player or an All Star or anything like that. I just, 
I think he's a bench player in the league and maybe has a couple of good years and can turn in a decently long career. Some people think he's like headed for Europe right away. Like, no, nah, I think I think he can stick around in the league if he wants to, but I don't think he's going to be anywhere close. I don't think anybody thinks he's going to be anywhere close to the player he's been in college the last couple of seasons. No, I I mean he he won't. It's just a different, you know, the yeah. NBA is so different that um, yeah. but but he he was a, he was a lot of fun to watch, man. I mean, it is it is fun watching a different style of ball that kind of you know for us old heads takes us back a little bit, you know, for especially sure. in college because it's one thing in the NBA you have the best shooters in the world, and I understand, you know, maybe not taking as many threes as some of these teams do, but I understand the philosophy behind it. But it's like anything in life. I mean, you get to, you know you end up getting down below, you know, any level and people just aren't as good. I mean, you know, you got to be careful with launch angle outside of the major leagues, you know, you get yeah. down to college baseball and it's like, well, you're not as skilled of a hitter as this person. So, um, you know, I, and I think we see that with some of the, you know, some of these guys that are just continue to jack shots up and it's like, dude, like you're not on tonight. Tonight's not the night to be shooting threes. Go ahead and put the ball on the floor and get in there. Yeah. How about Jason's comment? Proof that Zach Eady would be the number one pick 25 years ago. Yao Ming was the number one pick 22 years ago. Great and call. They're, and they're built the same. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I mean, Yao, a little bit more established, a little bit more skilled than Zach Eady, I think, at this stage. But nah, it's, it's the wrong era. Like, Yao would not be 1 1 right now in today's NBA. No. Like he was 22 years ago. So that's a, it's a great call there, Jason. Yeah. Uh, I all right. I don't know about if, that. Yeah. I don't know if you have a text or anything to send right now. I got a couple of sponsor shout outs to go through. Yeah. I've gotten three calls. So I apologize. Let me call them back and say, I'll be back in, in 20 minutes. Take well, it. I'll be back with you in one minute, but I'll, I'll call them in 20 minutes. Very good. All right. Take it, take it. There goes KD. He'll be back in a second right now. We'll give some love to some of our great sponsors who will have for this to happen first off a word from our friends out at covert bk hi i'm dan covert with my wife hayden welcome to covert bk our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes buick gmc cadillac chrysler dodge jeep and ram and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from we have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car truck or suv with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed. Love the coverts. Also love audiovisual consultations. I was talking to Tom McKay earlier today. What do you say? And I told him about Letitia Jones, you know, the winner of our TSU bracket challenge. And he's like, I thought Bucky won. And I'm like, well, yeah, Bucky won. But he said he didn't want the TV. He wanted whoever finished in second to get the grand prize. And Tom's like, mm, I don't know if we can do that. It's like, come on, Tom. He was like, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, love AV consultations. Tom's a great guy, a great friend. And yeah, he came through. He was hooking up a TSU listener with that 65 inch TV. Congrats to Letitia for winning our Texas Sports Unfiltered Bracket Challenge. And Tom McKay always comes through for the people. If you didn't win, well, you could still win by calling. AV Consultation, 512-255-8678. That's the phone number to call if you are looking for the home TV setup of your dreams. If you want multiple screens on one wall like I have, they can make it happen. If you want a home theater room, if you want the giant big screen TV in the living room with the surround sound, they can do it. Patio setups, whatever. AV Consultations has been getting it done in Central Texas since 1988. They can get it done for you as well. Just tell them what you're looking for, and they will make it happen. 512-255-8678. That's for audio, visual consultations, and also some love to Altstat Beer, the absolute best beer that you can find here in Austin, Texas, and all throughout the state of Texas. You can find it in the Metroplex. You can find it in the Houston area. You can find it in San Antonio, and this stuff is growing like crazy with good reason. It is a damn good beer. Beer. So next time you're at the grocery store, next time you're at the liquor store, hell, next time you're at the convenience store, make sure you're looking around for Altstadt. Don't waste your time with the big name beer brands. Other craft beers, they just don't get it done. They don't hit the same. Altstadt will always hit the way you want it to. One sip and you won't go back to the other beers that you have been drinking in the past. It is Altstadt beer. No impurities. 
no regrets. When I'm not drinking Altstead, I am drinking Olipop. Great tasting soda that's actually good for you. It's a game changer. It really is. If you haven't tried Olipop yet, you are missing out. I'm hooked on it. The Buck is hooked on it. Chip Brown is hooked on it. Rodney, we got a bunch of Olipop drinkers now on TSU, and a bunch of y'all have been uh, texting in and commenting about how much you love Olipop as well. If you haven't tried it yet, you are missing out. Pick it up wherever you get your groceries. It is Olipop. All right, KD. Uh, while I've got you, no, if there's something else you want to hit, then – no, no. Things. What do you get? What do you, I mean? I, I do at some point want to get into yeah. all the, and we may not have time today, maybe some other day, um, all the pitching injuries. Cause I, you know me, I mean, I love, I love bigger overview stories. Um, and that is a, that is a huge thing that we got to get to. So, you know, I think like a lot of things, there's a lot of things that go into it, but, um, you know, baseball's funny just as they're making a little bit of a resurgence. I'm not trying to act like they're getting to the NFL because there's miles in between them um, in terms of popularity. But, you know, they're losing all these arms, dude. They, they can't they you, you can't lose your best players uh, getting back to college basketball. You can't lose your best players and, and still be as popular. Yeah, well, there's your NFL comparison. And, and I, I've got to do a little bit more research on the topic. We could talk about it now, though. Um, cause yeah, I mean, we've had Shane Bieber, I think the latest great pitcher to succumb to a season ending injury. He's going to have to get Tommy John and he's one of the best pitchers in all of baseball and, you know, Cleveland's off to a decent start. And now it feels like they're in trouble without him, uh, to, to follow up on your sort of football comparison, like fans don't always love it, but the NFL is smart because they, they have rules in place to protect their best players, AKA the quarterbacks yep. and the fans learn to like it. And, and, and fans, I think smart fans are smart enough to realize that, okay, yeah, these rules kind of suck. And why can't we hit the quarterback? But it's also like, okay, well, if the quarterback's not on the field, the, the sport's not nearly as fun. Like turn on the UFL right now, watch the quarterback play and then get back to me on why football, why the NFL has the rules in place to protect the quarterbacks. Like you need those guys because they are the best players in the sport. Feels like baseball KD should be doing more to protect its pitchers. And I don't know if it's all MLB's fault. It almost feels like a sport wide issue at this point, but they're clearly not. And guys are going down seemingly more than ever before. That that's really well said. I don't, I'm not sure you need too much more time because that, that's a good comparison. And I really hadn't, I mean, I hadn't thought of the NFL, but you're exactly right. That was a two for one for the NFL because the NFL got, the NFL got boring. It, it, as much as I love football, it, it, it got the, you know, as I always say, the Jamal Lewis 30, you know, 28 rushes and he went for 109 yards. What a, what a, what a day. Are you kidding me? We were watching <laughs> Barry Sanders go for two and a half bills. That was a day, all right? Yeah. Um, but it just, you know, it, it, it was too clogged up. And the the dimensions hadn't gotten any bigger. And the athletes were just getting bigger, stronger, faster. So the defenses were just wrecking shop. And, and what they did is, for safety, because they also they need their best players out there, and they're worried about class action lawsuits, um, they changed the rules. And that's exactly what they did. But it was a two for one because it opened up the offense and it, it it at least gave them a better chance of keeping their their talent, their stars, the reason the asses are there, the reason people are watching on the field, which is mm -hmm. kind of important. You know, I mean, whenever you've got a backup, I don't know. What do they call them? Uh, I'm not a big theater guy. You're not either. But whatever, like the, uh, you know, the second string is like, you know, doing a show, whatever. Well, it's not going to be as good as, you know, whenever the first string. God, I, I, you can tell. I don't, I don't no. know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, it, that's true in anything, you know. Um, you know, if you've got your usual electrician that comes over and they've got the new kid who comes over, you're like, oh, fuck. I wonder, you know, is this guy. That's true in every industry, but certainly any creative, artistic or entertainment in this industry You've got to have your best people on there. Um, baseball is, it, it does start at the very, very, um, the understudy. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, I, I knew there was something else, the understudy. Um, 
baseball, it starts at, at, at a very young age in terms of the issues. Um, you know, guys are, are maxing out and trying to throw as hard as they can. And also, I mean, there, there, I, I think this is few and far between, but there are parents that had no problem getting Tommy John surgery because he's going to throw a little bit harder. Right. I mean, that, that became such a norm and, and, you know, for the Johnny baseball dad, who's over the top. Um, I mean, I heard stories about that. They're like, yeah, I mean, they kind of, you know, kind of wanted them to get TJ. And it's like, what? You don't want, you don't want to have to get TJ, you know? Yeah, no, um, but it starts at the, at the select league. I think these guys are playing too much, to be honest. I don't think they're practicing enough. And especially with arms, I think they're, they're, they're playing too much at a young age and they're gassing it up and they're maxing out. And then we're seeing that at every single level. I mean, you look at the velocity in baseball now. When I was a kid, if you threw 95, you were gassing it up. Fucking everyone throws 95 now. I yeah. mean, you know, if you throw 93, you're a soft tosser. Um, and so, I, obviously, mixing pitches, you know, I don't see as many guys who can really pitch now. I see a lot of guys who can throw. And even at the top level. And so, you know, the teams look for that, getting back to analytics, just like with basketball, um, with baseball, they're looking for guys that, that can really throw hard and they're just cycle through them. Um, I've heard the pitch clock being, you know, used as a reason, um, maybe a little bit, but it, it, that's not the, that's not the main culprit. The main culprit is these guys maxing out, man. So is there, is there anything major league baseball can do? Because like you, you've studied this more than I have, but like that, what I have studied kind of tells me the same thing. Like this is something that starts when these guys are kids and it just gradually gets worse. The more they pitch, the more stress they put on their arm and the older they get is, is there anything MLB can do about this? Like I, they could reduce the number of games in a year. So guys don't have to pitch as much. Is there something maybe less drastic than that? Like how, as nobody, nobody really cares. Like, obviously, if you're a parent of a child, you, you care. If you're the teammate of a pitcher whose arm gets hurt in high school, you care. But in terms of, like, really affecting the popularity of the sport, it really only matters at the big league level. Is there anything the big league level can do to try to get around this? Dude, it's a great question, and and I, I don't have a, uh, a good answer. I guess I don't have a great answer. I don't. I, I barely have an answer. Um, I, I don't know. Um because, I mean, at the big league level, it's not like you can say you can't put a speed limit on there. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And and like any sport, you know, it's going to be so competitive that it's that they're going to they're going to want guys. They can do that. And so I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I mean, I know the answer starts at the um, when they're kids in terms of taking care of the arm. And, you know, like we weren't we weren't allowed to throw curveballs until we we're really 13 or 14. There were a couple kids that did, but like my dad wouldn't let me do that um, until your plate had really fully grown and matured. So, you know, I mean, I, that was something that taking care of our arms we did back in the day. Um, but in terms of velocity and maxing out. I mean, it's got to be a philosophical change and it's got to be really learning how to pitch and not maxing out, you know, and not trying to throw as hard as you can every single pitch that, of course, is going to wear on your arm. If you take your car out and turn and burn every single time you drive, the tires are going to go to shit quicker. Yeah. And yeah, the car was, well said. You know. Oh, um, yeah. Everything. I don't know. Like, do you shit. have any? Like, what can they do? I, I don't know. Like, I mean, it, it to me, you know, the problem isn't complicated. It's guys trying to make seven, eight, nine figures uh, just maxing out. It's like, oh, man, if I if I lay off for one pitch, some guy might hit a home run off of me, and that might cost me my chance to make it to the big leagues. Yeah, That might cost me my second contract. So it's just, I mean, these guys are trying to throw a ball with wicked spin as hard as possible, and the human body is not meant for that. So... It's, it's almost amazing. Like, as much as these injuries happen to me, it's amazing that every pitcher doesn't get hurt every time they go out there and take the mound. 
Yeah. Because of just how crazy, like the, the amount of torque and, and pressure that is, they're putting on their arms literally every time they throw one of these baseballs. So clearly I don't have a solution. I'm, I'm just like explaining like why this is happening. And I, I'm almost amazed once again, that it doesn't happen more often than it actually does. But yeah, like I, I, I don't see it changing. It, you, you can't get everybody on board. It would take like right. every youth coach and every parent to be like, Hey, let's all come together. I mean, shit, no one agrees on anything. You know this better than like, no one agrees on shit nowadays. This would take right. literally 100% of the people coming together and saying that we're not going to make our kids, we're not even going to teach our kids how to throw a curveball until they get to high school. We're not going to, you know, have our kids maxing out their arms and trying to throw it as fast as they can when they're eight years old. Like, we're, uh, there's going to be this universal program that we all do. And then that will prevent the injuries like that. That's the way to do it. But there's no way in heaven, hell or earth that that will ever happen. I, you know, it, but yeah, you're exactly right. But even like little league now, I mean, it, I felt like the parents were too into it when I was a kid and I got a couple of buddies that I'll talk to and I swear to God, they're at games every single day. You know, one has two kids and he's at a game every single day and, the, and they're six and eight. Like, what are you doing? Let the kid go out, stare at the clouds, play some, you know, yard baseball. Um, but I'll hear other parents, um, and I can't believe just how over the top they are. And these these are just little kids. So, I, you know, getting back to your competitive deal, of course, you'd have to legislate it. I don't know how you would, and I don't like over legislation at the MLB level because you have 30 clubs. And you've got guys that are trying to make life-changing money. So, yeah. you know, I mean, most of these guys, if you ask Spencer Strider, who's going to have his second Tommy John now because he had one at Clemson. If you ask him, you know, because he ended up signing, taking one of those deals, was it worth it? He's going to go, hell yeah, it was worth it. You huh. kidding? I'm set for life. My kids are set for life. So, yeah, you know what? I got a scar right here and, you know, it was worth it. So. You know, not only the at the club level, but the player level, like they're not going to stop doing that. And if you got 15 on board, the other 15 are going to say, guess what? You know, it's it's like the SEC in, in football with the way they were cheating forever. Um, you know, it's like, you know, if you guys don't want to play this game for ethics and because you care about academics and your university and all that stuff, you know, we've got no problem playing ball. Trust me. And now it's just going to be not as competitive. We win. Um, so I, I don't know, you'd have to legislate it, but I don't know how you do it. Um, like I, I don't see it changing BK. Yeah. Student athletes, that whole bit. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll do some research next time you and I talk on here. We'll, uh, you know, hopefully I'll have more to bring to the table on, on potential solutions, but okay. now, uh, now Astros fans got to worry about it too. Right. Fromber was scratched from his start last night and the Astros are saying it's, it's minor. They didn't even put him on the IL. Like they DFA'd some reliever, but uh, this is usually how it starts. Like, oh, guy has soreness in his arm or in his shoulder or in his elbow, wherever. And then it's like, oh, it's no big deal. He's perfectly fine. And then like two weeks later, oh, no, nope, we're going to have to shut him down for the rest of the season. Like, yeah. I obviously hope that doesn't happen. And love Frombert, one of the best pitchers in baseball. Incredibly fun to watch. Guy's a warrior on the mound. And the Astros, you know, probably need him uh, if they're trying to win another World Series. So I hope that's not the case. But it, God, it does feel like more often than not that that's kind of the timeline when you you hear a guy get scratched due to soreness. Every time I hear the soreness, it's not a big deal. That is the, you know, we're still going to stay together. We're going to, it's going to work out, but we just need a break, you know? Yeah. You, you get the break in a relationship. <laughs> it, it ain't working out long term. Something bad's coming here. Um, so, yeah, it, you're exactly right. I mean, I don't know what the percentages are, but more times than not, you're going under the knife, Dad, buddy. You're going under the knife. And yeah, Framber would be huge. But I, I saw a list this morning on MLB of the amount of guys that are out and for a sport that's trying to rehab and is, is you know, is – on its way up a little bit. It's not, it's not like that, but it's starting to, you know, starting to get a little bit more popularity. Um, you just can't lose 
guys, man. You know, because what, what's the first thing you look at? Like, let's say you and I, I got a buddy who's going to the Reds game today. He's in Cincinnati with his wife uh, working. And um, I, I, first thing I did was pitching matchup. Who's going? You know? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's what you look at. If, if you and I were going to the Astros Rangers game, you know, first thing I'd look at is who's scheduled starters. Who's going? Yep. You're right. It's a great point. They're incredibly important to the success of baseball. And boy, we're what three weeks in, not even three weeks in to the MLB season. And the two biggest storylines in the sport are Shohei Otani's gambling problem, or sorry, his interpreter's gambling problem. <laughs> and all of these star players getting hurt like that. Yeah. You're right. It's a sport that's not dying, but it, you know, it hasn't been doing as great as other sports in recent years. And it's a sport you and I care a whole hell of a lot about. And you and I right. really want this thing to not only last for a long time, but thrive for a long time. And when those are your biggest headlines at the beginning of a year, when people are supposed to be like amping up your sport and promoting it and talking about how great it is. And now oh, thank God it's back. Instead, we're discussing all of this other shit and this is not an all pub is good pub kind of thing. No, it's not. Um, yeah, it, it's funny. Like two sports that that we both love and were super popular, you know, when I was young, MLB and the NBA have their own issues. But I feel like with both, when they are talked about, like in, in more of a national sense, it's not about what's on the field or on the court. And that's not good for the sport. You know, the NBA is just all is like, you know, this seems like seventh grade cafeteria talk and MLB is just, you know, just bad shit, whether it's Shohei's deal or whether it's talking about injuries. Like people aren't talking about Mike Trout hitting a ball 430 feet, you know? Yeah, you're right. Uh comment from my forte. What if rosters were expanded to increase the number of pitchers on a team and rotations were expanded to where starters pitch every 10 days instead of every fifth day. Like I, hypothetically that would help. Yeah. It's less innings, less wear and tear on a pitcher over the years. Now uh, that that's what MLB could do. And I guess that's the question I asked, but obviously you'd still potentially have issues at the youth level where you're going to, you're going to pitch your best pitcher every two weeks. Yeah. Know how many co coaches or parents are going to be in favor of that, but there's something MLB could do to, to, I guess, mitigate this problem. Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with the roster size. I mean, I, I don't know why the NFL is at 53. You know, I mean, as much money as you're making, they should be at 60. Um, basketball's probably at a pretty good spot. Um, but baseball should expand their rosters. Absolutely, 100% agree with that. I would have agreed with that even without the injuries. But that could help out. Um, yeah, you'd almost have to go to like a Little League. Remember in Little League, there was a, a maximum amount of innings you could throw? Yeah. Per week, I think it was. Um, maybe do that. Um, but the funny thing is, it's not like guys are throwing, you know, it's not not a duration issue. Because guys guys just, you know, guys aren't throwing 150 pitches anymore. Um, it's about the 93 they do throw. <laughs> um, I mean, I would maybe, I would extend the pitch clock. It's been good for the game. But maybe make that a, a little bit longer. Um and then definitely expand the roster size. I mean, I think there's little things like that. That's, that's a good text right there um, that they could do. I don't know. I don't know how impactful it'll be, though. I think all of this goes back to youth baseball and these kids' upbringings, right? Like, yep. you can't sit. You can't sit here and tell me Nolan Ryan wasn't maxing out every single pitch that he threw, and that guy was throwing 150 in certain games. Oh, he was grunt. Do you remember the grunt he had? Yeah. Yeah. Like you you can't tell me back in the day like Cy Young wasn't you know, every other day when he was taking the bump, like wasn't trying to get guys out every single time he pitched. That guy never won a Cy Young, by the way, not even very good. But like you, you can't <laughs> you can't tell me that like dudes weren't trying like they are now and they weren't maxing out on every single pitch. I, th I think it's clear that the problems, like no, Nolan Ryan's youth baseball experience was not the same as Shane Bieber's youth baseball experience. There's no way. So it sucks that MLB has to deal with these problems. They get some of these used up arms, and they're, they're the sport, they're the league that gets impacted the most, and it sucks more for us as fans that we have to deal with this shit, and we get robbed of the chance of watching these guys. But 
don't know, for everyone sitting here blaming MLB, like, look, I don't love Rob Manford at all. I don't want to bootlick here. Uh, they've got tons of other issues and problems and things that I would like to see changed. But I, I think that's what you point to. Like it's that, that is the biggest change in the sport versus what happened back in the day. It's not that guys are maxing out now and they used to not max out in the big leagues. It's that guys are just throwing way too much to get to the big leagues and it has their arms spent. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Now, I mean, that, I think the one thing we can't agree on is that it starts um, at a much younger age and, and taking care of your arm and also really learning how to pitch. Um, one of the things I do love about Verlander who had his own arm issues um, and Verlander, you should check it out. There's like a, he went on a, like a four minute, not rant um, discussion about it. And it was really, really good. Um, like, you know, he, he, da, he doesn't have the answers either, but he kind of got into some of the stuff that we, that we've talked about. I haven't seen all four minutes. I saw it chopped up on uh, MLB this morning, but the stuff that I saw, I was like, wow, I got to go back and look at the whole four minutes because, you know, it, it was um, very thoughtful and mm -hmm. and kind of gets into to what the issues are. But it starts it starts down below and 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 learning how to pitch and not maxing out. But one thing I do like about Verlander is that Verlander and, you know, this, I mean, better than anyone as much as you covered him in Houston. Um like Verlander will be like be sitting at 94 or 95 in the seventh or eighth. And he's got something else in the tank, you yeah. know, for that, that three, two pitch with guys on first and second and a one run game, 90, yeah. you know, and it's like, yeah. where, where has that been, man? Yeah. Some guys, I guess are capable of like getting guys out with 90% of their stuff. And then they've got that extra gear like you talked about, but you know, Justin Verlander is one of the greatest pitchers of all time. There ain't uh, there ain't a lot of dudes like that, unfortunately. That's the other problem. Is it's like, well, let's just go ahead and create a one like Justin Verlander. Uh, okay, good idea, Kev. You know, like, yeah. sounds good. Hey, okay. make him in your video game. You can make right. that happen. You turn off injuries in uh, NCAA. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's that's the right move. It's it's a, it's a video game. It, it's yeah. fake. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have Vince Young go out for the season. You know, sorry, nice. not gonna Agreed. do it. No. Uh, you're you're doing it the right um, way. I do turn on the opponent's injury. I've been able. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if only you could. That would be awesome. All right, I see the guys in the waiting room here. We got right. today. I got I, I got a roll, guys. Great to see y'all. Love y'all. See you, KD. Great show, man. All right, boys. How we doing today? BK, how you doing? Oh, man. Another day in paradise. What about y'all? Oh, yeah, baby. I'm good, baby. man. My eyes are good for not fucking them up by looking at the eclipse without the glasses. So I'm good. I'm living. Mm. I showed you guys yesterday nah. what I saw through my eclipse glasses, right? Yeah. My, my, my eclipse experience was this. So... <laughs> <laughs> These these things are ridiculous, dude. I got conned. Now I paid zero dollars for these, so I'm not losing any sleep over it. But what a crock of crap these things are! Give me a break. Hey, a lot of people's lives were changed after yesterday. I saw a lot of people on Twitter saying, "Man, this has changed my life. I'm a new man. I'm a new person. Looking at life different, more positive." <laughs> you know. Wow. You're kidding. You're yeah. Kidding. Yeah. So some people, this was a life changing moment for them, man. Kudos for those people. Me, not so much, but you know, I'm sure I'll find something later on. Not kudos to those people. Those people yeah. need to yeah. a life. You know what? That's where we're that's where we'll start today. What would be life changing for Zay? I know, like for Chip, life changing. The Detroit Lions win the Super Bowl. That is a life changing, monumental event. Watching the sun and the moon and the sky at the same time, you can see that shit every day. You can see it get dark every day. That's life changing. Oh, my. And I know you're not kidding, Zay. I'm not mad at you because you are not someone who said this, but how is that a life changing event? What happened yesterday? God bless it. Yeah, moved. People are just moved by nature. 
and science, you know. That sucks. All right. I am moving out of y'all's way so y'all can do a show. I'm about to lose my mind on some people on Twitter. So, <laughs> yeah. appreciate you, BK. How's it going, man? Uh... Y'all too. See you. See you, BK. Hey, in the immortal words of Judy Brown, happiness is a choice. We're happy you're spending some time with us, Chip and Zay. Um, on a Tuesday, we got all kinds of things to recap and look forward. That's right. Um, Texas Spring football wise, just got back from talking to Steve Sarkeesian about Saturday's scrimmage. What's up, CB? Um, and of course, we have the the game that we, you know, that's why you listen to Chip and Zay, so you know exactly what's going to happen before it happens. Because uh, the championship game last night between UConn and Purdue played out pretty much exactly the way we said it would, Zay, except UConn didn't even let Purdue hang around until the 10-minute mark of the second half. Um, our buddy, uh, lawyer, he didn't score a point. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's tough. They put the clamps. They put the clamps. They let Edie get what he wanted and they shut down everyone else and they won by what? Three times the spread. Yeah. 15. I mean, so. Yeah, they're one of the best teams that I've ever seen. You know, like, obviously, I've been watching basketball seriously for 25-plus years. And, yeah, they're one of the best basketball teams when it comes to just basketball IQ and ball movement and playing together and playing tenacious defense and following the game plan. Like, Dan Hurley's team is one of the best that I've seen. And, you know, I think it makes it even more remarkable due to them not having big-time, like, NBA talent. I mean – Stefan Castle, he'll go to the league. Donovan Clinkin, they'll go to the league. But those guys, they're not going to be superstars in the association. Like Stefan Castle, he's going to be a good player, but he's going to be a really good role player, 3 and D type guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't necessarily see him, which he could get better. A lot of people do, but I don't necessarily see him being the best player or making max contract money. He's going to be a 10 year guy, 6'6, six, six, crazy athleticism. You know, he's going to fit in a solid. Donovan Klingon. Kind of the same with him. He's a big, so he'll probably come off the bench at the you know, second half of his career. He might start for a little bit, but he's going to have his troubles too just because of where the NBA is at the moment unless if they change the rules. So you think about their best players, Tristan Newton, zero-star player coming out of El Paso. Zero stars. 24-7 sports didn't have him ranked at all. Zero star dude went to Eastern Carolina, played three years. Dan Hurley went and said, You know what? You'd fit in my program. You fit for what I want to do. You're a six, six point guard. You don't jump out the gym. You're not going to dunk on anybody, but you're crafty enough. And with my development and just my coaching, I can make you one of the best point guards. Excuse me, the best point guard in the nation because he won that award, the Bob Cousy Award. Same thing with Cam Spencer. Cam Spencer. Loyola, Maryland, he's from Maryland, zero-star player. Played three years at Loyola, Mary, um, Loyola, Maryland. He was a first-team All-American in the Patriot League, which that's you play those armies and navies and stuff like that, average 18 points a game. Went on the Rutgers, did well there for his last year grad season. Dan Hurley's like, hey, you can fit perfect in my system. We just won a championship last year. I just lost the NBA uh, level shooting guard and Jordan Hawkins. Doesn't matter. Get on the squad. We're going to make it work with you. And Cam Spencer, he's one of my favorite players probably in the last 10 years. I love Cam Spencer. I know I talk about him a lot on here. I don't know how you find guys like that, Chip. Like they're, I don't think they're around, but again, the dude can't jump over a Sunday paper. The dude's out here getting rebounds 
physical, falling on the ground, talking shit, hitting big threes. His footwork is crazy. When he gets in the paint, he's pump faking like three or four times. And then Zach Eady on that fourth time will finally jump and then he'll dish it off to Klingon. Like he's just so skilled, man. Like that's everything that you want in the basketball player is Cam Spencer. Like college basketball player, if you had a definition of what a college basketball player at the guard position with zero athleticism was supposed to look like, but absolutely dominates, Cam Spencer is that dude. He was that good. And if you go back to when the Horns played him, because I know everybody's trying to, you know, take that as a dub that the Horns lost to him by 10 early in the season. Well, first off, they didn't have Stefan Castle, so he's kind of a big deal for their team. The dude's going to be a lottery pick, but still. They only lost by 10. Remember that game, Chip? Alex Caravan dropped 20. Cam Spencer gave him 16 of some just nasty, filthy, timely buckets. And, yeah, Dan Hurley, he put, got that big old gumbo pot with all that talent and all that just, you know, ability, height, size, and put it together. And you're a back-to-back champion for a blue blood in UConn. Very impressive showing last night. Good stuff, say. Well, you know, good stuff right do. there. This is what I do. Come on, that's what we do. We here. Provide the backstory. Way to go beneath the surface. Yeah. Way to dig deeper. Yeah. Take us inside, as opposed to just telling us what the box score says. Yeah, but that—that's it. But it always comes back to Coach Terry, Chip. It always comes back to okay, they're out there. If you're finding guys like Cam Spencer in the freaking Patriot League. This is the Patriot League. They say you're not going to the Pac-12. You're not going to the Big Ten. You're not going to one of these power six schools and bringing guys in. You're finding guys from the smallest mid-major that you can find and plugging them into your system and making it work. Like, that's where we are. That's why John Calipari is going off to Fayetteville because he's starting to realize, oh, man, Dan Hurley has the formula. You get a couple of guys, maybe a McDonald's All-American. One is cool. Bring in a guy like Donovan Klingon, who is from that New England area. He never played on a AAU team that was sponsored by a shoe company. There's all these Nike, Under Armour, Adidas. They all have their own select team leagues. And depending on the region or state that you live in, that's the specific team that you could play on. So for – Example, Houston's Nike team is the Houston Hoops. They've been around since I was a kid. I used to play the Houston Hoops all the time when I was in grade school. They've become a Nike club select team. There's those everywhere. And they have these leagues like the EYBL where you have tournaments and these coaches get to see you. And obviously, if you're a university that is sponsored by these schools like UT with uh, with Nike and all these other schools like Oklahoma with Jordan and stuff, you're going to be it's going to be easier to recruit those kids that play in the Nike league. Donovan Klingon never played in that. He played in the ordinary hometown select team, but he was seven foot. He wasn't a five-star, kind of like Zach Eady was never a five-star, but you're like, oh, he's seven foot. We could work with him. We could. You can't teach height. You can't teach size. But you have to have the discipline and the patience to develop those guys. A lot of guys don't have that. A lot of guys want to win now, and they want to bring in those five stars and the best guys in the transfer portal and stuff. And, yeah, that's cool. You want that, but sometimes you really got to dig deep. You really got to go through the grind and try to find guys, even if their statistics don't pop out there, that still fit in your system and they could thrive at a bigger place, even though they weren't doing that at their other stop. You know what I'm saying? So, Dan Hurley, say what you want about him. He is a little arrogant. He'd be throwing up the three. And you see he pushed Spencer when Spencer was on the court yesterday. And he was talking shit to Zach Eady. Like, this dude, Dan Hurley, he, he's an out-of-control human being. But the dude could coach. The dude could flat-out coach. And his offense is one of the best that I've seen in a very long time, especially with the personnel that he has. So, again, RT – you know, you bring in certain guys like IT Horton, you can't have those fails no more. You can't have like Zirik Oyama, you can't have those fails no more. You know, like that's just especially with the hot seat that you're on. If our if RT has a bad year coming into the SEC and we named all of the 
really, really good coaches in this conference yesterday, then, hey, he could be on his way out and they could be looking for another guy. Like, that's just what it is. I hate to say it, but that's just what it is. The resources are way too good at Texas to be, you know, mediocre. So, yes, there's promise there, but, man, there, there's guys everywhere. There are players everywhere, and not everybody's going to fit, but, hey, you got to see what works, and you got to do your due diligence when it comes to your scouting report and all that stuff and trying to grade guys, and hopefully. And that's, a, that's what we were talking about. You got to know exactly what you're looking for so that when you go talk to these guys, you can convince them that you're the guy to take them to the next level in a program that's going to play in the NCAA tournament, hopefully play for championships. You have to know exactly who you are. You have to be able to sell that vision. And that, it didn't work last year for RT when he tried to get the nun kid who ended up at Baylor, um, the nun kid who was at VCU. And the mom Lachovich kid who went to Iowa State. You know, RT has got to get his message down. He's got to know exactly what he's looking for so that he can find those those diamonds in the rough, like um Danny Hurley did and finding, you know, Tristan Newton and and on and on because you're right. I mean, the clock is ticking and they did a good job. They found Max A. Smith. That's great. Yeah. But you, you're you right. You can't miss on IT Horton. You can't miss on Zarek on Yemma. Uh, they hit on Caden Shedrick. He was good when he was healthy and he's coming back for a sixth year and hopefully he's healthier from the beginning. He was coming off double shoulder surgery, which is weird and rare, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. This was like, where, where do you find guys like Diaria, number ten, their backup point guard? How tough is he? Like he's the prototypical New York point guard, you know, just tough as hell, absolutely fearless. Like he doesn't push the needle for NBA scouts or anything, but he's perfect for your off the bench point guard. He's a well, great like defender, when... and he doesn't miss open shots. Like, and he's a great passer. What else could you want in the off the bench point guard? Well, it was like Jerome Tang getting Marquise Noel. Yeah. You know, who's an undersized guy who some Yo. programs weren't willing to take a chance on. That dude was as tough as they come. Where's he from? New York oh, City. Yeah, Where's New York City. Ty Ziegler from New York City. Go there, Rodney. Like, they still got guys. It might not be that same aura mecca where guys like Stefan Marbury and Kenny Anderson were coming out and just, you know, coming out of Coney Island and all that stuff. But you're still going to find dudes that just know ball, that were, you know, grew up playing in 15 degree weather when it's sleeting and snowing on the court. And they're just saying, hey, who got next? I don't care about this weather. We playing pickup. That's just what it is. You need those dudes. They might be undersized. So what? If they could play, they could play. Like Max Aismas proved that even though he was undersized, he could hoop. You know what I'm saying? Like there's just – but Max Aismas, that dude being your best player, not so much. Love Max Aismas. He can't be your best player. To be honest, he can't really even be your third best – or uh, second best player that you better have a lot of other guys around him if he's your second best player. But we saw this past year, guys like Tyrese Hunter, just inconsistent and stuff. And it's hard. Like not everybody wins a national championship. You could easily look at what UConn's doing. They set the standard, but Hey, you could feed off that. You could see what Dan Hurley's doing and be like, man, maybe I need to take a different route. Maybe I don't have to go after all of these big time five stars and I can find a three star here somewhere in Nowhereville, Texas. That's six eleven that could jump out the gym, but it's a little raw. A little raw is OK. You got to trust your development. Frank Hafe. Yeah, like, that's what Scott Drew. Scott Drew's been finding those guys. Oh, he loves those dudes. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to remember Kevin that. Sampson. Like, Kelvin Sampson yeah. got yeah. Jamal Murray, a three-star out of Maynard, Texas. Jamal Shedd. Shedd. Jamal Shedd, excuse me. Jamal Shedd, thank you, Chip. And it was like, okay, buddy, 
we're going to work with you. You have what it takes. Just listen to me. Come in and work hard every day and work on your game when I'm not with you, and you're going to be a hell of a player. Turns out Jamal Shedd was Big 12 player of the year. I come from a three-star. Might come back. He's going to test the NBA waters. If he comes back, uh-oh, because they just got LJ Cryer back and one of their other big men is coming back for a fifth year. So, yeah, I – UConn was really impressive last night, and they did what I thought they should have done, which not many teams could do. They've tried to do, but not too many teams have a Donovan Klingon that could make life really difficult for Zach Eady. And I say that even though he got 37, but Zach Eady, he likes to get guys involved too. He kind of has a Nikola Jokic way of playing at times when they start double teaming him and he makes those passes out and they start knocking down threes. This was the second best three-point shooting team in the nation and they only shot seven. That's nuts. They only shot seven. They hit one. Second best three point shooting team in the nation. They, they hit get it one off. three. They couldn't get it off. You said yeah, Fletcher uh, Lawyer needs to get going. I was like, I don't think he will be able to the way they're defending him. He yeah. doesn't have that type of game. And I heard Jay Wright talking about it at halftime like, yo, these guys, they need to start doing step aside threes. Like when you pump fake from the three point line and instead of taking a step in and driving, you step to the side and shoot the three, which, yo, Jay Wright. Sorry, not everybody's Dante DiVincenzo and Josh Hart. Like, those guys are in the NBA for a reason. You're asking a lot. <laughs> like, pump fake step to the side threes are very difficult to do. Very difficult. You know, that's like telling certain guys on the go on the football field as a running back and do what Barry Sanders does. Not everybody can do that. So, you're, you know, the things that they needed to do, they just didn't have it. They don't have it in their game. Lance Jones getting in the foul trouble. That hurt him a little bit. But at the end of the day, Dan Hurley was willing to say, you know what, Zach Eady, you're going to have to beat us. That's fine. We're not going to let anybody on the outside shoot the ball, and we're just going to live with the results. And Zach Eady, we're going to make you work on the defensive end. You're going to have to play Dean. You're going to have to guard this immaculate offense that we run. And by that for, for uh, second half, you're going to be exhausted. And man, they, they made they Saturday. made Purdue pay every time they played that drop coverage. Every time. They every time. they stepped right to the free throw line and hit the shot. Every time. Every you time. Got, you got my man Castle. He'll come off that screen. Then that dude's playing drop coverage. Floater. Newton comes off of that screen, playing drop coverage. Floater. Spencer comes off that screen, playing drop coverage. He jumps in to a jump stop. He pump faking and shit. Fade away from the free throw line. It's just, they're so talented, man. And again, what Dan Hurley is doing, like, it's, it's remarkable. It really is. Like, this, this is a blue blood. Six national championships in the last 25 years. All of those guys were there. You saw Ray Allen. You saw Rip Hamilton. You saw uh, Emeka Okrafer. Like, just UConn legends. And you're like, man. You saw 81-year-old Jim Calhoun. Jim Calhoun, yeah. Bitter, bitter beer face, bitter beer face Calhoun. Yep, used to have beef with uh, our boy Gino. Him and Gino used to butt heads all the time. Yeah. During their time in Connecticut. Yeah, Jim, he couldn't stand Calipari either. <laughs> he was a crank man. I remember yeah. – I remember when Texas played UConn up there. Texas players get off the bus. Their fans are yelling, F you, Texas, as loud as can be. And, I mean, the UConn fan base, the UConn, you know, people are cranky up in the Northeast. They yeah. got crap weather. They got bad traffic. People are in a rush. And Danny Hurley fits perfectly. Yeah. All they have is sports up there. That's it. That's it. That's all they have. They're That's beloved it. Patriots. They're Celtics. They're Red Sox. Like Bruins. That's, That's all they got. And they're fine with that. <laughs> and, then, and now UConn, you know, the ones that didn't go to Boston College or whatever or didn't go to those other schools up in the East and, you know, stuck on to UConn, which they've always been good in women's basketball, but – yeah, Dan Hurley's right. The last 30 years, it's been both men and women's, and it's been very impressive.
Yeah. Yeah. No. Kudos. Yeah. Kudos. Now what it we just gotta wait and see how he reloads. Yeah. I mean uh, Donovan Klingon's gone, Spencer's gone, Newton's gone. I think Alex Caravan might be the only one returning. That's it. So he it's gonna be different. But again, he lost three NBA players last year. So I wouldn't put it past them. There's a lot of guys in the portal right now. Auburn's point guard, who is a five star, entered the portal. A couple who's of, that? Ah, oh, gosh, what's his name? I'll find him. But um, can Texas use him? Hell yeah! Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, Arizona's point, uh, big men. They've entered the portal, both of them. So. Yeah, it's Aiden Holloway. Rest. Yeah, it's Aiden awesome Holloway. Kid. Yeah. So, how tall is Aiden Holloway? Well, I feel like he's a pretty good sized guard. Let's see here. It's it's interesting him leaving, just because, I mean, what Bruce Pearl has built there in Auburn. Why wouldn't you want to follow that? Yeah, he's only six foot. He's not the biggest guy. But I don't know. They did lose first round. Like, they won the SEC tournament and lost first round. So you just never know. Well, let's bring in our man for a little uh, college football talk. Spring football is in full bloom. It's over in some places. Um, the one and only Chris Hummer, 24-7 sports, national college football analyst. Hummer, how you doing? What's up, y'all? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. So um, let's get your thoughts real quickly since you are immersed in the college athletics world. Um, what do you think of these NCAA tournaments? Uh, I thought they were fun. Uh, I wish the title games were a little more competitive, if we're being honest, um, especially last night. Um, that was a tough second half, but I thought the women's basketball tournament was super compelling, and I think that was a really big step. I was like at the Mavericks game on a Friday night against the Warriors in Dallas, and uh, the Mavericks won on a buzzer beater, and then I walked outside to the bar because I wanted to catch the end of the Iowa game, and there's probably like, 500 people standing outside a bar trying to get a look at a TV uh, to watch Caitlin Clark versus UConn. Um, and that was, that was pretty special. So I think the women's tournament was fun and the men's tournament was still March madness, man. Um, you don't recognize as many of the names, at least I don't, I don't follow the sports close as I used to, but um, it's still the best three weeks on TV, I think. Yeah. Now Hummer, is this the last year coming up the, where you could use your fifth COVID year? Because I know you still got the grad transfers and stuff, but as far as the COVID year goes, that's we're done with that, correct? For the most part, I think you'll see this coming year and then the following year if guys got medical red shirts or red shirts. Um, so you can – I need to get this clarified, so it's not really, I guess, particularly helpful. You can red shirt and take a COVID year. I do not know what happens if you did those both in 2020. I don't know if you could retroactively apply that red shirt to a different season um, so if you took your COVID year there. But you will see some guys that have done both um, from the 2020 class that get sixth years. But for the most part, those COVID years will be gone. And I think what you'll see in 2025, the NFL draft, is you'll see a bit of a super draft class. Um, Cause you'll get all the guys who've stuck around for extra years because of COVID plus the normal draft eligible players. So for draft fans this time next year, it's going to be extra loaded, I think because of all the guys who've stayed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Caden Shedrick, he redshirted in the 2019, 20 basketball season. And he's going to come back for a sixth year next year. So we're getting to the end. Um, that's for sure. Um, Hummer, obviously we're in NFL draft month. Um, some 
tough news for Tavondre Sweat over the weekend, although some more details have come out in his situation where um, he may have been involved in a in a fender bender and the other driver fled the scene. So who knows what's going on there? I always say go slow, but you don't need that kind of headline in the same month that you're you know, going to be drafted, right? Yeah, man. Hire an Uber. <laughs> yeah. You're about to make millions of dollars, and it's not like Devondre Sweat wasn't compensated in college in the first place. You can afford an Uber. And agents in these situations, a lot of the times, will essentially provide you a loan if you're going to be higher on draft pick. Devondre Sweat's probably not hurting for cash right now. Like, you've got millions of dollars on the line. Hire an Uber. Um, it is... It's certainly a weird story, but um, I think Tavondre Sweat was one of those guys, especially that was trying to prove um, not only with his weight, but with his consistency through this process that he could show that this year wasn't a flash in the plan, pan necessarily. And doing something like this less than a month out from the draft um, does not help your case. Um, and I mean, just don't drink and drive, guys. It's, it's bad. Yeah, definitely. Now, Hummer, kind of go back to basketball a little bit because this is a basketball and football question. I'm sure you've heard the news. John Calipari, former Kentucky coach, is going off to Fayetteville with, to be in the Arkansas head coach. And you just hear a lot of money being thrown his way, a lot of NIL money possibly being thrown his way. We know the different boosters that they have in Arkansas. And I ask you, okay, yeah, basketball is important, but – are they putting this much energy into the football program with where they at? Cause it doesn't seem like it with how much they've struggled these last few years and all the problems they've had. We're talking about Arkansas, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't that, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Sam Pittman beat Texas. Um, and like he was the toast of the college football world. I think they won nine games last season, but um. I, I mean, not really, I suppose. Like, Arkansas is a tough place to win um, in the SEC, in my opinion, because you have a very loyal fan base, a very engaged fan base, but you don't necessarily have the NIL infrastructure, nor do you have the uh, booster buy-in at Arkansas, at least to the same degree you see at a place like Alabama, you see at a place like Auburn, you see at a place like Tennessee, you see at a place like Georgia. Um, and then you add that on top of the fact that Arkansas, like the state of Arkansas recruiting is not um, necessarily equivalent to all the other places and it makes the job more difficult. Um, I think Sam Pittman definitely enters this year on the hot seat. Um, I would say that seat is extraordinarily warm. Um, I can think of a coach in the state of Texas right now who um, would be a pretty um, quick candidate for that job, but it's, it's an attractive job, but it's a difficult job. And I think bringing Sam Pittman back for this year, especially during a coaching cycle where there weren't a lot of obvious like top end coaching candidates makes sense for a year to see what he can do. But um, yeah, it does feel like they're swinging a little bigger in basketball than they are in football, perhaps because um, they feel like that's an area they can be successful as Eric Musselman showed in the last couple of seasons. Yeah. Good point. We're um, returning starters in college football. Always uh, something that I take uh, special note of because um, if you get a lot of starters returning, you have a chance to improve pretty um, significantly. And interesting to me that the most returning starters, and I saw this on your uh, Twitter timeline, most returning starters in the SEC is Kentucky with 17 and Texas plays Kentucky uh, this season. Your thoughts on the football Wildcats and how uh, how dangerous they could be as a sleeper in the SEC? Well, I, first, I just want to say, like, if you follow Kentucky athletics, you know that the relationship between John Calipari and the basketball team and Mark Stoops and the football team has been contentious for quite a while. Um, they have 
uh, sniped back at each other in the media multiple times. And it's ironic during a cycle in which Mark Stoops was heavily pursued at other schools, was heavily linked to AM, that he ended up staying. And John Calipari is the guy who ends up leaving the program. Um, and I guess right now, Kentucky is a football school because of the success Mark Stoops has had. Um, I think they're going to be pretty good. I think a lot of that depends on how healthy Grayson McCall is and how much of an upgrade he can be for that passing game. Grayson McCall did take a bit of a step back last year um, in year one under uh, Tim Back, a guy I know a lot of Texas fans are familiar with, former offensive coordinator here um, in Austin. Um, but Grayson McCall is one of the most accomplished passers in college football currently. Um, he should be an upgrade for Kentucky based on what they had last year with Devin Leary, who was a disappointment coming over from NC State. And if you look at the infrastructure around Grayson McCall, especially offensively, there's a lot to be excited about. Um, the offensive line and the run game are consistently among the best in college football. They have a dangerous wide receiver room, one in which I know Texas fans have been interested in. Um, in recent years, with Barry and Brown, especially at receiver, along with uh, Dane Key. Um, they upgraded that room as well. So I, I think they have the potential to be really salty offensively, and that defense is always a top-half team in the country. So I don't know if I'd pick Kentucky to beat Texas, but I think that would certainly be a very interesting game. Um, Kentucky's a very dangerous team to deal with every year in the SEC. Yeah, Grayson McCall, um, for folks who don't know about him, he was at Coastal Carolina with – um, um, Jamie Chadwell. Yeah. Well, and the head coach is, uh, you just said his name, Tim. Oh, Tim Beck. Uh, yes. The former Tim Beck. And what is he? Three times Sunbelt player of the year. Yeah. He was, he was dominant in, um, Jamie Chadwell's offense. And Jamie Chadwell is now the head coach at Liberty and his head quarterback is Caden Salter. Um, Grayson McCall was unbelievable in that offense. I think Coastal Carolina won like 35 games in three years. Um, Grayson McCall was a bit hurt last year. Um, and that team and that offense did take a bit of a step back, but I think he's thrown for the second most yards in college football right now, actively behind Dylan Gabriel. Um, he's somebody that, um, is really proven. Auburn almost took him last year. Uh, there was a bit of a academic, hiccup there that left him at coastal Carolina for another year, but he is somebody that sec schools have looked at as, as a starting caliber quarterback uh, for two years now. And um, I think he'll be an upgrade for Kentucky. Do they have enough in the, in the trenches? Do you think Kentucky? Yeah. Um, I think Kentucky, their offensive line last year wasn't necessarily as strong as their run game might indicate. Um, they had a lot of success for reasons outside of their um, offensive line, but they went heavy in the portal uh, with that. And their defensive line is really salty. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with him, but um, everybody should know Dion Walker, who is their starting defensive tackle. Um, he was a true freshman All-American for us at 24-7 Sports in 2022. Um, an All-American last year, just nationally, and I think somebody who's going to be a really early round draft pick in 2025. Um, he creates more pressure from the interior than almost anybody in college football. Um, he was actually created more pressures last year from the interior than Byron Murphy did. Um, so that's somebody who is the building block and the centerpiece of a defensive line. So they're pretty solid up front along the lines of scrimmage. Maybe not as deep as Texas will be, but um, they're not going to get overwhelmed. Hummer, Paul Feinbaum is getting a lot of heat from Texas fans for what he said about the Horns joining the SEC because of the success that AM has had. Can you let the people know what he means by that? Because Longhorn fans, they're only seeing wins versus the losses. He's saying that Texas joined the SEC because of Texas AM. He said a big part was because of the success that AM was having in the SEC. So the horns oh. were the piece of that. I don't I don't know about that. Um, I think I mean Paul Feinbaum, who I think is very entertaining and is plugged in in a lot of places, uh, definitely says some stuff. I think Texas joined the SEC because the check was gonna be a lot bigger um, than they had in the Big Twelve. I don't think it has anything to do with AM. In fact, I think AM actively tried to keep Texas out of the SEC. Um, 
I, I think, I mean, personally, as a fan of college football, it'll be great to have the game back. Um, but I don't think, I don't think any part of Texas decision had to do with Texas A&M being there. Um, I think that was a pretty obvious comment. And uh, I can see how a Texas A&M fan might convince themselves of that maybe um, and whatever part of the brain makes that work. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't see much in the way of that. It was all about um, dollars and it was all about keeping Texas competitive nationally uh, moving forward. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, they they want to be where the the money is scaling, and where there are other uh, partners in a conference who bring that kind of revenue share to the table, instead of always feeling like it was Texas and Oklahoma and everyone else nursing off of them, and and where the most money was going to be in the future. And that's clearly going to be the SEC and the big 10. So um, yeah, it had nothing to do. If success means the paychecks that A&M was getting um, then yeah. Otherwise no. Um, and I yeah. think it's funny because A&M totally reacted to Texas in getting rid of Jimbo Fisher and haphazardly, you know, I don't know how my man, um, the AD Ross Bjork, fumbled the Mark Stoops situation and somehow landed at Ohio State as athletic director. Good for him. Get out from under John Sharp, who basically vetoed the Stoops hire, which was a mess. But uh, your thoughts, Hummer? Yeah, I mean, on the Ross Bjork situation, um, he's somebody who's long been a, uh, we have climbers in every industry and he's long been a climber. Um, so I'm not surprised to see him at Ohio State. Um, as for the Texas, Texas A&M situation, I mean, if there's any part of the blueprint Texas wanted to copy, I suppose, it's the boost that A&M got in the SEC from a recruiting standpoint. Um, but even that, like Texas has top three classes every year nationally in the last couple of years, at least in the big 12, like Texas certainly didn't need help from a revenue perspective, although it will certainly be helpful to be in that, um, SEC and big 10 class, um, in a couple of years when those, uh, start to really spike. So I don't, I don't really understand the comment, um, to be honest, um, doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I don't think it. Um, meshes with the reality that's actually taking place on the ground here in the Lone Star State. Hummer, what do you think is the nagging concern for Texas uh, here as they head into the final week of spring football, final 10 days? Um, I, mean, I don't know if it's a concern, but it's, it's something we texted about a little bit recently, Chip, and it's something we've talked about here before. I think it's we talked about Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy a little bit earlier. It's how do you replace those guys? Um, Alfred Collins is obviously um, a piece that you can really build around. And um, Texas does not lack for other experience options along the defensive line. But I think Texas went to the national or Texas went to the college football playoff this year and won the Big 12 on the strength of its interior defensive line, on the strength of the fact that they can rotate heavily in the interior defensive line. And the fact that teams couldn't run at them up the middle and that strength is certainly weak lessened at this point. Um, and it's a question mark. And if you can find a, uh, if you can figure out a way to plug that gap in the spring transfer portal window at defensive tackle, um, that would be a really big thing for Texas. Um, I don't know if we're going into this, but the other thing is like everybody needs a defensive tackle right now. Like it is by far the most in demand position in the portal. Uh, going into next week and it'll be a very competitive market uh, for the ones that eventually do emerge because a lot of contenders need an upgrade at that position. Why do you yeah. think that is Hummer? Just because there's not many out there. Just. Yeah. I mean, it's just hard to find bodies like that. Um, defensive tackle, especially like, 
every skill set has their particular machinations and rare traits that you need, but defensive tackles very unique. I mean, there's not a lot of 300 pound humans out there in the first place. There's definitely not a lot of 300 pound humans that have the explosiveness and the strength to play that position. And there's even fewer of them who are capable of not only defending the run and holding up in the trenches, every snap, but also penetrating in the backfield. Um, it's why this time last year, the, I think arguably the biggest splash in the spring transfer portal window was Georgia losing bear Alexander to USC. And you don't associate the sentence Georgia losing anything um, in this era or as successful as they've been. But USC was very aggressive in trying to upgrade that position. And they went out and found bear Alexander in the portal. Um, somebody who is from the state of Texas as well. And Texas recruited at one point. So there's just not a ton of them. And, uh, teams are going to have to pull out those checkbooks, I think, um, in this era to get somebody like that. It's going to be a very expensive proposition to get an impact of interior defensive linemen. Well, I think everyone's looking at Michigan's D linemen like Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant and wondering if the late coaching decision by you know Jim Harbaugh to leave, and, and I know they have a lot of starters returning on defense, um, you know, if any of those guys who kind of missed the portal window, uh, because Harbaugh didn't take the chargers job until late in the process, if either of those guys will show up in the portal in May. Yeah. Um, first Jim Harbaugh definitely did Michigan a favor by waiting that long. I know it hurt Michigan in some ways, but in terms of roster retention, it helped because um, teams didn't have the opportunity to get Michigan's players in because a lot of schools already started. Um, and there were definitely some rumors about Mason Graham and um, Kenneth, Grant. Like, Kenneth Grant uh, for a while. And I mean, they'll still pop up, but I think Michigan has largely settled that down. Um, I have not heard much in the way of buzz about those two potentially moving on over the last month or so, especially once spring ball started there. That doesn't mean nothing will happen, but I think the expectation is at least right now that Michigan will have Mason Graham uh, and Kenneth Grant along with Will Johnson and a couple of the other defensive stalwarts going into next year. Um, Michigan's bigger question is who ends up at quarterback, um, which will be a very compelling thing to watch over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean that Michigan defense should still be pretty good. Oh, they'll lo they're loaded. Um, I think they'll be a top ten unit nationally next year, and they could be the best defense in the country. Um, I think you could legitimately say they have. I, even with all the guys they're gonna have drafted this year, I think that defense is still gonna have like five or six day one or day two picks on it when Texas lines up against it. As long as everybody stays and everybody stays healthy. Um, it is a uh, loaded room, even after losing Rod Moore uh, to a torn ACL earlier this spring. Like Michigan is uh, pretty salty. Yeah. Hummer, what about the hometown kid that's up in Clemson, Clay K. Klubnik? I know that he had kind of a tough year his first season starting for Dabo, but it seems like with him being a five star recruit, all the hopes that they have for him, he just needs more experience and more reps. Are they still really high on him, or does he have a short leash on him coming into the 2024 season? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be a short leash. I think. Clemson is going to be Clemson based on Clay K. Klubnik this year. So he'll get every opportunity to be. Clemson needs him to live up to those expectations. Um, you, I don't know if anybody watched the spring game here. I'm sure there's people that are big Westlake fans and maybe turned on the Clemson game. Um, but Clay Klubnik started out pretty shaky, but he kind of found his rhythm. Um, Clemson seems to really be molding the offense around his strengths. They're going fast. Um, Garrett Riley likes to get the ball out quick. Um, they got the ball out quicker than almost anybody in the country last year. In fact, um, that offense had no vertical speed. Um, but I think if Kid Klubnik can take a step forward and that wide receiver group can take a step forward, um, it would be very helpful for Clemson because just like we talked about with Michigan, Clemson's again going to have a very salty defense. Um, the ceiling will just come down to Kid Klubnik. I don't think he's in danger of losing his job by any means, but um, Clemson really needs him to look like the number one quarterback in the country like he was in the 2022 class. Yeah, it was shocking how little 
vertical speed Clemson had. I mean, from the team that just plastered Alabama in the national championship a few years ago, where it seemed like they had speed everywhere, you know, Justin Ross and those dudes, it's staggering. Um, and has, has Dabo come around on the portal? No. Dabo has still, I believe, only taken two transfers or one transfer maybe all time, and it was a former Clemson quarterback who came in to essentially be a glorified GA. So um, Clemson doesn't take transfers. Clemson has um, pursued an offensive lineman or two um, in Dabo Sweeney's time. They've not landed any. Um, I think they're after um, former SMU center Branson Hickman. I don't think they'll get him either. So it's not it's not something you're going to see a lot of um, reinforcements from, from Clemson. So Clemson, for better or worse, um, is going to live and die by its high school recruiting and development, uh, which really puts the onus on somebody like Kate Klubnik or the offensive line or those wide receivers, like you mentioned, vertical speed. Like Clemson really needs Bryant Wesco, a true freshman, uh, who was an early enrollee this year from Midlothian, Texas, um, to step up. He was a top 50 recruit. Clemson really needs TJ Moore, a top 50 uh, recruit in this class, to step up and be an immediate impact player because they're going to have to be. Clemson's going to rely on those guys. <laughs> well, who uh, who's the team that you think is that people are sleeping on from a national perspective? Like that could win a national championship or just uh, – Or just, just make a big move in their conference, shake things up, be a spoiler. Um, I think – I mean, I'm very bullish on Ole Miss this year. Uh, it's not like they've been down recently, but I think they've loaded their roster um, and gotten ready for a run that they haven't had in a long time. Um, I really like that team. I think Arizona coming into the Big 12 could be a really pain in the butt for everybody. Um, I love their uh, offensive combination, especially um, with quarterback Noah Vita and Titora McMillan back at wide receiver. Um, I like both of those teams a ton. Um, if you're talking about a team further down the rankings that people aren't talking about, I think Oklahoma State uh, is the team that people really need to pay attention to. We've discussed them before. You mentioned that returning starters list earlier, Chip. I believe Oklahoma State is second in the power, I guess, is it four now? Second in the power four with 21 returning starters. 21. That team is, yeah, that team is super old, man. Like, it's full of, like, 23 and 24-year-old dudes. Like, these are grown men playing football in the Big 12 next year. And they were in the Big 12 title game last year for a reason. Uh, you could argue um, maybe they were a little overinflated. Uh, they got – really lucky with the way the schedule broke and uh, winning the right games. But you put them in a conference like this, that's totally wide open without Texas and Oklahoma. And I think Oklahoma state can make some real noise and potentially end up knocking on the playoff store as well. Yeah. Virginia tech has all 22 starters back. Are they ever going to resurface? I mean, you saw some like fun potential out of them last year late. Uh, it went from thinking that maybe they might make a head coaching change after about two weeks um, under Brent Pry to him really solidifying that job. I don't know if people remember, but Virginia Tech started out last season uh, one and three overall, two and five. Um, they were they lost to Marshall like it was it was problematic. And then late in the season, um, they rallied um, Kyron Jones, another guy from the state of Texas that people might remember was at Baylor for a while. It's actually, um, I don't know if y'all need these fun facts. It's Cam Ward's cousin. So Cam Ward, the Miami quarterback, his cousins with Kyron Drones. And he was inserted in the starting lineup after two weeks. And he was really a game changer. Um, he emerged as one of the best running quarterbacks in the country last year. Um, he needs to be a little bit more consistent as a passer. Um, I wouldn't say they were basic with them, but they weren't. I don't think the whole playbook was necessarily unleashed with Kyron Jones. So if he can take a step up and a couple of his weapons can improve, uh, I could definitely see Virginia Tech making some noise in the ACC. But I, I certainly wouldn't pick them over Clemson or Miami at this point or anything like that. Yeah. 
Homer, when we we're talking about Arkansas, you mentioned a coach that might be good for that job if it became available. Who are you talking about? Oh, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a big secret. Rhett Lashley over at SMU is an uh, Arkansas uh, person. And I mean, I don't know if he'd go, but I would imagine he would garner quite a bit of interest, especially given the way that SMU has performed over the last two years with him at the helm. Um, but I mean, Arkansas, like as we saw with John Calipari, um, if they're motivated, they can lure a lot of people. I think it's a problematic job, but um, in a lot of ways, um, or at least not problematic. It is a job with its difficulties, but um, I, I certainly think Rhett Lashley would be in that conversation if it were to open. And I think of all the coaches in the SEC going to the next year, Sam Pittman's seat is by far the hottest. What about Jeff Trailer in that mix? I think that's another name that you, you probably, I guess y'all probably thought I was going to bring up Jeff Trailer there. Yeah, I, I certainly think that's a, a potential opportunity. It'd be weird for Jeff Trailer to leave Texas, but if you were going to do it, um, Arkansas isn't too far from Gilmer. Uh, so he could really uh, recruit East Texas well over there. I would probably watch Baylor a little closer for Jeff Trailer, um, depending on how things shake out with Dave Aranda uh, going into next year. Um, I think that's really the only Power Five Lone Star State job that's probably going to open going into 2024. And if I was a betting person, that's the uh, that's where I'd line up Jeff Trailer at least for now. You don't think our guy Gary Patterson could help old Dave Aranda? Did he hire him? He did, yeah. He did. And I think Gary Patterson probably will help a little bit. Like um, he had an impact on Texas two years ago. Like um, Gary Patterson's an excellent coach, um, but I, I don't think Gary Patterson can overcome talent and Baylor just hasn't recruited well enough under Dave Aranda um, and their NIL operation is now operating like as it should have been for years, but they were a little behind in that. So um Dave Aranda is really going to need to scheme his butt off next year, I think, um, and hope that the quarterback they took from Toledo um, can help that offense take a step. Because Blake Shapin honestly wasn't that bad last year. Blake Shapin wasn't the problem for the offense, the team. It was the defense, which is Dave Aranda's baby, just totally collapsing. Hummer, always appreciate it, my man. I always look forward to the conversation on Tuesdays. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, guys. I'll talk to y'all later. All right. Appreciate you, Hummer. Have a good one. Chris Hummer, breaking it down. National college football analyst, 24-7 sports. Lots of good stuff in there. Talking about SEC teams with returning starters. Kentucky with 17 starters returning, Zay. And um, their quarterback, Grayson McCall, who – Probably see Texas fans got to start getting to know these SEC rosters because you're not you're not facing Oklahoma State anymore. You don't care. I mean, it's interesting that they have 21 starters back, but now we got to figure out who in the SEC is a landmine and on the Texas schedule in Kentucky. Now, that game is in Austin, mercifully, because that's a danger game to me, but we'll see. Yeah, there's a few trap games on this schedule. I mean, I wouldn't take that Florida one lightly either. I mean, Coach will be fighting for his job, especially with the toughest schedule in college football, those Florida Gators, but – yeah, man, like you can't take anyone lightly. And, you know, just hearing Steve Sarkeesian today talk about certain guys, like I know we're going to get to that, but you know how I feel about Jalen Gilbo. Like, you know, yeah. I've been eye on the Port Arthur product for a long time. Well, let's, let's, let's get there. Let's let get me just there. say, let me just say this. The only, the reason I'm a little dubious about Kentucky is because that game is sandwiched between uh, Texas's road trips to Arkansas on November 16th. Then they come home and play Kentucky, and then they go to A&M. So that is in primo trap uh, territory between two rivalry games late in the year. 
Uh, but we will let's move on to uh, Texas spring football because, uh, as they said, we did get a chance to talk to Steve Sarkeesian. And Zay, what stood out to you about what he said about uh, Jalen Gilba? Everything. Everything. The dude as a freshman in 2022 was lighting it up before he had that ankle injury in the Oklahoma State game. And that kind of just changed the trajectory for him. And you come into the 2023 season, I was really high on him, but it just didn't seem like he was able to get on the field due to how much trust that Pete Kwiatkowski has and Jade Barron and the fact that Jalen Gilbo probably wasn't there, whether it's mentally or physically being 100% on that field. Phys so Physically. Physically, okay, that yeah. makes more sense. So now coming into 2024, all those things are behind you and it's time to show what everybody was so excited about you in 2022. And yeah, I'm, I'm hype about him. I think he is tough. He's physical, not the biggest guy in the world, but with him being on the field and just giving you that much more versatility enables you to put John A. Barron in situations with his versatility to where, let's say if Terrence Brooks is strong or Gavin Holmes or something, you can move one of those guys to the outside and you won't be vulnerable at that slot star position. And again, Jalen Kilbo, I think he has everything it takes to be an NFL cornerback, especially at that nickel spot. Like that dude, he is fast. He can hit. He ain't scared. And again, like at the much, the most clock that he had this season was that U of H game when they were trying to sit out Jade Barron and they ended up not doing that because they were getting killed so much, Keaton Crawford and Jaron Thompson. But Jalen Gilbo, he was balling. He was balling in that game. So, again, you just didn't see it as much as you would have liked this past year. But if he's getting back to that form that Sark's talking about today to where he said he was back. So I'm taking Sark's word for it. If he's back, he is back. Give him those opportunities uh, – Terry Joseph and Pete Kukowski for him to go out there and ball. And I've been saying for the longest time since the season ended, even though the secondary was a struggle last year and probably the most vulnerable spot for this defense, it could be the strength on this team in 2024. And I'm really, really excited about, about that. And it starts with guys like Jalen Gilbo. Yeah. Yeah. Jalen Gilbo um, was – was like you said, he was rising quickly, then injuries, um, you know, slowed him down a bit. And you're right. Steve Sarkeesian said, quote, he's back. He's back to the speed and the player that they saw two years ago. So that is, that is significant news. Um, he also on the conversation uh, involving the defensive backs, high praise for Malik Muhammad. Not a surprise there. Uh, we've been talking about how uh, Manny Muhammad is he is plug and play, rising star, leader. He's what you want. He's becoming one of those players you can't live without um, because of just how talented he is, how much he wants it, how much he wants to lead. Um, and then Jelani McDonald. So starting to hear Jelani McDonald's name. Um, talked about him in the insider at Horns 24-7 last uh, Thursday morning. And Stark is mentioning him again. Um, he's 6'2". He's long. And Sark called him rangy. But he's long. And he's got good instincts. He's... Um, you know, Sark talked about how he played quarterback in high school up there in Waco and how that that football IQ is serving him well now at safety. Because as a quarterback, you you see the defense from one perspective. And now as a defensive back who used to play quarterback, he knows what the quarterback's looking for. And he's also looking for all the tells that uh, that he can get just like when he was trying to read defenses. So um, that's, that's encouraging because you've already got Andrew McCuba. 
You've got Michael Taff. You've got Derek Williams. Now, if Jelani McDonald, who is, you know, showing you something, um, because I hear he's ahead of, you know, Xavier Phils to me. And Andy's 6'2 and 205 and can run and will hit you. That's big time. That's that's encouraging news. Obviously, we're 10 days from the spring game. There's all summer. There's fall camp. But still, you want to hear about guys who are fighting for positioning, who are showing you what they've learned, who are ready to get on the field, who've been doing it on special teams and are ready to get on the field on you know one side of the ball or the other, in this case, defense and you know, Jelani McDonald's one of the best looking players getting off the bus for sure. Yeah. And I love hearing guys that it wasn't necessarily their turn last year because they came in as freshmen and they had to learn. But coming in to year two, they're starting to pick it up a little faster. Like Jelani McDonald, he's supposed to be a little further ahead than Xavier Filsamy. Xavier Filsamy just touched down from McKinney, Texas, like three months ago. Jolly McDonald was here all last year. I felt like he was an early enrollee last year in 2023. So he should be ahead for sure. He should have that confidence, you know, and man, you just named all the rest of those um, safety players like Derek Williams and Mookie Taff and all those guys. But like, man, Jelani McDonald, if you could add him to the mix, I'm sure Blake Gideon, he would love that because that would be ideal, as much versatility as you could have in that secondary. Because, again, you're going to play if you want to get to the national championship game. You're going to probably have to play an extra game this year. You know what I'm saying? So you got to have that depth. This is the SEC. you got to have guys, like, once you get to around that territory that you're talking about where, you know, you're playing Kentucky and a and your body might be shot. You know, that your body, it ain't going to be the same as it was week one. So you got to have multiple guys out there that you could trust and have a lot of faith in that could get the job done to where even though you might have superstars on your first squad, those second team, third team guys could come in and there might not be much drop off, if any at all. Like that's what Sart means by building the culture and being four deep at every position. And yeah, I, I'm hyped. I'm really excited. Like the secondary with how inconsistent it was in 2023, I am looking – because they have to be. They have to be good. Like the defensive line, you're not going to get that back. You're not going to get that 2023 defensive line back. It's just not going to happen. I love Alfred Collins, love Burton Broughton, Tia Savea. I think he's going to do well too. Those edge guys, I think they're going to be solid. They are not going to give you what they gave you this past season. So that means the secondary has to be that much better. They have to be that much better forcing turnovers, you know, not allowing those big plays on first and second down, like all those things that we saw this past year, got to nip that in the butt. And it starts now. It starts now. And I think they have enough guys back there where you have a lot of faith in putting whoever out there, depending on the game. They even mentioned Andrew Makuba, like Andrew Makuba, we're expecting him to come in and be a star be a leader, even though he came from Clemson, he's played a lot of meaningful football games. So, yeah, you're looking for all of these guys to be big helps in this season. I think they can. It's just a part of their development and sticking to the game plan week in and week out. Don't forget, Jelani McDonald's dad, LaMarcus McDonald, was a total stud linebacker at TCU under Gary Patterson. Um, was a teammate of Derek Johnson's at Waco High. And, you know, he comes from good bloodlines. I mean, Gary Patterson told me, keep an eye on Jelani McDonald's, he said, because his dad was a beast for me at TCU. All-American linebacker. Um, you know, undersized, 6'1", 230, but just was a wrecking machine. Um, fan favorite was the player of the game in the Liberty Bowl when TCU went 10-2 and two in 2002. So, um, 
he broke the TCU school record for tackles for loss. I mean, it was ridiculous what uh, how productive that uh, you know Lamarcus McDonald Jelani's dad was at TCU. Now, you know, you're hoping the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, that means something. Like, I mean something. If your pops played and was successful, like, you know, that that means something. That means that you've been very close to the game. That means that those genes, like you said, hope the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. We saw it last night in basketball. Like, the Hurleys, Dan Hurley, that family, basketball royalty. Like, their pops, Bobby Hurley, Dan Hurley, their dad, Bob Hurley Sr., he won, like, 26 state championships in New Jersey for the high school level. That's insane. That's nuts. That sounds like cheating. That, 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 that sounds like cheating. Like, how is he getting all of these guys? I know he had slow-mo Kyle Anderson and stuff, and but it's this is Jersey we're talking about. Like, it might not be New York, but the Hoopers are still pretty damn good there. And then Bobby Hurley went back-to-back with Duke during the Krzyzewski days, 91-92. If he didn't ride that damn motorcycle, he probably would have had a lengthy NBA career. You know what I'm saying? Like, those things matter. When you have family that's in the biz, that's been there and done that, that's why this Arch Manning thing gets so much love. Like, it matters. It for sure matters. And that always does. If you look at myself, that's the example. Like, I wasn't shit when it come to hooping. CeCe was like all world at Texas State and the Hall of Fame and stuff. (laughs) Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. I'm an example of that. And life's still good for me. Lovely wife, great job. I'm doing fine. But, hey, you want those genes and you want those guys that have ties to, you know, their ancestors of being big-time players and big-time coaches and stuff. Those things matter, absolutely. Hey, don't sell yourself short, say. Thanks, you man. Know. Thanks. You know you what I'm the- saying? You got the goods, baby. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I wish on the court I had a little bit more goods. You know, just give me a at least 35-inch vertical and something like that. I'd be fine with that. That's all. All I need, 35. I'd be fine. 35. 35. I'd be overseas right now, you know, putting up buckets in Turkey or something like that. But, hey, that just wasn't my path, and that's okay. That well, before, uh, before our man Hank South comes on to – Talk a little uh, Texas Longhorns recruiting. Let me get uh, some love in here for Apple Leasing, getting you into the car you really want to be driving. And with Apple Leasing, you're picking any make or model of car. They lease any make or model of car. I know people are like, really? Yeah, Apple Leasing is an Austin original. And their whole thing is we'll lease any make or model of car and we will um, you know, make you happy. And that way, if you want to change maker model of car two, three years into your lease, no problem. The easy lease, everything about Apple leasing is easy. And of course, the money maker or the money saver is the fact that you're not paying for the future trade-in value of that car while you're leasing it. You're only paying for the car while you're driving it. So you're getting into a better car than you thought you could afford. And that's where the magic happens because some of you are like, I'm not buying a new car. I'm not buying a new car. I'm going to get a used car, the depreciation out of it. Well, go, you know, whether you want to keep your payments in the $400 range or get a Range Rover, Apple Leasing is going to get you whatever you want. And they're going to be making sure that you're happy because they want to build that relationship. You deserve to be in a new car, especially if you're in Austin, Texas, where you're going to be in traffic. Give them a call today, 346-9977. Visit AppleLeasing.com. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. All right, let's uh, see him in the waiting room. There he is, Hank South, recruiting guru, Horns247.com. Hank's been hustling, baby, hustling. Trying he and to. Jordan Scruggs. I mean, they were in – Jordan was in Dallas covering – a big, uh, a big event. Hank was here in Austin where a bunch of big time recruits were in for the weekend. Hank, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are y'all? Doing, doing good, man. You know, we're talking football. We're talking Longhorns football with Hank South. It doesn't get any better than that. And um, Hank, I mean, size it up 
to put put into perspective what this weekend was all about for uh, for Texas fans. Yeah, it was kind of like a miniature junior day almost, you know, the, the way they put it together, um, you know, they, they named it. It was the Longhorn City Limits. You know, they're inviting some of their top targets. Um, it was obviously a much more like intimate group. You know, junior day, I think, was, you know, 100 plus kids, it felt like. And, and this one was more, you know, that two dozen almost, you know, you know, a little over two dozen range. Um, so it was certainly smaller, but, you know, still a, a pretty marquee event on the recruiting calendar. Kids have been circling April 6th for a while and and they showed up and uh, yeah, you know, they, they, they had guys come in Saturday morning, you know, go through uh, team meetings. Uh, they let them watch the scrimmage um, and then uh, they had a little crawfish boil afterwards. And uh, the guys certainly enjoyed that. And it was, you know, just kind of a, a you know, mid spring, you know, check in, you know, the spring games obviously coming up in uh, less than two weeks. So, you know, there'll be more guys there as well. Um, and then obviously summer is a pretty busy official visit season, but, Really good event, um, you know, had big time targets on campus and, and you know, all the returns are, are pretty positive. So I think uh, overall, you know, a lot of success for Texas on Saturday. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Ricky Stewart. I mean, whenever you get a kid from Tyler, Texas, I know Longhorn yeah. fans, their ears perk up, especially at that running back position, knowing yeah. that Tyler Rhodes was here once upon a time. But Ricky Stewart seems like a hell of a player and a great kid and another one for Tashar Choice and Steve Sarkeesian. Yeah. And this was, uh, you know, uh, one we, we kind of expected. It wasn't, a, you know, we weren't really sure when um, he was going to do it um, until, you know, on, on Saturday morning. It was funny. You know, he got there and, uh, you know, they, they ride the shuttle from the intramural fields down to the uh, to campus. And, uh, you know, I was like, are you going to commit today? And you know, he was like, eh. and I, I should have taken that as a hint of like, probably. But, you know, I was, you know, we, we got caught up with other interviews and whatnot. And, Sure enough, a couple hours later, you know, he, he was announcing his commitment. But, um, yeah, you know, a, a kid, I need to pull up his stats because, like, that's what jumps out the page, off the page at you, like, immediately. Uh, in his in first three high school seasons, he's amassed more than 6,000 yards rushing. Um, he runs track, got to like that. Last season alone, um, 2,855 yards and 40 touchdowns to go with 284 uh, yards catching uh, – um, uh, receiving in, in four touchdowns there off 18 catches. So uh, just a really productive kid. You know, the, the in-state guy that they uh, they circled, you know, he was committed to to SMU for uh, – sorry, I'm getting a text notification. Make sure no one's committed to Texas. That's that's recruiting reporter life. You got to – You got to bounce. You tell us. You I know, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's another school. Um, so uh, – but, yeah, just the production. You know, this was the guy that they circled as, you know, th that was their in-state priority in, in this class. You know, there's, there's a handful of other guys that you know, they were interested in. But, but Ricky Stewart, you know, he was committed to SMU. They offered him on January 20th at Junior Day. And uh, a couple weeks later, he decommitted from SMU. Um, you know, it was, it was pretty clear when you were talking to him after <clears> – <throat> his junior day visit that uh that texas was you know that offer like was changing things for him and then sure enough he decommitted a couple weeks later uh from that point on you know I, th I think everybody in the texas market was you know just a matter of when not if he would join the class and he decided to this past weekend but <clears throat> excuse me sorry but um big time pickup you know and, and people were asking does this affect jordan davison i have to cough one more time i'm sorry <clears throat> man uh, no, to that class. I'm going to let y'all talk for a second. I, I'm having a cough attack. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, Ricky Stewart, I, I mean, I think you look at it and, you know, he's a three star kid, but you, the production is ridiculous. The, you know, the fact that he can, he can run the ball, he can catch the ball. Um, yeah. You know, he hasn't caught a ton of passes, but, um, doubled his re receptions from his sophomore to his junior seasons um, and kind of a wiry leaner guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's not huge. Um, but yeah. Does he I, remind I you of anyone when I hear wiry, I, I think of Jamal Charles, but yeah, I think that's a good comp. <clears throat> um, yeah. I mean, he, he you know, five ten, one eighty. 180, um, you know, can, can make plays out of the backfield, uh, you know, running and catching. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I just think again, like the production, it's just like insane. Um, you know, he, he's, uh, and, and, you know, he's gotten better every year at the high school level. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think he's like, he's like one of those guys that like maybe isn't like as flashy of a recruit, 
Uh, but then, like, they get to Texas two years later, you're you're looking at, like, Jonathan Brooks. Like, oh, man, this kid's really, really good. You can see why they liked him so much. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a big pickup. And, you know, they're, they're still going to try to get Jordan Davis and the guy from California and, uh, and make this a two-back class. Okay, so the guy whose name kind of jumped out at me from the weekend uh, was this kid French, not only because of his talent as a football player, but because he spells his name F F R E N C H. I was like, is that a typo? No, that's how he spells it. Jamie yeah. French, right? Yep. Yeah. And it's constantly like when you're writing about him, it's like, it, it, it's like one of those things is like OCD. You see the, you have to like add it to your dictionary. So it won't keep trying to correct you. Um, but yeah, that was big time, big time guy on campus. And, you know, I think all the wide receiver conversation, you know, if you've been following Texas, kind of like, you know, from the the periphery is like, you know, Decorian Moore, they got to get Decorian Moore. But, you know, Jamie French is almost held in as much as much of a high regard as as, as Decorian Moore. And, you know, I'm not going to say like Decorian Moore is the, is the top target. Like that's that's the guy they want. But, De, you know, and Jordan Scruggs said it best, like 1A Decorian Moore, Jamie French is 1B. And, you know, the, the all the buzz with him, he, he was committed to Alabama at one point. Nick Saban retired. <clears throat> Uh, he decommitted from Alabama and, and all the buzz has been around Ohio state, but you know, he got on campus this weekend um, and, and, you know, they're making a major push for him and and we caught up with him on his way out. And uh, he said, Bama was in his top three. Now he said, or not Bama, I'm sorry. He said, Texas was in his top three. And he was like, that wasn't the case when, you know, I got here. Uh, they just showed me like, they showed me a lot that I, that I really liked. And it's uh it's, it's Texas, Ohio state and Tennessee now are his top three. And, it's going to be interesting because, you know, we're, we're talking to people this week and, you know, it sounds like, you know, it, he's not just like just saying that it sounds like he's like legitimately interested in Texas. And I, and I don't think it really is a thing that could affect a Corey more. I, I think, you know, they, they obviously want both those guys. Both those guys are welcome to commit anytime they want. Um, but it sounds like they gave Jamie French like they, they really gave him a lot to think about. And he's coming back for uh, an official visit June 21st. So, um, you know, a guy that wants to make a decision prior to his senior year you know, they're going to get the last crack at him in, in terms of official visits this summer. So, you know, crazier things have happened, but, um, you know, everyone's like, oh, he's going to Ohio State, no doubt. Like, but I, I, I don't think that's absolutely the case. I think Texas and Tennessee are, are very much in it for him. And it sounds like they couldn't have really, you know, impressed him more. And, and another plus, you know, I wrote in the stampede yesterday was, you know, I was talking to some sources and it said his family loved it just as much. And, you know, that's that's a big deal, too, because, you, you know, you see kids take visits by themselves, like with their seven on seven teams or something or, you know, without their family. But when you bring your family, that, that shows a little uh, another degree of like, you know, interest, I, I think. And for them to have a good time as well, I, I think says a lot. So we'll see. He's, he's up there. And uh, but I'm telling you if, you, if you get a class that, you know, includes Decorian and more, uh, uh, Jamie French and then maybe a guy like Kalik Lockett, who's actually rated higher than Jamie French in the uh, 24-7 sports composite um, from Saxe, Texas. Uh, three five-star wide receivers. I mean, that that would be wild. So, you know, yeah, I, uh, Texas, yeah it, <laughs> you're talking like 2017 Alabama where, you know, you, you get uh, you get Jerry Judy, Devontae Smith and Henry Ruggs in the same class. Um, that, that kind of level of, of wide receiver talent. So uh, maybe even better, I mean, you know, when it's all said and done, but on paper, certainly um, up there. Well, they're both kind of built the same French and, and Decorian and Moore. They're both yeah. like, right, you know, six feet, five eleven, whatever. Um, yeah. What really separates them, Hank? I, Decorian Moore just kind of has like another, like gear in terms of playmaker ability. Um, I, I'm not sure if Jimmy French runs track, not that that like is like a detractor, but I think that shows like another level of like, you know, the burst he has or the explosiveness he has, but I, I, you know, French is actually like standing next to him on Saturday. He is a little bit taller than I thought. I think he's like, he's probably actually about six one. So he's a little bit linkier, um, leaner. Um, but I think Decorian Moore just kind of has that. I, I don't, I don't know what the white word is, but He's just uh, kind of a different level of playmaker, and from from what I've seen, um, and, and you know, the, the, it's kind of like splitting hairs, like trying to debate like who's better, like what makes him better. But I think Decorian Moore, like you know, you just see a little bit more from him on tape. Yeah, you talked to Dallas Skyline linebacker Elijah Bo Barnes. He had a good weekend here. What was he like, and how does he fit in with what Johnny Nansen and Pete Kwiatkowski bring to the table? 
yeah, um, you know, he, he's a guy that, you know, he, he's been to Texas, you know, countless times. Um, he was at Junior Day on January 20th, back this weekend. Uh, he'll be back for an official visit this summer. But uh, a guy Texas loves, you know, he, he's – he and Riley Pettijon are – and, and Matai uh, uh, Tagoa is, uh, is another top linebacker target. Those are kind of the three guys. But if you want to stay in state, uh, Barnes and Riley Pettijon are the two guys that, that Texas is trying to get in this class. And the two guys I think they have the best shot of getting, um, you know, I, I still, you know, I have a crystal ball pick in for, uh, for, for uh, Elijah Barnes to, to Texas. And uh, you know, I, I feel even better about that this weekend. You know, he was, he got there on Saturday morning with his family. Uh, we talked to him little that we know. We talked to him halfway through the visit. He came out, we talked to him. Um, and then, you know, you were, you were asking if he talked to Sark today and he's like, Oh no, I'm talking to him tomorrow morning. So he spent the night in Austin, went and hung out with Sark on uh, Sunday morning. So I think that that's also kind of like, Oh, interesting. Like it's kind of like a little, little data point, uh, that, you know, he had a Sunday morning meeting with Sark, but, um, I, I think he's a guy that, you know, uh, a, a track guy. I think he, I think he just recorded a 10, nine in the hundred at his size. I mean, he, he's, he's pretty quick. Uh, he's thick. Um, you know, he, he, he's kind of that prototype middle linebacker you kind of look for um in rangy so you know there's a lot to like about him um good size plays in competitive district um and, and just a big time playmaker so um a lot of reasons why texas likes him um and, and you know I, I think texas is leading for him he hasn't said that but i, I think you know if you're following the tea leaves following the visits um i think texas is in pole position for for elijah barnes well, Hank, you know I'm always asking you about defensive linemen because I think yep. they are the Willy Wonka golden tickets uh, to the college football playoff. Um, what uh, obviously they've got Lance Jackson um, committed, but what uh, and Brandon Brown, but what uh, what other news is is percolating on the interior defensive line front? Yeah, so they they had a few big targets in on uh, on over the weekend and the weekend prior as well. So I think like three, uh, I'll just pick three names that I, I think are like big time time guys to watch. Number one is Zion Williams, he's from uh, from Lufkin. Um, he was on campus, um, actually like an, a fantastic interview, uh, and he had his little brother with him. And, and one of the reporters was interviewing <clears throat> the little brother who was like maybe nine, and the little brother you know looked like a seasoned vet getting interviewed. It was, it was hilarious, but. Uh, no, Zion gave us, you know, an awesome inter- five minutes of interviews. He said the biggest thing, you know, he wanted to see this week was just getting to know Kenny Baker. Um, you know, when Baker was hired, the one of the first places he went was Lufkin <clears throat> to see uh, to see Zion. And, uh, you, know, you know, Zion was saying, you know, that means a lot to me, you know, to know that, like, I'm that much of a priority for them and for him to come back and, you know, actually get to ex- spend an extended amount of time with him on, on campus. Um you know, he, he was you know, basically that was the purpose of coming to this visit, get to know Kenny Baker and, you know, leaving it. He, you know, he felt like that was a guy he he, he would want to play for. And so I, I think they made a l- really good impression on him. He's a big, big time target. He actually probably ate the most, too. They had a <clears throat> crawfish boil, but they also I think they had mighty fine burgers there. Um, they gave him chicken biscuits from Chick-fil-A in the morning. Uh, and he was he was like listing everything he ate and like. It was impressive. It was really impressive. He said he had five chicken biscuits in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> he had two hamburgers, a bag of crawfish, two things of bluebell ice cream, two tacos, and a few other things. But I was like, man. And he was driving home after that. Like that, I don't know if I could drive home after that. <laughs> um, that would be uh, that'd be pretty rough. But uh, looks really good. You know, like three hundred plus pounds. Like looks very wears it very well. Big kid. Uh, but I think Texas is in good shape with him. DJ Sanders was an interesting one. He's from uh, Belleville. And that was a guy everyone's kind of just pinned him to Texas A&M. Um, but we caught up with him and, you know, he was saying Texas, <clears throat> Texas A&M are, are very even for him um, right now. And, you know, he's, he couldn't really pick one or the other at this point. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, where that goes. He's, he, he's like, interestingly enough, was visiting Michigan yesterday. Like he, he the, all the buzz has been Texas, Texas A&M. <clears throat> And he visits Michigan on Monday. He said he was going to visit uh, <clears throat> Texas, Texas A&M in the summer for officials, as well as Baylor, USC, Michigan, and I want to say one other. So he's going to be a busy guy in the summer. But I think when all is said and done, he's going to pick between the Aggies and the Longhorns. Couldn't really make a pick right now, but I, Texas likes him a lot and uh, you know would certainly welcome in, him in the class. And then one guy um, that wasn't on, on campus this past weekend but spent the entire weekend – 
um, prior on campus was Josiah Sharma, who's a big 6'5", uh, 260, 270 pound defensive lineman from Folsom, California. And uh, <clears throat> I cannot clear my throat. I don't know what is going on with me right now. But uh, we appreciate you, the effort. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you are. You're a hero. <laughs> I did the show earlier with Jordan at 11 and it didn't have any issues, but now all of a sudden it's like, it's catching up. But, um, uh, uh, Josiah Sharma committed to Washington prior to Kalen DeBoer leaving decommitted. Um, and then, uh, so everyone kind of thinks Alabama's probably the, the one to watch there, which fair assessment. Um, but he visited Texas for the first time last weekend. Absolutely loved it. Um, I talked to him for like 10 minutes on the phone a couple weeks ago and, you know, he couldn't say enough good things about it. And he locked in an official visit to come back on June 7th. So another guy I know Texas absolutely loves, wants to bring in in this class. So, you know, you got Brown, you got Jackson on, on board right now. Two guys they love, they want to keep. Um, but, if you, you know, if you can go out and get like three guys like that and, and you know, make that a five-man class, uh, whew, that could be that could be exactly what the doctor ordered in terms of uh, 2025 defensive line recruiting. Last thing from me, Hank, we're hearing good things about Alex January. Yeah. Um, tell us about Alex January. I mean, you, you know, you followed his recruitment and um, what do you like about him? Yeah, I, I like that he's a, you know, he, he his dad played at Texas, obviously, you know, he's got that kind of lineage. You know, anytime you have a kid that's like has a parent that played at the college or NFL level, they always kind of are wired a little bit differently. Um, and so I think that's the number one thing <clears throat> he plays at Duncanville. He played against the best competition in the state. That's another thing. And I was talking to his dad, Mike, um, prior to when he signed and, you know, he was saying that like what they asked him to do at Duncanville wasn't really like conducive to like being flashy. Like he was just a space eater. They needed him to like, you know, do kind of the ugly work and not really get the stats, not really get all the, the accolades, <laughs> Uh, but he did – he goes out and wins, what, the, the lineman of the year in Class 6A still. So, like, even he does that and, like, you know – so I, I don't think it's a shock that we're seeing him succeed so early um, at Texas and, and getting the praise he's already getting. But really great kid, great family, um, and, and very little drama uh, with recruiting. You know, everyone kind of assumed he was going to Texas. They assumed correctly. He committed. Um, I think Florida State was trying to flip him still. They were kind of keeping in touch with him. But, you know, he never visited any other school – after he committed to Texas, he signed and, you know, that was that. So those are the kind of, you know, no nonsense, you know, guys that are, that are bought in that, that you want on the field and, you know, not a surprise to see him have success early on. Yeah. Last one for me, Hank, before you go gargle with some salt water, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Trey Johnson basketball. He looked really good last week for yeah. the Dallas all American game. I heard he had a really good showing and all the practices and scrimmages. What have you heard with Trey Johnson and him coming to the 40 acres? This month? Yeah. I think the biggest thing that we got was uh, what was it? The G league ignite like disbanded. So like, there's no real threat of him. Like, just not, like it's not gonna be going Ron a, Holland on us. Yeah, not gonna be a Ron Holland situation. Not that I think it was going to anyway, but you just don't even have to really factor that in anymore. And I talked to Trey's dad a couple, like I think it was February when they had visited, and you know he was saying the the biggest thing with him is like it's not just basketball. It's like the brand of the University of Texas. He was like, I think his quote was like, you know, when the ball stops bouncing, you know, to have the you know Longhorn brand with you, like that's that's going to be one of the biggest things. And so it makes sense. You know, you got a guy like Kevin Durant in, in, uh, in your corner. Um, any basketball player I think could appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, he was always pretty locked in despite, you know, the, the struggles here and there for the season. I mean, they still won a game in the tournament and, you know, they, um, you know, they had, they had highs, they had some lows, but uh, even his dad was like, you know, you can't really judge him based off like a big 12 slate. And it's like every, every night, like it's, it's just tough sledding. So, um, he's locked in, um, and, and you know we'll, we'll see what this portal season brings. You know, I know there's been names thrown out, but uh, you know to to have kind of a, a Caden Shedrick, Kendall Weaver, Trey Johnson kind of core and build around that. You know, they could they could have some success next season depending on you know who they bring in in the portal. Hank, go gargle with some salt water. We appreciate it, man. You uh, you are a champ. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks, and, Hank. Uh, yep. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. See y'all. All right. Hank South breaking it down. Horns 24-7 recruiting front every Tuesday 
about 215. All right, let's uh, work our way into the commentary. Um, how about the brain vault mouth guard? Changing the game. I mean, proven, patented to protect you from the effects of concussion. So uh, developed right here in Austin by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. Um, it is changing the game. So if you've got a competitor uh, in your household, a cheerleader, soccer, lacrosse, flag football, um, look, we're way beyond those little pieces of rubber you bought at the sporting goods store. You, you know, throw in a pot of boiling water and stick it in your mouth. You're going to be fitted by a dental practitioner um, for the mouth guard that protects you from the effects of concussion. So uh, it's real simple. You just go to brainvault.com to set up a fitting. And if you're the team manager, uh, the team parent, they'll do group fittings. They'll come to you and do group fittings. Just go to brainvault.com. And when you're ready for the big screen of your dreams, audiovisual consultations, going to bring you the best price on big screens, the surround sound, electronic shades, new lighting, surveillance, you name it, the you want the media room of your dreams. That's what Tom McKay and his crew at Audiovisual Consultations do. Um, they did it for me in three different houses. Uh, they do it, they put that, you know, TV and surround sound into some of your favorite restaurants like Cover 3 on, uh, on Anderson Lane. And uh, look, when you're ready, all you have to do is make one phone call, 255-8678. Let Tom and his crew bring everything to you. And uh, mentioned Cover 3. I mean, you got the... Uh, you got the the perfect place to bring your date, hang out with your your pals, uh, eat great food, and watch your favorite team. Don't forget about brunch on the weekends with the do-it-yourself Bloody Mary bar. The Sean Adams prime rib sandwich is a must, and the Parmesan fries. Oh yeah, Cover Three Ander Cover Three on Anderson, Cover Three in Round Rock, and of course Cover Two at One Eighty Three in Lake Creek and. Um, my man Zay and his lovely wife Jesse went to Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Um, Jesse loves the the raw oysters, and of course, during happy hour, three thirty to six thirty, dollar raw oysters, best selection of oysters. Um, you can't, you just if you love oysters, this is your place. So Salt Traders Coastal Cooking from Jack Gilmore. Same brilliant restaurateur here in Austin who brings you Jack Allen's Kitchen. So uh, Salt Traders right there off of uh, Mopac and Rollingwood. It's Zilker up north at Old Settlers and Round Rock. And of course, um, it's a Jack Gilmore restaurant. You'll love it. All right, Zay. Let's get into the chip shot. And, you know, in talking to Steve Sarkeesian today, um, you know, I'm always looking or listening, I should say, for the names that he is, um, you know, giving some sugar to. And here we are. We got um, we got a practice on Thursday. We got a practice on Saturday. We basically were 10 practices in. So we've got a pretty good idea of, you know, what we're going to get out of spring football. Now, the light goes on at different times for different players. A um, couple things, though, today I thought Steve Sarkeesian had an edge about him talking about the culture and how he wants the culture to continue to be a high priority for not only the players, but for the coaches. And, uh, you know, he's just very, very, uh, that's a high priority for him. He knows how he said, we have exhausted. We've been exhaustive in building the culture the first three years. And I don't want it to take a step back. So, um, you know, that's 
that's something you would expect to hear in spring ball. But again, it's an important thing to hear because you don't ever want to think you've arrived when you qualified for your first college football playoff. And that's not the end game. I mean, Sark said he's borderline obsessed with winning a national championship or more. So, um, yeah, I thought the other thing that really stood out when uh, he was asked about the interior defensive line, he had praise for Alfred Collins, said we're getting the consistency that we want from Alfred Collins, and then um, talked up Aaron Bryant. And Aaron Bryant's a guy who's just been in the, just been grinding away, you know, six foot three, 307 pounds. He's getting the, he's getting closer to the consistency that they're looking for. So, you know, people are looking for Jare Bledsoe because he's crazy athletic and he can do a standing backflip at 294 pounds and can do the splits and everything, which is all impressive and very Christian Wilkins like. Uh, who just got a huge payday to go to the LA Raiders or Las Vegas Raiders. Um, and, you know, they're looking for Sadir Mitchell, but Sadir Mitchell's probably going to have to come back uh, in a new frame of mind and a new body after summer workouts to, to make his push. But um, Aaron Bryant, so kudos to Aaron Bryant. Uh, and then um, I asked him about the, the defensive backs. We talked about that. Uh, a lot of sugar for Ma Malik Muhammad, for um, Jelani McDonald at safety, and for Jalen Gilbo at the star nickel. Um, but when uh, Sark was asked about the receiver position, he brought up Ryan Wingo again. Ryan Wingo for the second week in a row. And he said, Ryan Wingo doesn't seem like a freshman out there, um, that he's – playing fast. Uh, sure. He's making some mistakes, but he's making mistakes at hundred miles an hour, which is what you love. Uh, Cause Sark has always said, give us your max effort. We'll correct the rest. And it sounds like that's what he's getting from Ryan Wingo. Um, I mean, he obviously said the transfers Isaiah bond and Matthew golden have been, been really good, but he said, Matthew golden, was still kind of working through a injury that he had coming from Houston. So they went slow with him. Now he's, you know, going full speed and making the kind of plays that they expect. So they feel good about Isaiah bond and, and Matthew golden. Um, but Ryan Wingo, he said when he's out there, it doesn't seem like a true freshman. Um, he's not right all the time, but he's making full speed mistakes and uh, that's what we're looking for. So, uh, yeah, I thought those were some significant nuggets from our uh, weekly chat with, uh, with Steve Sarkeesian. Um, yeah, the quote was, we exhausted ourselves building the culture the last three years. I just want to stay on point with it because a lot of these guys weren't, weren't here when we built it. He said, and that's me. I've got to make sure when Labor Day rolls around that our culture is right where it needs to be. And so he's he is uh, making that a priority. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. I mean, Ryan Wingo, he's coming in with a ton of hype out of the St. Louis area, one of the top players, not only at the wide receiver position, but at all positions in the nation. And, hey, it might take a week. It might take a couple of months. It might take two days. But there are certain guys that just have a talent level and just have a college-ready body from jump. And it feels like he's starting to really pick it up. Because we first heard, you remember back a few weeks ago, where you told me he had to get after Ryan Wingo because he wasn't running his routes as hard as he should have, or he wasn't running to the correct spot. You know, he wasn't being as precise as you have to be, not need to be as you have to be at this level. And once he started picking up on the little things that weren't necessarily a big issue at the high school game, because he was that much more talented than everybody, you know, when you could just outleap the, 
cornerback that's going to Stanford the next year on the academic scholarship. That's different than doing these SEC cornerbacks and safeties. So, yeah, you got to be on top of your game. And I think he's starting to understand that. And now we're starting to see him thrive because of that. So it sounds like he's separating himself. But at the end of the day, we just never know. I mean, it's only April. So I love hearing those things about Ryan Wingo, but it's still a really full wide receiver room with a lot of guys that are looking for an opportunity to make some plays when the season starts. And I think Steve Sarkeesian being the solid coach that he is and just being through this process before with a lot of talent in this room specifically, he's going to give all these guys an opportunity to showcase their stuff and earn the right to get more playing time on the field. But like I've been saying these last few weeks, like it starts now. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're behind somebody else because you don't get it, then, hey, you might get lapped. It just is what it is. We don't got time to wait for nobody. That obsession is real. So you well, come along at your own pace. But if you aren't meeting us halfway, then, again, you're going to get left behind. And I don't think Ryan Wingo, being the early enrollee freshman, yeah, I'm not surprised that he's not one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Zay, let's get to the right call, my man. Let's get it. Let's get it. Before the right call, though, shout out to Covert BK, the Covert Automotive Dealership. They've been doing it for over 100 years. Please get out of that Pinto. Please, man, get out of that just hoopty, bootleg, old buggy that you've been driving that's been passed down from your great grandmama and stuff. No, nah, man, that's not the new wave. Covert BK is the new wave, as these kids say. Dan and the crew, they provide the people with a high quality selection of new and pre owned vehicles. The customer satisfaction is grade A. The service is grade A. And, hey, you're going to get high-quality vehicles. Like I said, Buick, GMC, Ram, Jeep, Dodge, Chrysler, and Cadillac, seven brands just to name a few. And go to CovertBK.com for all the latest specials and inventory. Nobody beats a Covert deal. Not now, not ever. All right, Chip, let's go back to the national championship game just a little bit. I saw Draymond Green, which thank you, Chris Bennett, for sending me this. Because Draymond Green, he had something to say. He watched the game last night. We all know everybody loves Draymond Green, Golden State Warrior, absolute legend. Might be a little head case sometimes, but he's a legend. He's a Hall of Famer. Come on, let's give Draymond some respect. But he does say some things that are just flat out crazy and flat out ignorant. And definitely have to be questioned, like what he said last night, referring to Purdue Center, Zach Eady. This dude, Draymond Green, said via Twitter, job well done, 35. He's talking about Johnson for UConn. Job well done, 35. You did your job tonight. It was him that made Eady quit with about 19 minutes to go in the second half. There was a turnover, and I saw Edie's body language walking back. He was done. Now, rewatch that game from that point on, free game, or hashtag free game. Uh, Draymond, 37 and 10, doesn't really sound like a guy that was done at all. I think it comes from the backcourt, which was a, com- a combination of hmm, 17 points. Lawyer, Jones, Smith combined for 17 points. That was the issue, Draymond. Like, if I'm Zach Eady, if I'm showing bad body language, it's because I'm doing all I freaking can. It's not Zach Eady's fault. And it sucks that somebody like Draymond with his basketball IQ would say something this arrogant. Because that's like saying Steph Curry going for 40, which he's done plenty of times to help save the Warriors from being in bad situations and losing games. And guys like Draymond and Klay Thompson didn't do as much. Like, you need everybody on the team to step up. If anybody gives you 37, you can't blame them for the loss. I'm sorry. His body language might have been bad, but that was due to him knowing that his teammates were struggling. Fletcher Lawyer was horrible last night. Horrible. As bad as you could get. Fletcher Lawyer is a 45% three-point shooter. He gave you a donut in the game that you needed him the most. Purdue fans are going to remember that for the rest of their lives. Zero. Ofer. Nothing you could do with that. You know what I'm saying? Like Lance Jones gave you nothing. He gave you five points. Nothing. 
Like Braden Smith, he had to go out of his comfort zone and try to score more. But again, let, let's keep it real now. UConn's that good too. Like UConn was incredible this year. There was nothing that Purdue could do. Matt Painter, all the knock that he's had over the recent years, they lose in the first round to a sweet uh, a 16th seed in 2023. Yeah, Matt Painter has deserved a lot of the criticism that he's taken. But at this point, Matt Painter, hey, he's got the monkey off his back. They didn't win the big game, but, oh, you got the monkey off your back, dude. And he's doing it the right way. For him to go get Zach Eady from IMG Academy, and Zach Eady only played on the varsity team at IMG his senior year, and say, you know what? You might be a very, very low three-star guy, but you're 7'4", can't teach that. We're going to develop you, and if you're good about that, hey, come on down to West Lafayette. And that's what he did. And now you've got a two-time national uh, player of the year in Zach Eady. And he's getting another like seven three guy that's from the Indiana area that's coming in as a freshman next season. I think he's a three star too. Not the biggest guy in the world when it comes to mass, but he's seven three. You know what I'm saying? And again, you know how we always got to go back to Rodney Terry. Rodney Terry, just bring him in. They might not have all the talent in the world. Like Tristan Newton, Camp Spencer were zero stars coming out of high school. Like yes, they went to. The, college and they went to d1 and they developed and got better and you they plucked them out of the transfer portal but you gotta find guys like that you don't need to find guys that used to be five stars and four stars and blue chippers and burger king McDonald's all americans whatever you don't need all of that just find guys that fit your system and play hard that you know can develop the right way and have good basketball iqs you could do something with that you know what I'm saying? Like Max Acemas, he was that for sure. Great get. Great get out of the transfer portal. Kendall Weaver, same thing. Great get out of the transfer portal. But you can't afford to bring in those IT Hortons and Zirico Yemas anymore. You just can't. Like that those the SEC is too good. The coaches are too good. It's not going to be as big drop off like Texas fans think it is because you're moving from the Big 12 to the SEC. There might not be any drop off, to be honest. Especially if Scott Drew says, you know what, this Kentucky job, it's life changing. I got to take it. I've been in Waco for almost 20 years. Like it's, you know, it's getting a little old. Scott Drew losing in the second round this past year. How much better are you going to get in Waco? Like he's the number one option to me. That's just, that's as easy as it gets for those boosters in Lexington that are trying to make that decision. I just seen John Calipari just say his goodbyes in a video. Uh, to BBN Nation, but yeah, I what UConn did last night, what they did this season, they only had three losses all year. Like that's that's what it takes. That's this new day and era of college basketball. Hell, college sports on what it takes to win. You can have a five star freshman, cool. You can't have many. You better have some grown ass transfer portal, been through thick and thin, seen a lot of basketball type dudes on your team. And then after that, they better fit what you want to do personnel wise, your philosophy and how you play, which Rodney Terry, he does do a lot of things that UConn does offensively. Like with Max A. Smith, those dribble handoffs and you pass it to the post and come off that dribble handoff or screen and they rescreen and stuff. Max A. Smith did a ton of that this year. The problem was Tyrese Hunter wasn't very good at it. You know, he had his moments, but not really. I.T. Horton was bad at it. Kendall Weaver was good at it, but he can't shoot like a Cam Spencer or Tristan Newton. So he's very limited. That's why Kendall Weaver, it's going to be huge for him to work on his shot. Like right now, if I'm Kendall Weaver, hey, 1,000 shots a day, 1,000 shots a day. You don't have to worry about defense. You don't have to worry about, you know, speed and stuff. All that stuff helps. But I'm Ronnie Terry. I'm telling Kendall Weaver, hey, you get your shots up today. From everywhere, off the dribble, your floater, three-point catch and shoot, three-point off the dribble, going left, going right, step backs, jump stops, anything that you need when it comes to shooting the basketball, Kendall Weaver, you need to work on those things. So I saw CB, the cream, uh, cream Abdul-Jabbar into the transfer portal, Robbie Avela from Indiana State. He's about, with the goggles, nerdy dude. He's about 6'10", super skilled. That'd be a hell of a get for Rodney Terry. Hell of a get. 
You know, there's guys out there. There's a lot of guys getting scooped up already, but there's a lot of guys that are still out there that you can make fit. And one thing that Dan Hurley did opposed to what he did last season with that 2023 team, he realized that, okay, I don't have a post presence like a Domino Sonogo. Even though Donovan Cleegan's good, a Domino Sonogo did so much for them offensively. He doesn't have those come off the screen shooters like a Jordan Hawkins. You know, he doesn't have that point forward like he did in Andre Jackson, who's playing for the Milwaukee Bucks and has crazy athleticism at 6'6", that played a lot of their point guard last year, even though Tristan Newton was still there. So he changed some of the stuff that he did. They went to more of a motion type offense, but with a lot more screens at the top with their center. Adamina Sonogo wasn't doing that. So you got you can't just say, okay, this is my style of play. They have to adapt to me. No, no. You get the best players that you can, and then you make it work. You figure out, okay, what fits with this guy? What fits with that guy? Trey Johnson's a good shooter. How are we going to get him looks? Like, that, that's what coaching is. That's why you're getting paid over seven figures to figure those things out. So I completely disagree with what Draymond said about Zach Eady. Zach Eady was not the fault for Purdue losing last night. He did not give up. He did not quit. That is complete BS. He had 37 and 10. His team wasn't as good as UConn, one of the best teams that I've seen in recent memory. So, yeah, college basketball, solid season. Longhorns, decent season. We'll see what happens next year. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, look. Kids can get in the portal until May first, so we are less than a month away from the portal window um, for basketball closing on May first, and there are dudes in the portal right now. So we should get an idea here soon, either because of visits that will start to happen or signings so or commitments i should say uh for rodney terry and and look he's got to know what he's looking for so that he can sell that vision and get these kids convinced that they're going to be a part of something special with other dudes who are of the same mindset because that's what danny hurley was able to do he coached them hard he got him to believe, and that was as confident a basketball team as I've seen. Yeah. I mean, Tristan Newton just made it look like he was out there just, just doing his thing, man. He plays like he doesn't even play hard. Right. Like Tristan Newton had just kind of a casual feel about him that's just like, dude, this shouldn't be this easy. Basketball is a very difficult game. Like, he had one finish on Edie where he was kind of behind the goal and he twerked his body back to the right and Edie was right there and somehow he finished. And it's like, man, that's crazy. And then he'll take three-point shots and he's so strong. It doesn't look like he has to jump that much and you forget that he's 6'6". So he's such a good ball handler, but he doesn't do anything out of the ordinary. Like, he, he's not doing Derrick Rose or Kyrie Irving crossovers. He just... Is fundamentally sound. Him and Spencer. Like, they're a backcourt that a lot of people aren't going to think of, like, as one of the best backcourts of all time because you're not going to see them on the next level, you know, doing work like that. But they're a backcourt that I'm always going to remember. Like, they were just as good, if not better, than what Davion Mitchell and Jared Butler were for Scott Drew's Baylor team that won it all in 2021. Like, they were that good this year. You know, just Mitchell and Butler, both of those guys are in the NBA. Butler's playing for the Wizards and Mitchell's playing for the Kings. So that's, you know. Well, you can set the record for most, you know, biggest scoring margin of victory in an NCAA tournament. That tells you a lot because they were absolutely dominant. They were not really pushed in the final no, you know, really at any point. No, so yeah. Zay, My great man. stuff. 
Um, thanks everybody for, for, uh, for listening, for watching us on the Texas sports unfiltered YouTube channel, for listening to us on the Texas sports unfiltered app, uh, tell your friends and enemies, tell them to set an alarm, uh, weekdays, every weekday at one o'clock, of course, eight o'clock in the morning too. And then just set your dial right there on the Texas sports unfiltered app when, uh, BK and Bucky get you going and all the programming throughout the day. Um, this is it for uh, today's programming, but please uh, take note of those incredible sponsors all around our faces there on the YouTube uh, channel. Um, we believe in them. We hope you will too. And, and we thank them for you know, making Texas sports unfiltered, one of the fastest growing platforms for uh, Longhorns news and just all the personalities that you've come to know uh, here in Austin, Texas. So for uh, for my man, Zay Collier and the rest of the gang, I'm Chip Brown. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Make sure you're tuned in at eight in the morning with Bucky and BK. Cheers. Y'all be cool.